Tantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents So I Married a Werewolf by Kristen Miller Narrated by Anastasia Watley Chapter 1 Men, why couldn't they train as easily as dogs? Sit, Faith Hamilton said, holding the hot dog over Bailey's muzzle. Stay? Stay? The wire-haired terrier stared wide-eyed at the wiener, slobber dripping from his mouth. Drool puddled on the hardwood floor of her cabin, but Faith didn't mind. Living in the woods outside of Seattle had taught her not to sweat the small stuff. Dirt and drool were everyday occurrences. Good. Slowly, she set the treat on the dog's nose and backed away. Calm. Breathe. She raised her hands and then lowered them, hyper aware that her super hunky, amazingly sexy yowza did she ever want him, next door neighbor, stood behind her, watching her every move. You're being a good boy, she sang to the twitching pooch. Almost finished. Cross-eyed, the dog stared down his nose. He trembled in anticipation, but didn't move even a tiny muscle. See, Faith said, he obeys. Look at him. He's like a different dog. Carter Griffin crossed his arms over his chest and leaned against Faith's kitchen counter. Two weeks ago, you would have lost your fingers doing something like that. His master's going to be impressed. Bailey belonged to one of Carter's co-workers, who apparently needed help getting his dog under control. Carter had given Faith's name as a recommendation. Must have been convenient having a professional dog trainer living next door, and she'd been happy to start up training. All it takes is focus, patience, and the willingness to really work with him. That and being a 25-year-old werewolf who can sense what a dog really needs. Well, she corrected. Carter and Bailey's master were werewolves too, and they hadn't had much luck. He did great. As long as his master continues the training techniques at home, Bailey will be the most well-behaved dog he's ever had. Won't you, boy? The dog shook slightly and then regained his composure, the wiener teetering on edge. What's your schedule like for the rest of the month? Pretty packed? As Carter reached into his back pocket to pull out his wallet, his shirt sleeve crept up his wrist, revealing the tattoos hiding there. The designs were gorgeous and intricate, spiraling up his arm. What she wouldn't give to spend the weekend studying the tattoos marked over every inch of his gloriously naked body. She couldn't help it. She shuddered. Why? Is his master interested in teaching him a few more things? Bet Carter could teach her a thing or two. She shuddered again. Carter shrugged his big, sturdy shoulders. Maybe. Well, Bailey knows the basics, but tell him if he wants to get really advanced, I suppose I could teach him more tricks. Another couple weeks of lessons, and she could get Bailey to fetch the paper or shut the fridge after he brought his master a cold beer. He might even be able to use the toilet if Carter's co-worker really wanted to get crafty. Do you know what he had in mind? You and me tomorrow night. He didn't have it in mind, I did. You get my drift? Carter dropped a bill on the counter to cover the training sessions. Pizza, beer, some really cheesy action flick. Bailey whimpered, begging to be released. Faith knew the feeling. Last summer, she'd watched Carter chop firewood on his back lawn, shirtless and sweating. It took every ounce of willpower she had not to rub her hands over his glistening muscles as he moved and flexed. She'd actually whimpered aloud and thought he'd heard her as he paused and turned her way. What would he look like in his wolf form? She wondered for the umpteenth time. Although they often talked about Seattle wolf pack business, their alpha and other mutual wolf friends in the pack, they'd never shifted in front of each other. His hair would probably be dark and slick, but would his body be just as massive as it was in human form? Would he exude an overwhelming sense of power? 
Did he ever wonder about her wolf form? He'd certainly never let on. Boy, you really know what a woman wants. Faith smirked as she imagined him shirtless and wielding an axe. I don't have anything better to do on a Friday night than check out Jackie Chan. Truth be told, action films weren't her favorite. And Jackie Chan needed to hop on the fast track to a retirement home. But for the last year or so, every Friday night, Carter had hiked the half mile from his cabin to hers, and they'd had action movie marathons. It was always platonic, usually ending around midnight with Carter walking home and Faith going to bed alone. No matter how much Faith wanted Carter to make a move, he wouldn't. She mentally snorted. Why would he? She wasn't his type, not by a long shot. The women he dated were tall, blonde, Kate Upton lookalikes, every guy's fantasy. Faith, on the other hand, was the exact opposite. Five foot three, size 12, brunette, and with a nasty scar running down the side of her neck. You sure I'm not taking up too much of your time? Carter leaned over the counter and nailed her with a smoldering glance that warmed her cheeks. I hate to monopolize your Fridays. She shrugged. I don't mind. What else would I be doing? Waxing my legs? Washing my hair? She flipped the ends. That's not me. But if you come over early, we can give each other facials. You should give lessons on how to be the type of woman every man wants. He was such a flirt. Knock it off. He really shouldn't joke with her this way. It made her think things could be different between them. But if he thought she was attractive, he would have made a move by now. If he was interested, he wouldn't have wasted time dating other women. He certainly wasn't shy. I mean it. Chuckling, Carter shook his head, then headed for her fringe. You're no fuss. You don't spend hours in front of the mirror getting ready. How many times have I seen you in your sweats? She put up her hands. Let's not go there. Oh, God. She'd gotten too comfortable too soon. The last few weeks had been rough, so she'd relaxed more than usual and broke out her yoga pants. That wouldn't be happening again. That's it. That's what I've been doing wrong, he said, bending over to pull a Coke out of the fridge. I should be looking for a girl like you. She averted her gaze from his backside moments before he turned, Coke in hand. Want one? he asked. No, thanks. She shook her head. And, to be honest, you're not really my type. You yell at the television, you have holes in your socks, and you snore terribly. What? He jabbed a finger her direction. I only snored that one time when you made me watch Bridget Jones. It's a classic. No way. He popped open the soda and drank. It's like every other chick flick. Guy meets girl in some really corny way. Girl wants guy. He plays it cool until he's bashed upside the head by some crazy feeling and calls it love. Chick? She gawked. You're such a downer. All those movies are the same. You've seen one, you've seen them all. He licked carbonation off his lip. How could I not fall asleep? It's not only chick flicks. She planted her hands on her hips and tried not to imagine sucking the carbonation off his lip the next time he took a drink. You snored through Avatar. Victory was hers. Okay, so my taste is limited to action and western. Sue me. He stopped mid-drink. Back up. What do you mean I'm not your type? Am I really that horrible? No, it's... I'm not as difficult to train as Bailey. I already know how to behave like a gentleman. He sat on the edge of a bar stool as Bailey whined. Look, I'm sitting, and you didn't have to give me a treat. Oh, he was a sight. Shaggy brown hair that fell past his ears. Icy blue eyes peering beneath light lashes. Round face, short forehead. Carter was cute, too. Release, Faith said, and Bailey dropped the hot dog to the floor. She'd almost forgotten about the poor little pup. He chomped on the end, tossing it back into his mouth. He licked his chops and then stared at her expectantly. 
I'm sure any of the dozen women you've dated this year would be able to vouch on your behalf. She snatched the Coke from Carter's hand and stole a sip. Give me a break, he said, eyeing her as she drank. There haven't been a dozen. Oh, yeah, there had been. Not for her, though. Faith would have been happy to have a second date. Just one that went well enough to garner another. Her best friend Tracy had set her up a handful of times, and things had never panned out well. Tracy couldn't exactly be faulted for setting Faith up with the wrong men. She didn't know Faith was a turned werewolf, able to shift at every full moon. And since the Seattle wolf pack lived secretly from the rest of the world, Faith couldn't exactly explain to her friend why she shouldn't date a non-shifter. There were werewolves in the pack who'd found their fated mate with a non-shifter, their alpha being one of them. But Faith couldn't picture herself explaining why she donned fangs and grew more body hair than a yeti. Dating werewolves wasn't easy either. They understood the pack dynamic and the differences between born and turned wolves. They even understood the concept of a luminary, or a wolf's one and only fated mate. But the ones she dated over the last couple years had never stuck around long. Tracy said it had something to do with the walls Faith put up around herself, and the way she never let anyone in. Faith couldn't help but feel like it had more to do with her looks. More specifically, the scar she couldn't hide. You pick the movie. Carter stood and hooked Bailey up to his leash. I promise I won't fall asleep. I won't torture you with leap year like I'd planned, Faith said, keeping the granite island between them. I'm not feeling up for it. Bad morning? His brows scrunched together. Phone calls from her little brother didn't always set her day off wrong, but this one had. It wasn't what he said on the message that had worried her. It was the cautious tone and the tremble in his voice. Dawson called this morning. I missed him because I was out walking Bailey, but his voice sounded strange on the message. Sometimes it's hard to tell from machines. Yeah. As she scratched her head, the phone rang, making her jump. She removed the cordless from its base on the counter and glanced at the screen. It's him. Carter nodded, and instead of leaving the way she thought he would, he moved around the island and plopped onto her couch. Making himself comfortable, he kicked an ankle on the opposite knee, situated the coke between his legs, and peeled open the pages of the magazine on the coffee table. Guess he didn't feel the need for her to experience any privacy. She answered. Hey, Dawson. She shuffled around the island so she could watch Carter as she spoke. She simply liked looking at the man. What's up? Dawson called only when he was short on money. She worked three jobs to pay her younger brother's way through college, and oftentimes it wasn't enough. Mornings were devoted to walking dogs for people in the neighborhood. Afternoons were consumed by private dog training lessons, and evenings were spent in front of her computer creating her question-and-answer dog blog, Have a Little Faith. Don't freak out, her brother said. Then don't start conversations with that. She smacked her hand to her forehead. Spit it out. Do you know that professor I've been studying under for the last year? The communications one? She peeked at Carter from between her fingers. He grinned. She frowned. I don't know how you manage to remember every minuscule detail of my life. You must take notes when I call. Something crinkled on the other side of the line. She wants me to go with her to a conference in San Jose next weekend. Faith sighed. That's great. Mm, yeah, Dawson said, sounding like his cheeks were full of something gummy. But it's three grand. Faith did a mental check of her body. Nope, not bleeding money. Yet. How important is it? She asked. Professor Reynolds said if I pick up the concepts at the conference, I could be her intern for the rest of the semester. He cleared his throat. She's amazing, Faithy. You should see what she can do with something simple like PhotoZone. Oh, now we're getting down to it. Fade strode into the living room and plopped beside Carter. He turned his attention to her, draping his arm over the back of the couch. 
When she didn't acknowledge him, he playfully kicked her foot. She kicked him back, in the shin. Just how amazing is she? It's not like that. It's an opportunity to meet people on the cutting edge of the business. There's a big group of us going. What else? She asked. There's more, isn't there? You're good, he said. Better than mom and dad were. Spill. As if on cue, Bailey barked and nuzzled his head between Carter's legs. Carter lifted the magazine and spilled soda all over his crotch. Damn it, he hollered, jumping off the couch. Bailey. I want to go for my MFA in graphic design. Faith heard Dawson say over Carter's grumbles. At Yale. I found out I was accepted yesterday. Professor Reynolds encouraged me to apply in the fall. I didn't want to tell you before I knew I'd gotten in, and... Whoa, whoa, hold the phone. Did you say Yale? Faith's skin went pinprickly, and she stopped staring at Carter's wet crotch. I'm feeling faint. Carter froze, hands out from his sides. You okay? She waved him off. I got in, Dawson went on. I actually did it. That's great, Dawson. I'm thrilled for you. Then why did she feel as if a pile of bricks had settled on her shoulders? She leaned forward and slumped a little. Did you apply anywhere else? I want Yale, Faith. He sounded sincere, pained. I really want it. But even with my job, grants, and loans, it won't be enough to cover books, tuition, and my living expenses. I'm going to need your help. She sighed. I know. You don't have to say any more. Images of dollar signs and massive amounts of green dough spun through her head. She'd be paying off his student loans forever. She'd never get on her feet. Guilt soured her stomach as those horrible thoughts trickled in. Dawson had graduated high school as a valedictorian, and then majored in design at WSU, just like their father had. Going to Yale, continuing in their father's footsteps, probably made Dawson feel closer to him. If she could help him reach that dream, she would. She threw herself back against the cushions, laid her head back, and closed her eyes. I'll deposit the cash in your account first thing in the morning. Go to the conference and we'll talk when you get back. She was going to need a winning lottery ticket to get out of this mess. Seriously? He screeched. You're the best. I know. Love you, dude. Love you too. She ended the call, fell over, and screamed into the couch cushion. You okay? Carter said through her scream. She looked up at him and nodded. Nothing too major. Good. Then I'll let you have your mental breakdown in peace. I'm going to head home and change, Carter said, dragging Bailey out the door, his arm covering the wet spot on his pants. I'll pick the movie tomorrow night, and I'm bringing something harder than beer. You're a good friend, she said. But every second of every day, she wished he was something more. Chapter 2 When Carter awoke the next morning, he was still thinking about Faith and the phone call she'd had with her brother. It had bothered him, probably more than it should have, since her family dynamic was none of his business. Dawson had asked for money, and of course she'd send it to him. She always did. She was warmly generous that way. Carter hated someone taking advantage of her kindness even if that someone was her only living blood relative. He'd see her tonight for their movie ritual. Maybe he'd ask her why she didn't just tell Dawson to stand on his own two feet. He strode through the doors of the Enforcement Bureau's building and checked his watch. Five minutes until his meeting with the captain. The Bureau was the Seattle Wolf Pack's policing unit. They closely watched the werewolves roaming the streets of Seattle, made sure they were lying low, obeying all the laws, both city and pack, and not committing crimes that would get their kind noticed by the non-shifting portion of the population. Not a bad job for a werewolf. 
Carter had worked on the streets as an enforcer for the last ten years. But with a little luck, all of that was about to change. Veins thrumming with excitement, Carter marched through the marble-floored lobby, punched the button on the elevator, and let it sweep him to the top floor. The doors opened up to an ocean-themed flat, with desks, chairs, and leather couches facing a window that looked out over the city. There were two people on the floor, a secretary poised in front of the captain's office, and Nate Ramsey, another member of the Enforcement Bureau. Carter Griffin, the secretary said when he checked in. Take a seat, and I'll let the captain know you finally arrived. Finally? Carter checked his watch. It's ten sharp. I'm not late. You're not early. Damn, Carter mumbled. The captain doesn't mess around. He took one of the leather couches outside the door and glanced at Nate. Good to see you, Nate said, leaning forward to clasp his hands over his knees. How you been? Nate was a hundred-year-old werewolf, a few years younger than Carter. He'd been with the Bureau the same amount of time and had spent a decent amount of time on the road. He must have been applying for the position of detective, too. And why wouldn't he? It was the most respected position on the force. Well enough. Carter eyed Nate's tie. It was crooked. He double-checked his own. You? Can't complain. Nate scraped his hands over his skull-trim hair. You here for the detective position? Nodding, Carter rested his elbows on his knees. You're golden. If I knew you were putting in for the position, I wouldn't have bothered. Don't cut yourself short, Carter said. You're more than qualified. And now Carter had some serious competition. If he'd been confident about getting the detective position before, not that he was, of course, those feelings were long gone now. Nate Ramsey was a great enforcer. How Captain Rich was going to make this decision was beyond him. Mr. Griffin, Mr. Ramsey, the secretary said, hanging up the phone. He'll see you both now. Tugging down his sleeves so the tattoos on his arms wouldn't peek out the bottom, Carter strode ahead of Nate through the double doors leading to the captain's office. The room shared the same ocean theme as the foyer, only the colors were darker, muted, and warmer. Carter knew better than to make himself comfortable, though. Captain Rich was 220 pounds of authority in a gray suit and tie and a crisp white shirt that stretched tautly over his shoulders. From what Carter had heard, their superior was a born werewolf, 600 years old, and had created the Bureau from the ground up. Please, Captain Rich said, spreading his arms to the chairs in front of his desk. Sit. Carter took the seat on the left, and Nate took the one next to him. The captain sat in his wing-back chair and flipped open two folders on his desk. He scanned through their contents and then eyed them both carefully. You've both been on the road the same amount of time, give or take a few months. He tented his fingers together and glared at them with eerie black eyes. You've both progressed up the ranks, earning top marks from your sergeants. You take any overtime shifts available. You volunteer for professional development every time an opportunity arises. Professionally speaking, you're both prime for the position of detective. Were they going to bend the rules and accept both? Nate kicked the side of Carter's chair, as if he'd read his excitement. But your personal resumes are just as important in determining which one of you will fill our vacancy. We're not only a policing force within the pack, we're a family. There are hundreds of enforcers on our payroll, and each of them is an important piece of the family unit. However, he said, standing, promoted positions like sergeant, lieutenant, captain, detective— and special ops make up the backbone of the wolf pack. We have formed a council filled with these high-ranking positions. He faced the window wall behind him and clasped his hands behind his back. Rain beat against the windows, matching the drumming of Carter's heart. He forced himself to calm, 
but couldn't rid himself of the feeling that the storm was about to break. Once a month, Captain Rich went on, this council meets and discusses how to run the rest of the Bureau more effectively. We believe significant others have a role to play as well, since you will go home to talk about your day and Wolfpack business to the mate who warms your bed. Carter had heard about retreats for high-ranking officials. He'd also heard it was a family affair, but he'd figured it was more like a company picnic than a meeting on Wolfpack business. The captain spun around and leveled them with a serious glare. We're looking for stability, gentlemen. We're more likely to vote on a mated pair than a lone wolf. Wait, what? Tension crept up his spine. He didn't have a mate. Well, he corrected. He'd had one, and she died. He fit the textbook definition of lone wolf. Did that mean he wasn't in contention for the position? With all due respect, sir, Carter said, hands clamming. What does relationship status have to do with the ability to be a detective? What do you think would happen if we chose a serial dater to take on the position? Casual, significant others could be privy to all kinds of information on the inner workings of our bureau. If the couple split, as we'd expect, we'd be put in a precarious situation. Multiply this by multiple mates, and we've got a major problem on our hands. The captain paused, his gaze raking over them. According to your files, neither of you two are married. That's correct, isn't it? Carter got the feeling that this was one of those make-or-break moments. The split second when he'd either get the job of his dreams, or be left working the streets for the next hundred years. I'm not married, sir, Nate said. But I found my luminary. We'll be married and bonded next weekend. The werewolf bonding process was much like a marriage ceremony. But instead of linking people for life, it extended the wolves' lives from a few hundred to a thousand years. Thanks to the bond, both the male and female wolf gained strength and speed. The process itself had to be performed during sex, when they were linked body to body, hand to hand, soul to soul. Sacred words were spoken, joining their souls. Not every wolf found their luminary, their one and only fated mate and the ones who did were considered blessed. Well done. Congratulations to you both. The captain shifted his attention to Carter. And you? Are our records properly updated? Carter's stomach dropped. He'd found his luminary when he was a newly transitioned wolf. That was over fifty years ago. Before their love faded, their marriage failed, and she died. The luminary bond was supposed to be amazing. Sunshine and rainbows and all that BS. They must have done it wrong. And now he was destined to roam the world alone. Without his dream job, apparently. He needed this promotion, and he would have been damn good at it. There were cases in the Bureau that needed to be revisited. Closed cases that deserved to be reopened and reanalyzed. Murders needed to be solved. Suspects needed to be questioned. As a simple enforcer, he followed orders, period. He was more than ready to lead. I'm in the same position as Nate. Carter swallowed hard and hoped they didn't see him sweat. Because lying didn't come easy, never had, never would. But too much rode on getting this position. I found my fated mate, but neither of us wants a big wedding. We plan to elope as soon as our schedules allow. The captain's gaze flipped between them. Then it looks like I have two candidates for the position who are on equal footing. We're having the monthly council meeting Sunday night. We'd like you to bring your fiancés. Carter nearly choked on his own saliva. Sunday night, as in two days from now? You got it. Captain Rich grinned, his smile a bit too forced. It'll be the perfect opportunity for the council to meet you before they vote. Oh, shit. 
Leave your numbers with my secretary, and she'll text you both directions to the Owens's home, the captain said, shaking both of their hands. We'll decide which couple is a better fit after our meeting. Yes, sir. Carter bowed out of the office ahead of Nate, before the captain asked him for his fiancée's name, because he didn't have one to give. Chapter 3 that night, at Faith's request, Carter brought over vodka and cranberry juice. He watched as she poured one drink, downed it, and poured another before he'd even put in the movie. She still seemed to be upset about the phone call she'd had with her brother yesterday. Maybe this time it went deeper than money. During the previews, Carter relayed the whole story about the interview for the detective position. Hold the phone. Faith said as she curled into the corner of her couch. You're getting married? I'd be getting married if I had a bride, a fiancé, or a girlfriend, but I've got none of the above. And I lied to the captain's face, flat out told him I was engaged. I'm screwed, right? He slouched down into the love seat, kicked up his foot on the coffee table, and took a hard drink. Royally screwed. Aren't you still with... She waved her hand around her face and her eyes fluttered closed. The alcohol was already setting in. Paisley? She was pretty. I was never with Paisley officially, so it's hard to say that it ended, but I won't be seeing her anymore. What happened? He didn't want to rehash it. Not tonight. Didn't work out. Let's leave it at that. What are you going to do? She asked softly. No clue. I'm open to suggestions. I always think better with food. She heaved herself off the couch and stubbed her toe on the corner as she headed into the kitchen. A drawer squeaked open. She rummaged for something and reappeared seconds later with a bag of tortilla chips and a gigantic tub of salsa. She popped the top, poured the salsa into a pink dotted bowl, and opened the bag of chips, spinning it in his direction. Dig in. A woman after his own heart. Only he never let women close enough to get there. Well, he let Faith see sides of him that others didn't. But she was a friend, so she didn't count. When he'd first moved to his new place and heard that a female werewolf lived next door, he'd come to introduce himself right away. He found her attractive, with chestnut-colored hair layered around her face, and wide, innocent brown eyes. But there was no spark between them. He didn't have the urge to impress her like he did with the other women he dated. And he didn't get the feeling that she was interested in him in return. So they'd become friends, and he'd really come to enjoy their banter. He could relax with Faith, unlike the other girls he led into his life. Besides, if he dated her, it would end the way it always did. He'd work long hours, piss her off, and inevitably become an insensitive ass. At least, that's what he'd been told. It'd ruin everything. Vodka, chips, and salsa. King's meal right here. He shoved a chip into his mouth, wondering, as he often did, what Faith would look like in wolf form. Her fur would probably be the color of chestnut, matching her hair, and her coat would probably be sleek and smooth. But would she be soft and delicate in wolf form, or bulky and strong? Thanks for the grub, but this doesn't help me. Faith emptied her second drink and wagged a chip his direction. There's only one solution to your problem. We've got to find you a fake fiancé. Uh, what? You need to get engaged. Now. Here. She turned to the back of a magazine and ripped out the last page. Let's make a list of prospects. Let's not, Carter said, laughing. Faith's idea was whack. He couldn't get engaged. No way, no how. Maybe he could come up with a fake fiancé for the party on Sunday and... What? Have her fake die by Monday? Faith ignored him. Okay, Paisley's obviously out. What about the girl you were with before her? Lorin, Carter said, remembering. Great, she grinned, triumphant. Not happening. He chomped into a chimp. 
She's pregnant by her new man. Faith clapped. Instant family, perfect. Oh, yeah, he said, mumbling. Wife and child, just add water. If you think water is what's needed to make a child, you've got something to learn. Giggling, she bumped him in the shoulder and fell into a mound of pillows. Remind me not to get near you in a water bottle. God, she was cute when she laughed. Oh, you dated what's-her-pretty-face before that, Gemma. She gasped, jerked upright, and then scribbled Gemma's name. But wait, didn't she cheat on you? That wasn't exactly the way it went down. Carter had gotten the vibe that Jenna was going to cheat, staying out late, ignoring his phone calls, standing dates with the girls. So he'd ended it before she could. It was the same story over and over again. After his luminary died, he dated other women and had even thought about getting married again. He'd heard about lone wolves marrying others after their mates passed on, but he couldn't do it. Not out of loyalty to his deceased mate, she didn't have the same loyalty during their marriage, but because he simply didn't have the patience to build anything with anyone else. She didn't cheat, but it wasn't far off. Carter poured another drink, this one straight vodka. The cranberry was too sweet for his taste. I don't think any of my exes will... After it's over, they won't... How do I put it? Faith nodded as if she understood. You don't think they'll like you enough to do this for you? Not without a stiff bribe. She snorted when he said stiff. The last thing I want is to get hooked up again, even if it's fake. He scrubbed his hands through his hair. There's got to be another way. Yes, you could tell your captain the truth, she said, swiveling toward him. You could say you told a little white lie and happily work the road for the rest of your life. Not so bad, right? He paused, weighing his options. Right. Or you could leave your ego at the door and say your fiancé doesn't want you to take the job. You want me to admit that I let a woman dictate my career choices? He shook his head, thoughts whirring. Don't think so. No one would believe it. Besides, that still leaves me without the job I've killed myself for. She pursed her lips in that adorable way of hers. Then you have to get engaged. There had to be another way, didn't there? Seconds dragged by, stretching into minutes. The rainstorm that had been pummeling Seattle beat against Faith's cabin windows, storming into a crescendo that had Carter zoning out, listening. Realization struck like a lightning bolt. There was no going back. If I did this, I'd want it to be over as quickly as possible. The council meeting is Sunday, so this thing could be over Monday, he said. Tuesday at the latest. This thing? It's an engagement, Casanova. Faith whacked him with the remote and accidentally changed the channel. No wonder you're single. You really think they'll buy that? Frantically punching remote buttons, she accidentally turned the TV off. Instead of figuring out how to turn it back on, she first narrowed her eyes at the screen and then at him. Won't they think it's strange that you're with someone for the weekend, but are single by the start of your first shift? Never thought about it. So you think it's got to extend beyond the week? His throat scratched. A long engagement? A month? She shoved a chip in her mouth and shook her head. A year? He offered, his throat drying to sandpaper. I thought you said the council thingy wanted a mated pair, she said, finishing off her drink. You might have to actually marry her. Stars danced in front of his eyes and his vision zoomed in and out. Where was a paper bag when you needed one? If you end things too quickly, she said, couldn't they just fire you? They could, but I'll prove them wrong. I'll be an asset to the Bureau on my own. As thunder rumbled outside, the lights flickered. 
Oh, yeah, a power outage would top the cake on this perfect day. Then they wouldn't be able to watch the movie, they'd have to call it a night, and he wouldn't get his faith fix. He couldn't explain how it happened, but she made him feel that in an impossible situation was possible. He felt relaxed around her, like he could conquer the world, and this insane plan would actually work. Worst case scenario, he said, swallowing hard, would be a long engagement that turns into a wedding to prove I'm serious with this chick. How long would I have to fake it? Mmm. She made a sweet little sound in the back of her throat, and something in his gut twisted. Not sure. Six months? A year? Images of wolves in the wild gnawing off their legs to escape traps flashed through his mind. Okay, if I did that, the Bureau would have to let me keep my position. Divorces happen. They'd have to understand. By the end of a year, I'd be firmly rooted in their family. But if whoever I pick gets greedy, or spiteful about the way you broke it off with her last time, Faith interrupted, stealing his drink and taking a hearty swig. Right, he continued. I could lose everything I'm doing this for. I don't know what you're going to do, or what I'm going to do. She hiccuped and patted her chest. If I don't figure something out, all of this could go pfft. He tried to piece together her meaning, but her words were fuddling around. What? She closed her eyes as she spoke. Dawson got into Yale. Yale! Can you believe it? Yale is a weird word. Say it. Yale. 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 He laughed, watching her say the word over and over again, her lips puckering in and out like a fish. He liked drunk faith a lot. Yale, he said, nodding. That's great. And that's a good thing, right? No. She wagged her finger, and he imagined her in wolf form, tail swishing back and forth, her ears perked up playfully. Not a good thing. Now they were getting down to the reason she'd been so upset yesterday. I don't understand, he said, watching her features turn solemn. Why is Dawson going to Yale a problem? She leaned forward, planting her hand on the coffee table for balance. Her eyes were coffee brown and getting glossier by the second. He's my responsibility. Oh, that's a tough word to say when your tongue's numb. Responsibility. She grinned when she got it right, all traces of sadness gone. If he wants Yale, I've got to pay for it. Carter felt his brow furrow. Doesn't he have a job? Full-time one. I got three. She fumbled to hold up three fingers. Still not enough. Our dad went to Yale. Did I tell you that? He shook his head. Yep. Dawson wants to be just like him. That's not surprising. He was a great man. Carter remembered Faith telling him about the way their parents had died. They were non-shifters, killed during a home invasion gone wrong. Their dad had tried to protect them, but he didn't stand a chance against a werewolf. Dawson probably feels closer to your dad when he walks in his shoes. Oh, I know that, she said, rolling her eyes. You're right, you're right, of course you're right. Oh, yeah, she was drunk. Well, two drinks and a half of his made her more tipsy than drunk, but still. No woman told a man he was right three times in a row, or at all, ever, without being a little out of her mind. Gazing far off, Faith brushed her hand over the scar on her neck, as if the mere mention of her father had brought the memories of the tragic event to the surface. In the attack, Dawson and Faith had been bitten, turned into wolves, and left for dead. Joining the Seattle wolf pack had saved them. Carter had no idea Faith had been supporting her brother financially. 
No wonder she worked three jobs and didn't have much to show for it. So you need Yale tuition. He dropped back into the couch cushions, stroking the condensation dripping off his glass. You're in a pickle. You want one? Her eyebrows perked up, though her eyes weren't tracking well. I think I have a jar in the fridge. What? No, Faith, I meant... Never mind. He scraped his hands through his hair. An idea sparked. You still not dating anyone? He said. It wasn't a question. He kept a close eye on her love life, though he didn't know why the interest was so intense. Me? Laughing, she scooped up another chip full of salsa. She missed her mouth. What do you think? Men were stupid. Faith was a sweetheart and pretty in a natural classic kind of way. Perfect for any man who didn't turn relationships toxic. Plus, she was loyal and honest and would never stab her lover in the back. He slid to the edge of the couch, his path suddenly clear. This was his only chance. Sunday was two short days away. Faith, I have a proposition for you. Chapter Four Marry me, Carter said. Her smile fell. At least Faith thought it did. Her lips had gone numb. What? Me? No. She backpedaled. You don't want to do that. Let's go through the list of your gazillion ex-girlfriends. Jealousy soured her stomach. Every Friday night, she listened to stories about his werewolf girlfriends, how beautiful and successful they were. He didn't talk about them to make her feel inferior, but she did. Their skin was probably milky white, smooth and perfect from face to foot. She bet they weren't marred like she was. Yeah, we already exhausted that list. Carter grinned from the side of his mouth, causing a tiny dimple to form on his right cheek. She poked at it, but he dodged and tapped her hand away. The Bureau caught me at a bad time, but I have a solution. Her pulse raced. Marrying me is not a solution. Sure it is. No, it'd be crazy. And exciting. Something she'd dreamed about on more than one occasion. But this wasn't how she'd envisioned a proposal, not even close. He should have been on bended knee in front of their friends and family. At least, that's how she'd always pictured it. He should have been declaring his undying love, not talking about a phony baloney engagement and sham marriage. And what about her luminary? Werewolves could fall in love and marry whomever they wanted. But once in a lifetime, they met their soulmate and were forever changed. They became stronger and faster, and their sense of loyalty increased for that one mate. Some wolves never found their one and only fated mate, and others refused to marry until they did. Faith was open to both falling in love and waiting until she found her luminary, but this went against everything. This wasn't even love. This was a business arrangement. Don't worry, Faith. It would be a name only, Carter said, grabbing for her hand. It wouldn't be real. Oh, yeah, that made her feel better. She was going to be sick. Carter, I want to get married, but I want it to happen with someone who loves me. Where's the romance in this? He blanched. You want romance? You really don't know women at all, do you? He shrugged. I know you. And I know you love your brother more than anything. You'd do anything to see him succeed. He had her there. Carter scooted to the floor and knelt, leaning over the seat cushion next to her. I'll pay Dawson's tuition, the whole thing. Holy shit. The offer floored her. You can't. The blood drained from her face and her hands went all tingly. It's too much, not right. Look, what you'd be giving up for me, he said, his tone turning tender. You'll be going to council dinners and putting on a show that we're a couple. We're going to have to spend more time together. 
I don't mind spending time with you, Carter. She leaned in close. I like you. Way more than she should. I like you, too. That's why this is going to work. I'll get the detective position, he said, his light eyes sparkling with enthusiasm. Your brother gets to go to Yale, and you don't go broke paying for it. All you'd have to do is go to the party with me on Sunday. I'll introduce you as my fiancé. We'll stay engaged for a while, and if they start pressuring me about the wedding date, we'll just get married at City Hall. You won't even have to move in with me since we live so close. You can stay here, and I'll stay at my place. When I convince the council that I'm just as valuable on my own, I'll say we split. We can get a quickie divorce. Married at City Hall? Quickie divorce? Swoon. She fell back against the couch and tried to slow her thoughts. She wanted Dawson to go to Yale more than she'd ever wanted anything. And she liked Carter. He was her very best friend. He worked hard and had been dreaming of this promotion since she met him. The two leading men in her life needed her. But what would she be giving up to do this? Her dreams of a fairy tale wedding? How much did she really want that? I'm dizzy, she said, zoning out on the television. She needed a distraction. Fumbling about, she found the remote and clicked the TV back on. What movie did you bring? Please, Carter whispered, resting his hand on her thigh. Faith. She looked at him and her heart pinched. Why couldn't he touch her like this and mean it? Why couldn't she have been his luminary? All of this would have been so easy. But he'd already found his faded mate and had lost her. That loss must have been devastating for him. She couldn't imagine finding the one you love only to lose them and then have to walk the world alone. She couldn't imagine her life without Carter, whether he was a lover or a friend. Suddenly, she realized between her dreams of a fairy tale wedding and being with Carter that she wanted the latter more. I need this, he said. I need you. Aw, oh, hell, how could she say no now? She held his gaze. Again, what movie did you bring? I might not want to hitch my wagon to a star with no taste. He grinned slowly, keeping his hand on her thigh. Her skin warmed, blooming into a tingly blush. It's so I married an axe murderer. Good pick! Love this guy! She fell over and clutched a throw pillow against her chest. She sighed and said, Fine, I'll marry you. Carter slid onto the couch and dragged her legs over his lap. The dynamic between them was comfortable, as if she'd just told him she wanted butter on her popcorn. But the emotions running through her body were hot and jumpy, on high alert. Her thigh was tingly where his hand touched her. Her stomach was spinning. And she couldn't feel her lips at all. Beyond that, a hollow feeling in the pit of her stomach warned that this wouldn't work out how she hoped it would. Maybe the pit would go away with some food. Now that she thought about it, popcorn with butter sounded amazing. So, um, when you said you'd marry me, Carter said as the movie started, were you talking to me or Mike Myers? Both. She giggled into a hiccup. But you asked first, so you get dibs. Lucky you, I'm quite the prize. He laughed. Thanks, Faith. This means a ton. I know. She rested her head on the back of the couch, feeling as if every pound of the ton he spoke of was weighing heavy on her heart. I know. Chapter 5 Faith woke up to the sound of her Keurig coffee maker spouting heavenly syrup into a cup. Rays of morning light broke through her blinds and shone in her eyes, blinding her. She peeked around her living room through partly opened lids. Even though Carter wasn't in sight, her heightened senses picked up his scent. Had he left his coat behind when he went home last night? Was that the scent she was picking up? Hello? 
Nope. Carter was actually in her cabin. She looked up to see him peek his head around the wall, separating her living room from the kitchen. He looked rested, his light eyes bright, every hair falling in place. God, she probably looked like a troll. Hey, I'm stealing a cup of coffee. His voice was so deep and rich, it was nearly a growl. Hope you don't mind. No, I don't. She sat upright, and the blanket covering her body slid to the floor. Carter must have covered her after she fell asleep last night. That was nice of him. Help yourself. She rubbed her eyes and smoothed down her hair. Want me to make breakfast? You cook? He laughed. Let's nod and say we did, and that it was delicious. What? She hollered. I can cook. Ramen doesn't count. Damn it. She folded her arms over her chest and stuck her tongue out at him as he disappeared into the kitchen once more. Suddenly, reality set in. Carter never came over this early on Saturday morning. Bits and pieces of the previous night clumped together in her brain. Why are you... She turned to peek out her front window. His truck was parked in her driveway. Um, did you stay the night? Don't you remember? He brought out two cups of coffee in giant Disney mugs and handed her Goofy, then moved a heap of blankets and sat beside her. Last night was great. His voice was melted honey, rich and smooth, tingling her in all the right places. But then his words registered and her emotions flipped on a dime. If they slept together, it had been a mistake. No, she corrected smugly. The mistake would have been that she was too drunk to remember it. Did she feel different? Wouldn't she have been able to tell if she and Carter had slept together? She would have been sore. Blissfully, wonderfully sore. We didn't... How to put it? Tell me we didn't... He busted out laughing. Of course Carter hadn't made a move. Of course they hadn't slept together. Not his type. You're not his type. Disappointment streamed through her, but she buried it with anger. She smacked him in the chest. Hey, watch it. Carter recovered, guarding the Mickey mug with his other hand. I spilled soda on your couch the day before yesterday. If I spill coffee today, you might make me buy you a new one. His eyebrows danced. Or maybe that's your plan. This thing looks haggard. Ignoring him completely, Faith sipped the veranda blend coffee and moaned when the creaminess hit her tongue. He'd put French vanilla creamer in it, just the way she liked. She couldn't help but wonder if he was an attentive lover. You fell asleep. He said, his words a sexy drawl. I covered you up and locked the door on my way out. His scent clung to the blanket, to the couch. What she wouldn't give to have his scent cling to her skin. How'd you get back in? She asked. Use the key you hide above the door. Okay, he was sweet, but way too observant. Damn cops. Do you remember anything about last night? He asked. Her stomach churned as memories of the night before swam into mental view. Oh, she recalled a few things. How could she forget? She took a solid gulp of her coffee. I remember vodka, an axe murderer, and a marriage proposal. Good. The important things. He nodded. What do you think? You're serious? Why not? Because it's crazy? Hasn't the light of day knocked some sense into you? She suddenly had the urge to pace. Taking her coffee with her, she pushed off from the couch and headed out the front door onto the porch. The morning air was crisp and cold, typical for January, with a misty rain moving through the trees. It felt better out here. She could breathe easier. Her porch stretched the entire length of her house and wrapped around the side. She walked the length and back, thinking about Carter's predicament, her brother's tuition, and her options. 
and why she'd ultimately decided to say yes. By the time Carter joined her outside, she felt better about the whole thing. Barely, but the time away from him helped. I want to pay you back, she said finally, leaning against the railing. If you cover Dawson's tuition for now, that's fine, but I want to pay you back when I can. Deal. Carter settled onto the wooden porch swing facing her and kicked his feet against the deck to get it moving. He had a kind of powerful grace that struck Faith when he was doing the simplest of things, like pushing a wooden swing. He'd be lethal in wolf form, no doubt. As long as you know that you don't have to pay me back for anything, I'd gladly cover his tuition for what you're doing for me. Like to be doing a lot of other things for you, to you, whatever. She nodded slowly, took a deep breath, and pushed dirty thoughts of Carter out of her mind. Aren't you the least bit worried that the council is going to see through this? I'm not like your other girlfriends. I'm going to have to pretend to be somebody completely different to make this believable. The thought saddened her, though she didn't know why. I don't think you should be anyone but you. That's the only way this will work. He kicked his feet out and back, his jeans pulling taut over his legs as he stretched them out. Do you want a wedding? Her coffee was fresh, but it wasn't bold enough for this discussion. Dawson's the only family I have, and I'd really rather him not know about the arrangement. Wouldn't want him to feel like he's a burden. He knows I'm not dating anyone, so announcing an engagement would send up a bunch of red flags. It'll be better if he doesn't know. Understood. What about you? Do you have any family to warn about an upcoming nuptial? I have a sister who lives in Chicago and a half-brother in Greece. He sipped on his coffee. They didn't come to my first wedding, so I don't see why they'd care about my second. She was curious about his first marriage and his first wife, but now wasn't the time to ask. Now that she thought about it, he didn't talk much about his parents, his siblings, or his love life. What about your parents? Faith asked. They were both born wolves. That was all she'd been told. Will they be interested in knowing about an engagement or upcoming wedding? My parents died 50 years ago. Oh, she said. I didn't know that. What about your friends? Anyone in the pack you're close to? Oh, yeah, I've got hundreds of friends. He smirked. But none measure up to you. Put your big game away, Casanova. I've got enough sweetness in my coffee. Why did he insist on toying with her emotions? So, what's our story? We should work out the kinks before tomorrow night. He stepped off the swing and joined her at the railing peering out into the yard. The sun peeked through the canopy of fur above them, picking up subtle highlights in his dark hair. Why do you have to be so good-looking? It'd be easier to see him as a friend and only a friend if he didn't have the whole sexy yet dangerous Colin Farrell vibe going on. I think we should stick to the basics, keeping as true as we can to how we really met. We should say I moved in next door to you last year, and we hit it off right away. You knew from the moment you saw my rugged good looks that I was the one for you. Oh, yeah. She groaned and rolled her eyes. That's exactly how it happened. I think you couldn't keep your dirty paws off my bodacious bod. He turned, leaning back against the railing. You do have curves for days. Despite the way he was playfully ogling her body, she knew full well he didn't like women with soft stomachs and a little something extra on their hips. The women he dated were real skinny and had somehow discovered a way to make every ounce of fat on their body suck to their breasts. Even in wolf form, she had a little bit of meat to her. She wasn't one of those dainty wolves who looked like she could be tossed around by her mate. No, Faith was bigger than the average female, and stronger. She stood upright and flattened her shirt down her stomach. We should set up other rules, too. He nodded. Like what? I don't think you should be able to date anyone while you're dating me. She chose her words carefully. 
If the council thinks I'm your wife and they see you around town with someone else, that would reflect on me. That's fair. He emptied his cup. I won't date anyone until this is over. But if I can't date anyone, you shouldn't be able to either. Tit for that and all that stuff. Gosh, now I'll have to cancel all my dates and I'll be making phone calls all day. She tisked. Somehow I think I'll manage that part. Any other rules you want to set up while we're on the subject? He nailed her with a glare that sizzled the blood in her veins. Honesty, first and foremost. I won't be lied to. Good, because she didn't want to be lied to either. More importantly, though, she didn't want to look stupid in any way, shape, or form. She'd had enough of that when she was younger, when the kids in school would make fun of the scar on her neck. Then, when she thought she'd put the past behind her and finally accepted the permanent marking, her ex-boyfriend had thrown it in her face. Look at you, he'd said during their very public breakup. You're more beast than beauty. All I see when I look at you is a cut that didn't go deep enough. She'd broken up with him after he said it. Actually, that was an understatement. She'd thrown her drink in his face and then broken his nose with a left jab. But she heard the gasps and whispers from other patrons in the restaurant long after she'd left. The memory of that moment had her cheeks burning and her stomach churning with hatred. He'd been an asshat to say such a thing, and she hadn't thought much about him since. But the feeling of being humiliated that way, publicly, still hurt. She took a deep breath to calm herself down. I won't lie to you, she said. And one more rule. You will not make me feel like a fool. Deal. He extended his hand and she took it. His skin was rough but warm. It wasn't the marriage proposal she'd been dreaming of since she was a little girl, even though the man himself was pretty darn close to what she'd imagined her hunky groom to be. When's the wedding? she asked, taking back her hand. Their contact didn't seem to phase him one bit. Do we have to decide right now? Can't we be engaged for a while first? We can, but when a couple gets engaged, they usually start planning. Absent-mindedly, she rubbed the spot on her left hand where he would put a wedding band. If we have a date in mind, it'll look more realistic. Hmm. He nodded, agreeing. Six months from now sounds vague enough. Sometime in June or July. That'll work. His gaze caught on her hand. I completely forgot. You'll need an engagement ring for tomorrow night's dinner. A warm blush fanned over her cheeks. No, I don't think... I've got to run. He set the mug on the railing and swept down the steps to the front yard before she could stop him. See you tomorrow morning, around ten? She frowned. What's happening in the morning? We're going through your closet to pick what you're going to wear for dinner. I'm fully capable of choosing my own clothes. He turned back at his driver's door. When was the last time you wore something other than jeans and Converse? And yoga pants don't count. I... Damn. Everything about tomorrow night has to be perfect. I'm not leaving anything to chance. He slid into his truck, rolled down the passenger window, and leaned across the bench seat. See you tomorrow, wifey. The coffee in her stomach tumbled at the name. Oh, God. Was she ready for this? She checked her watch. She had two dogs to pick up for walks in 15 minutes and another three shortly after that. And since she'd forgotten to update her blog last night, she'd have to squeeze that somewhere into her day. She bolted into her house, snatched her cell, and called her best friend Tracy for backup. Chapter 6 Bright and early Sunday morning, Faith eyed Carter as he strode through her living room door, a Starbucks cup in his hand. He looked completely relaxed in a black t-shirt and jeans with holes in the knees. It wasn't every day he exposed his sleeve tattoos this way either. They wrapped around his wrists and snaked up his arms in all shapes and colors. 
The urge to lift his sleeve and trace the dark lines over his shoulder struck her hard. Morning, sunshine, he said as he slammed the door shut behind him. You ready for today? Ready as I'll ever be. Faith checked the clock. When she called Tracy last night, her friend had said she'd show up first thing Sunday morning to help pick out an outfit. Tracy was perpetually late. Blast. Faith would have felt a lot better about this whole thing with Tracy's opinion. Carter said he'd help, but outside of white cotton t-shirts and jeans, he had little fashion sense. Faith knelt near the travel kennel that had been dropped off just before Carter showed up and bent to peer inside. A tiny black and white ball of fur huddled in the corner. What's in the crate? he asked, perching on the edge of a bar stool. She unlatched the gate, swung it open, and reached inside. It's a male black and tan teacup Yorkie. Pets and Paws Animal Shelter didn't have room for him and didn't want to send him to another shelter where he might have been euthanized. Are you fostering him? For a while. Faith smiled as her fingers sank into silky soft fur. She wrapped her hand around its delicate frame. The shelter had her number on file as a volunteer foster if they filled up. She took on adoptable dogs from time to time. Someone will want this little guy, so he'll stay here until the shelter or I can find him a good home. She pulled out the pup. Here he is. She cupped him in her hands and held him against her. He was soft and warm, cuddling up against her. But as she turned to show Carter, the dog squirmed and fought to get out of her arms. Easy there, she whispered. Easy. I think they dropped off the wrong animal, he said. That's a rat. No, it's a teacup. They're supposed to be this small. Laughing, Faith fought to control the black and white ball of fur. This guy doesn't seem to want to be held. Gently, she set the dog down. It scurried to Carter's side like its fur was on fire and latched onto the tip of his boot. It pumped furiously, its petite backside doing an erratic version of the Humpty Dance. What the hell? Carter gave the dog a little shake. Run all the way over here for a quick hump? The puppy wouldn't shake off. Looks like he likes you, Faith said. Must be those rugged good looks you were talking about. Shut, Carter wiggled his foot around. Up. Come, Faith ordered. She patted her leg. Puppy, come. Could you say something else? Carter leveled her with a flat stare. Call him by name. He doesn't have one. She walked across the living room and scooped up the horny pooch. He stared at Carter, a crazed look in his tiny brown eyes. Since you two are so close now, I think you should name him. Nah, I'll leave that to you. He reached out and petted the puppy stroking his hands over his black and white splotched coat. Did you get something formal to wear tonight? Did you? I'm wearing a tux. Fancy. When the pooch stopped panting, she tucked him under her arm and carried him into her bedroom. This time, Carter didn't follow. I called Tracy over to give a woman's opinion on what to wear. She called out. She should be here any minute. The sound of tires over gravel stirred through the house. On the money, Carter said from the living room. Did you tell her about the, uh, arrangement? Cradling the pooch with one hand, Faith opened her closet with the other, yanked out the fanciest clothes she had, and tossed them on her bed. No, I told her that you asked me out. You're taking me somewhere swanky tonight. Sounds good. The door creaked open. The pooch yapped and squirmed to get free. He'd have to work on his mounting issues. Too bad some of that pent-up sexual energy couldn't be transferred from dogs to werewolves. She knew of one in particular to give it to. Hey, Carter, Faith heard Tracy say. Have you been? Well enough. It's about time you asked Faith out. She's been Tracy, Faith hollered, and then stuck her head around the corner. Glad you came. Now, if her friend would just shut her mouth before she said something totally embarrassing. Tracy knew all about her feelings for Carter, about their standing Friday movie night and how he'd never once made a move. God, could she be more pathetic? 
Tracy skirted around the corner and gasped when she laid eyes on the pup. Oh, my God. Her jaw went slack. Isn't he the cutest? She ripped him from Faith's arms before she could hand him over. Cupping the dogs in her hands, Tracy rubbed his fur against her face, made mewing sounds against his belly, and let him lick her face. They were practically bonded. Well, except for the fact that Tracy wasn't a werewolf, and didn't know about werewolves or their lifelong bonding process. Considering they'd just tongued, those were minor details. Where'd you get him? Tracy cooed, her blue eyes twinkling bright. He's just the most adorable little thing, aren't you, boy, aren't you? I'm watching him for the shelter. Mind holding him while I show you what I was thinking for tonight? Not at all. Tracy settled onto the edge of the bed and continued to make out with the furball. We'll sit and watch together. I'm still here, Carter yelled from the living room. I want to see. Why do you care so much about her wardrobe anyway? Tracy balked. Are you a control freak or something? Faith heard Carter sigh through the closed bedroom door. I don't want to tell her where we're going for dinner, but I want to make sure she's dressed appropriately. That makes sense, I guess. After kicking off her converse, Faith stripped out of her jeans and cable-knit sweater. She stepped into a deep purple pantsuit, zipped up and shrugged into the matching coat. Option one, she said, spreading her arms wide. What do you think? As Tracy detached her face from the pooch, she shrieked. Sweetheart, the color's great, but the outfit is only an option if it's 1993. Are those shoulder pads? No. Faith jabbed at her shoulders to make sure. Maybe. It's not that bad. It's not that great. Tracy leaned over the bed and mouthed the words, You want him to like you, right? How to answer? Faith nodded feeling naked even though she was cloaked in purple polyester. Then take it off and burn it. Show me, Carter barked. As Faith opened the bedroom door to show him, Tracy lifted the pup in front of her face and hid behind him. Carter laughed, covered it with a gulp of his Starbucks. Tracy's right. Burn it. I said it was an option. Faith grabbed the open door and slammed it shut, in Carter's laughing face. She stripped down and dressed in option number two, a simple black dress with spaghetti straps and a low-cut front. The bottom was plain, reaching her feet, but the top showed off the girls. Better? she asked Tracy, spinning around. Tracy peeked out from behind the pup, who whimpered at the sight of the dress. Better? she said flipping her blonde curls over her shoulder. But not right. Go show Carter that one so he sees the rack you're always hiding under those hideous t-shirts. Faith planted her hands on her hips. She didn't want to show him her rack. She wanted him to like her for who she was, to think she was sexy no matter what she wore. Move, Tracy mouthed. Show him what he's missing. With a huff, Faith shuffled into the living room and spun around. Carter had moved to the couch and slid forward so that his body was flat, with his head supported by a scrunched-up throw pillow. Thoughts of straddling his middle invaded Faith's brain. He could stay just like that. She could put her feet on the floor on either side of him. Faith, he said. Did you hear me? I'm sorry. She shook dirty thoughts of him out of her head. What? I said you've got a lint sheet stuck right there, right there on the back. Disaster. She showed him what he was missing, all right, a freaking lint sheet. She twisted and bent around, ripped the sheet off and crumpled it into a ball. What do you think, overall? I think we're getting closer. Do you remember that girl I took to the office Christmas party last year, Vixian? Of course. Couldn't forget a name or a woman like that. She was a complete hooch, salivating over every word Carter said. Faith had only met Vixie once, but it was enough to leave a bad taste in her mouth. 
She'd painted a picture that things were too perfect. Her boobs were too perky, their sex was too hot. He cuddled with her all night long. bibbity bobbity blah I think so, Faith said, repressing her gag reflex. Red hair, Jessica Rabbit type? No, I like redheads, he corrected. She was blonde, fatal attraction type. Don't remember. Wouldn't expect you to. He sat upright. Anyhow, she knew how to put on a good show. How to make everyone in the room think that she was the most gorgeous one there, even if she wasn't. She oozed confidence and grace. And that's what made her sexy. It's probably also what made her crazy, Tracy said from the doorway. But if it's sexy starlet that you're going for, I can turn our duck into a swan. I'll need a few hours alone with her. As long as I know she's in capable hands. Carter stood and chucked his coffee cup into the recycling. I'm out of here. Tracy set down the pup. It made a beeline for Carter's boot. He high-stepped, but the pooch went after the other. Call your dog, Carter said, holding his foot high. Do something. Tracy erupted into laughter as Faith scooped the dog off Carter's boot. Okay, okay, she soothed. I've got you now. You'd be cute if you weren't such a little humping freak. Carter flattened the fur on the top of the dog's head. Humperdink. He met Faith's eyes. I think I've just named your dog. Chapter 7 Carter ran up the steps to Faith's cabin and knocked on the front door. He didn't normally knock at her place, but he wasn't normally picking her up for a date, either. This isn't a date, he reminded himself. It's an arrangement. Was this really going to work? Faith had become a great friend, but were they going to be able to pull off a ruse like this? Would the council believe they were a couple? Every member in attendance would be a werewolf with heightened senses and a keen sense for smelling bullshit. They could sense when a wolf had marked his mate, and when they'd completed the bonding process to seal their fates together. Lucky for him and Faith, they had a perfectly rational explanation for why they hadn't completed the werewolf's bonding process. He'd already found and lost his mate, and wolves only had one luminary in each lifetime. Faith would be a wife but never his luminary. He doubted anyone on the council would bring that up, but it would be the logical whisper in the back of their head if they started to doubt their relationship. To really hit it home, Carter would have to create a spark with Faith where there was none. Remember to gaze at her from across the room all night, whisper sweet things in her ear and palm the small of her back to guide her into the room. They were friends, for Christ's sake. This was going to be difficult. As the door swung open, Carter stepped back. Tracy peeked her head between the screen and the door. You're not going to believe what I did to our girl, she whispered. Hope she didn't change too much. Can I come in? He closed his coat as a chill swept across the porch. The moon was full tonight, and a storm was closing in. It had poured before the night was through. Tracy backed into the living room, holding the door wide open. Faith, he's here! Faith didn't need an announcement. With her heightened senses, she'd be able to pick up his scent the instant he stepped on her property. Something was missing. Ah, the tiny fluffy thing that should have been attached to his ankle. Where's Humperdinck? A whimper escaped from the crate beside the couch. He couldn't control his urges, so we locked him up for a bit. Tracy fell into the corner of the couch and tucked her knees beneath her. He took a liking to the TV remote. She giggled, tossing her hair over her shoulder in an attempt to be flirtatious. He went after the Roomba, too, but yelped when it spun and tried to clean off his paw. Humping prison, he patted the top of the crate. Feel bad for you, little guy. Do you know who I feel bad for? Tracy grabbed his arm and held him tight as she whispered, You, if you hurt one hair on Faith's head. He huffed. Don't be ridiculous. I'm not going to hurt her. Then don't play games. Tracy's expression darkened. Why'd you ask her out? 
He tilted his head and narrowed his eyes. Because I want to go out with her, why else? But she's not your type. And you know my type? I know that she's the exact opposite of every single girl you've dated in the last year. She's nice, she's real, and she's not some plastic bimbo looking for a fun time. I know that. He folded his arms over his chest. Maybe my tastes have changed. Her lips twisted. Maybe so, but consider yourself warned. Warned about what? Faith's voice sang from the direction of her bedroom. Carter turned and sucked in a clipped breath. She was a vision. A staggering beauty in an emerald green dress that pinched together at her waist and emphasized curves he didn't realize she had. The dress flared at her hips and covered her feet. The fabric over her chest was loose and scrunched into a few wispy layers that showed off an ample amount of milky white cleavage. What'd you do to her? He asked, his mouth going dry. Tracy sighed. Everything. What do you think? Faith crossed her hands shyly in front of her. Too much? No. He took a step closer, stopped as his knees wobbled. You'll wow everyone at the party. She turned her espresso-colored eyes downward as if he'd said something wrong. Didn't every woman want to turn heads when they went out? Are you ready? He asked, extending his hand. Let me get my clutch. She disappeared into the kitchen. Tracy snapped for Carter's attention. Remember what I did to Humperdinck when he couldn't control himself. Next stop is the surgeon. She made cutting motions with her hands. Snip, snip, if you get my drift. Let that be a lesson to you. Suppressing a shiver, Carter stepped outside and waited on the porch for Faith to join him. The pull to the moon made the blood chug through his veins at a normal pace again. His reaction to seeing Faith was bizarre, so not like him. Must be the full moon. Faith couldn't stop her knees from shaking. They knocked together all the way down I-90 to Mercer Island, no matter how she pressed her hands against her thighs to make them chill out. She didn't feel right in this dress. It was too tight, too much like the dresses that Carter's other girlfriends wore. Her heels, the black stilettos that Tracy had let her borrow, were too high. She was going to fall right off and sprain her ankle. This wasn't her. But this was who Carter wanted, needed, for tonight. You'll do great, Carter said, his hands gripping the steering wheel hard as he turned off the freeway. All you've got to do is pretend you're madly in love with me. Shouldn't be too difficult, considering she wasn't far off. I told you, I've got this. She took a deep breath and stared out the window at the full moon. She could feel its pull tugging on something deep within her. Being a turned wolf, this was the only time of the month when she had the ability to shift. Carter had it easy. As a born wolf, he could shift when he wanted. Although he felt the pull to the moon, his shifts were mostly driven by extreme emotions, such as anger or grief. Did he date both born and turned wolves? I remember how Vixian used to act when you went out with her, she said. If that's what you want, that's who I'll be. He looked at her, his light eyes piercing her through the dark. If I wanted Vixian at my side, I would have asked her to marry me. That's sweet of you to say. He'd probably lost her number. As he turned down Fabin Drive, rows of cars appeared on either side of the road. He parallel parked his Tahoe between two Porsches, killed the engine, and turned to her. He was so breathtakingly handsome, it nearly pained her to look at him. His dark hair was cut short, but the nearby streetlight still managed to pick up shades of chestnut and auburn in the strands. His cheekbones were high and defined, his jaw a thick length of bone that supported a set of plush lips that she'd dreamed of kissing on more than one occasion. Those lips were too sensual, too enticing. He was probably an amazing kisser. It was his eyes, though, that held her captive. They were ice blue, the color of the purest glacier, yet they weren't cold. 
They radiated warmth straight to her core. There's only one thing left to do, he said, and dug into the pocket inside his tuxedo jacket. It would look funny if I'd asked you to marry me without giving you a ring. Her breath hitched as he pulled out a small velvet box and handed it to her. Holding it in her palm, Faith got the feeling that this was it. She was standing on a precipice, looking out over the vast span of her future with Carter. They'd be married. She'd be a wife and have a husband who worked for the Enforcement Bureau. The future looked bright when painted that way. Only as soon as he got the promotion and established himself, she'd be divorced. And alone. Her heart stuttered as she flipped open the lid. The ring was white gold or maybe platinum. Small band with a small square diamond in the center. It was cute, modest. Didn't want anything too extravagant, he said. Do you like it? Sure, of course. Absent-mindedly, Faith wondered what kind of ring Carter had bought his ex-wife. Was he the excessive, shower-your-woman-with-jewels kind of guy? Or was he the subtle, sweet kind of boyfriend, who didn't think the depth of his love equated to the size of the diamond sitting on his woman's finger? He talked about his girlfriends on Friday nights, but the conversations usually hovered around their clinginess or desire to settle down. He never really talked about how he treated them. She plucked the ring from its velvet bed and slipped it on her finger. It was loose, but wouldn't fall off. It felt odd, misplaced. Probably because the engagement was fake. Better get used to this feeling. She'd probably feel odd and misplaced at Carter's side all night. If it needs to be resized, Carter said, I can take it in later. I think it's fine. She didn't know why, but she couldn't meet his eyes. This was all too awkward. Couldn't they go back to being friends? On impulse, she leaned over and gave him an elbow to the gut. Thanks. No, thank you for doing this. I would have been up shit creek without you. He smirked, revealing a tiny dimple on his left cheek. We should probably get in there. Ready? After taking a deep breath, Faith willed confidence to fill her. She spun the ring on her finger and glanced at Carter out of the corner of her eye. He looked as nervous as she felt. Be someone else. Play the part. You're going to get the job, she said, channeling the sexy, cool confidence of someone she wasn't. I'll make sure of it. He pulled back his shoulders. Then let's do this. Chapter 8 Carter took Faith's arm, aware of the heat her body emanated as she pressed against him, and led her through the Owens's home. It was a mansion of glass, with an open floor plan and a lap pool stretching through the center of the home. Bridges spanned the pool, connecting the kitchen and living room to the bedrooms and office. It was the most amazing home he'd ever seen. In this environment, surrounded by fifty or so high-ranking members of the Enforcement Bureau, Carter expected Faith to stumble or freeze up. Surprisingly, she didn't do either. She introduced herself to the captain and members of the council as Carter's fiance, smiling and talking effortlessly. It actually felt comfortable to have her arm snaked through his. Although they could have remained indoors, where a few members were gathering around the hearth, the party was centralized in the backyard. A large tri-level patio lit with tiny white lights ended at a small section of beach. Looking out, a private dock stretched into Lake Washington. You're doing great, he said, escorting her onto the patio. I'm so nervous I'm sweating. Pressing his hand against the small of her back, he leaned in close and whispered, I can't tell. She smelled sweet, soft like she'd just gotten out of the shower. He thought making the switch from friend to girlfriend was going to be uncomfortable, but he was wrong. Touching her back was easy. He didn't hesitate or question whether it looked right, and he breathed in the rose-scented fragrance in her hair, 
like a lover would do to his partner, without even realizing it. I could use a drink. She brushed her hands up and down her arms. Or two. Hadn't she just said she was sweating? If he wasn't mistaken, goosebumps were blooming over her skin. He escorted her to a bar situated in front of the line of trees. The home was adjacent to a forest, but there were enough trees to provide shadow and cover from the homes next door. Vodka cranberry for the lady, he ordered. I'll take a crown and coke. The bartender mixed quickly and slid them over. Carter Griffin, there you are, a male voice said from behind him. He turned. Nate looked presentable, as he always did. Black suit and skinny tie, hair buzzed short. They shook hands as Nate gave Carter a wide, pompous grin. Good to see you, Carter said. This is my fiance, Faith Hamilton. So you're the worthy competition, she said, extending her hand. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure's mine. Instead of shaking, Nate turned her hand over and kissed her knuckles. Carter had the uncanny urge to growl in disapproval. He dismissed the reaction as ridiculous and shoved his hands in his pockets to stop from hauling faith against him. Carter, Nate said, I think you've met my fiancé. I have. Pumpkin? Nate called to a woman in red silk standing a few feet away, her back to them. A waterfall of blonde hair cascaded down her back, and where her hair ended, the fabric of the dress was cut away, revealing a wolf paw print tattoo. When she turned, Carter froze. Nate draped his arm over her shoulder. Paisley Brooks. Yeah, Carter had more than met the model-turned-actress. They went out a few months back and had a few bouts between the sheets before he'd called it quits. She pursed her bright red lips before pulling them back into a smile. Good to see you, Carter. I haven't seen you since that night at Cosmos. I was at the bar for a few minutes, turned around, and you'd just disappeared on me. I didn't know what happened. He wasn't about to sit around and watch her flirt with every man in the bar. That's what happened. I realized I had a better deal waiting for me somewhere else. Giving in to the urge surging through his veins, he tugged Faith against him. This is my fiancé, Faith. Oh. Paisley set her martini on the bar and extended her hand. Lovely to meet you. Same here. Faith smiled, though Carter could feel tension ratcheting through her shoulders. How do you and Carter know each other? We used to date, Paisley practically purred, and then she beamed. Didn't he tell you? Yeah, he had. Faith took a hard drink. No need to dig up old things from the past. Carter buried his face in his glass to hide the grin stretching across his face. Faith had her claws out. Paisley smiled, though it didn't reach her eyes, and Nate ordered a scotch on the rocks. Aren't you a darling, Paisley said tightly. Where has Carter been hiding you? In his bed. Faith pushed her drink across the bar. Carter, what do you say we thank the Owenses for welcoming us into their home tonight? Lead the way. They traipsed around a sparkling pool and across a wooden dance floor to where the Owenses were seated and talking to the captain. Carter couldn't help but notice that Faith walked with an elegant kind of grace. Was it the shoes, the dress, the expectations of the night? He'd never seen her look more regal than this moment. She was putting on one hell of a show. This fake engagement of theirs just might work. As they stepped off the raised dance floor, her ankle twisted. She pitched forward, gasping as she fell. He reached out to catch her, but it was too late. Everyone on the patio let out a collective moan as her knees hit the concrete. Are you all right? Cradling her beneath his arm, he helped her up. Faith, are you okay? I'm fine, she bit out, but she wouldn't stand up straight. She flattened out the front of her dress, restrapped her heel, using his arm for balance. I tore my dress. Look, it's- Don't worry about the dress. Come on, let's sit you down. When she nodded, Carter finally got a look at her face. 
Tears hung to her lashes and threatened to fall. The sight panged his stomach. Dear, how are your knees? Mrs. Owens asked, coming to help. I've told Manny to put an easement against the edges of that dance floor, but getting a man to do anything is a pain in the behind. Are you hurt badly? Faith hobbled to a chair at their table. I think I just need to get off my feet for a moment. Do you want ice? Carter asked. Ice, yes, Mrs. Owens hollered. Manny, get some ice. No, no, really, don't trouble yourselves. Faith sat down and tried to hide the rip that sliced from her knee to the floor. Just give me a minute. Sweetheart, Carter said with so much ease that it shocked him. Take all the time you need. He'd called her sweetheart. Don't get used to this feeling. Faith had repeated those words to herself over and over again throughout the party, but they didn't seem to be working. The more time she and Carter spent together this way, the more difficult it was for Faith to separate the act from the reality. Carter looked at her as if she was his fiance, as if he truly cared for her. His touch was soft, the gleam in his light eyes gentle. Don't get used to this. They'd spent the next hour at a private table with the captain and the Owenses. When dinner was served, Mrs. Owens insisted that Faith and Carter stay and join them at their table. They talked over herb-crusted salmon and asparagus, and laughed heartily after a few glasses of wine. After getting over the initial embarrassment, Faith realized tripping over the dance floor lip was probably the best thing that could have happened to them. They got to sit at the table with influential people, while Nate and Carter's ex, the freaking actress, had to sit near the pool. She didn't want to be too hopeful, but it seemed like she and Carter were hitting it off. Carter leaned close. How's your ankle? Getting better? Good. He smiled, warming her heart. Want to take a walk? They just lit up the gazebo. Faith followed his line of sight to the pier jutting into the lake. At the end, a gazebo had been illuminated with strings of miniature white lights. The night was completely dark, and not a single star peeked from the lumbering cloud cover. It smelled like rain. All right. Carter pulled out her chair and waited for her to lead the way. As David Gray played softly in the background, they wound around the pool, passing Nate and Bimbo, who pretended not to notice them, and down to the beach. They ascended the few steps onto the dock, and then walked side by side to the end where a bench stood. The water was pitch black, and the warm lights of the houses along the shore looked like they were calling people home. I can't thank you enough, he said as they sat on the bench seat beneath the lights. You've got them eating out of your hand. I don't know about that. You do. His gaze heated the side of her face. Did you trip on purpose? She laughed and covered the tear in her dress with her hand. No, but it worked out pretty well, didn't it? You certainly got the sympathy vote. For the next few minutes, nothing but the sound of water lapping against the wood posts of the pier filled the silence between them. Faith couldn't even hear her own heartbeat. She was completely at ease with him. Their eyes met, and for a split second, Faith thought he was going to lean in and kiss her. Want another drink? He asked quickly, averting his gaze to the lake. I'd like another drink. He stood, brushing his hands down his pants. Wine? She nodded. I guess, sure. Wait here, he said, then stormed down the pier. It was quiet without him, still... The solitude under the gazebo was nice, at first. But as the minutes dragged on, Faith started to wonder if he was going to return at all. She peered through the dark at the Owens' house. Carter wasn't at the bar, but she couldn't pick him out from the other members of the pack who were also in tuxedos. Suddenly, a silhouette appeared at the end of the pier. He was coming back. Nerves spiraled in her belly. She breathed deeply and slid her hands beneath her legs so they wouldn't quiver. He was finally seeing her as someone he could be with. 
she'd finally gotten out of the dreaded friend zone. She was going to owe Tracy big time for helping her pick out this dress. He's a dumbass for leaving you out here all alone, a deep voice said. Nate? Deflating, she said. He just went to get us a drink. It didn't feel right being out here with Nate like this. He'll be right back. Mind if I sit? He pointed to the bench. Yes? No, not at all. Faith scooted to the end of the bench, making room for Carter's competition. How long have you two been a couple? His tone was oddly light, like they were long-lost friends who were in need of catching up. About a year, off and on. Don't stumble, play the part. He's dated other women this year, he said, as rain dimpled the water around them and made a soft pitter-pat on the gazebo roof above. Doesn't that bother you? She looked at him, feigning confidence. We haven't been exclusive until recently. He's dated other women, and I've dated other men. His relationships with them would only bother me if I was insecure about what we have. And you're not, Nate said. No. It was raining harder now. The clouds must have really opened up. Faith glanced down the pier. Empty. Carter still wasn't coming. What would have held him up for this long? Well... I've got a confession to make, he said softly. The relationship he had with my fiancé bothers me. You're a stronger person than I am to let that kind of bond roll off your shoulders. Faith twitched, but didn't take the bait. From what Paisley says, they were close to getting married. That's nice. Didn't sound familiar, though. Faith mentally scrolled through Carter's dating reel. He dated Paisley a few times, but he'd said they weren't serious. A fling, he'd said. Why wouldn't he have told her the truth? When are you two getting married? Lightning ripped open the sky, illuminating the hard lines of Nate's face. Next weekend. His jaw clenched. But we're going to need to have a talk before then. Especially after tonight. What do you mean? Thunder rumbled the gazebo, and a gust of wind blew through the posts, chilling Faith to the bone. Because I don't like the way they're talking. Nate stood, paced around the bench, and rested his hands on Faith's shoulders. He pointed to the top of the patio near the back doors of the house. They're standing too close, like two people who still share something. Through the rain, Faith spotted two figures. One was facing the lake, and the other was pressed against his or her side. As lightning illuminated the dark, the sharp angles of Carter's face and the bright red sheen of Paisley's dress came into view. They weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't kissing. She couldn't even tell if they were touching or if they were simply standing really close together. But Nate was right. Carter should have been out here with her instead of pinned against the wall by a Hollywood starlet. Although he and Faith weren't actually dating, which meant he could stand near or touch anyone he wanted, he'd sworn not to make her look foolish for the next few months. They were at a business function. He was supposed to be with her, his new fiance, and he was flirting with an ex-girlfriend. Now she felt foolish. Slowly, Faith glanced down at her tattered dress, the crazy tall heels strapped to her feet, the French pedicure. She raised her chin and sighed. She'd made a fool of herself by thinking she could pretend to be somebody she wasn't, for thinking Carter might actually feel something for her beyond friendship, for wanting him to. As the clouds on the horizon parted, the bright yellow glare of the moon peeked through, wrenching her heart. I'm sorry, she said, taking off her heels and hooking the straps with her fingers. I have to go. She left Nate in the gazebo and ran down the pier, eager to shift, desperate to tear through these clothes and be herself again. As she hit the line of trees behind the bar, she let the energy bawling in her middle explode outward. Muscles stretched and elongated, she dropped to all fours as a coat of silky brown hair covered her body. 
The dress fell away to tatters, and the heels dropped by the wayside. Striding through the trees and rain, Faith felt more like herself than she did at the party, in clothes that barely fit her and the heels she had to borrow from a friend. As she took off alongside the house and headed toward the street, a few howls erupted from behind her, while in wolf form she could sense the others. And now she was sensing that the wolf pack was confused and concerned, probably worried that she'd let someone on the street spot her. A moment later, she could tell they were sending out a few wolves to track her and bring her back. She wasn't stupid enough to get caught. Paws striking fast, Faith wound around trees and made it to the front gate. Even though she knew she shouldn't, she looked back at the Owens' mansion. The front door opened. Carter stood in the entryway, hands hanging at his sides, a look of bewilderment marring his gorgeous face. Chapter 9 Faith! In the dark, Carter banged on her front door, his fists aching from clenching them so hard. The drive home from the party hadn't cooled him off like he thought it would. Two hours later, even after the moon had arced across the night sky, his blood was still boiling. Faith had left him high and dry. I know you're in there. I can smell something baking. No answer. He'd stupidly waited for Faith to return to the party. He told the members of the Bureau that she didn't feel well, so she must not have been able to suppress the urge to shift. It happened to the best werewolves from time to time. But she hadn't returned. How she got back to her place without being seen, he had no idea. He paced along the porch, peeking in the living room windows. She had the blinds shut and the curtains drawn. Humperdinck yelped from inside and scratched at the front door. Faith! He knocked on the window. I'm not going to leave until you come out here and talk to me. Radio silence. Somewhere inside, a door slammed shut, followed by extensive cursing. Suddenly, the stench of something burning stung his nose. What the devil was going on? Was she in trouble? Worry niggled at his gut, replacing the irritation that had been simmering there. Desperation seeping in, Carter slid his hand along the top of her doorframe and brushed aside her hide key He took the key, shoved it into the lock, and pushed open the door. Faith! Damn it! She hollered. Smoke billowed out of the kitchen. The fire alarm went off, blaring at an inconceivable ear-piercing level. Get the broom! Fan the alarm! Are you trying to burn down the damn house? She waved potholders frantically over a burned pan spewing smoke. The broom! He did as he was told, running to the closet and yanking out a broom. By the time he got back to the kitchen, she was hauling ass out the front door and into the rain, the smoking pan outstretched in her shaking hands. Humperdinck yelped and chased Carter down, a wild, horny look in his eye. Smoke clung to the ceiling and somehow seemed to hover near the ringing alarm. He swished the broom in front of it, driving away the smoke. When the alarm was finally silenced, Faith re-entered the living room, minus the burned dessert, huffing and puffing. She was soaked from a few seconds of being in the rain, her WSU sweater clinging to her chest. What were you trying to do? He asked, continuing to swing the broom over his head. The tuxedo coat was tight over his arms, making the motion difficult. Torch the place? I was baking. She brushed by him as she stormed into the kitchen and turned off the stove. I was pissed off as hell and wanting to blow off steam. I've heard baking relaxes people. What people? You know, people. I've never heard that, he said, watching the last traces of smoke dissipate. What were you baking? Fiery chocolate lava cake. He laughed and set the broom against the wall. At least you got the fiery part right. She chucked a potholder at him. It hit him square in the chest and then fell to the floor, nearly missing Humperdinck. Wait, how'd you get in here? She asked, hands on her hips. I used your secret key. I've seriously got to move that. She blew wet strands of hair out of her face. Now that you've got a fire show, why don't you show yourself the door? 
don't be like that. He strode into the kitchen. She backed against the stove. How'd you get back here without being seen? She planted her hands on her hips. I ran for about a mile and then called Seattle Canine Cab Company. They had a car in the area, so I didn't have to wait long. Seattle Canine Cab Company was a free taxi company paid for by the Wolf Pack to assist wolves who shifted at inopportune moments. They carried clothes in the trunk, most sizes, stuffed in huge pieces of luggage, and dropped shifters anywhere in Seattle. Their alpha had always been dedicated to keeping wolves out of society, so as not to spook non-shifters. Their private cab company was one way he accomplished that successfully. Even though Carter felt better knowing that she'd gotten home safely, with help from the pack, he couldn't get over one thing. Why'd you leave the way you did? Carter asked. You really freaked everyone out. She swallowed hard and glared at him with a look of utter defiance. The girl who went with you to the party isn't me. I can't be that person. What are you talking about? I went with you. No, you went with a glamorized version of me. She tugged at her sweater and swiped her hand down her jeans. This is me. Sweater, jeans, fuzzy slipper socks. The girl in the fancy dress with the heels and makeup is fake. I can't be like that floozy Paisley Brooks. Was she jealous? You left because of Paisley? No, she groaned and threw another potholder at him. I left because of who I am and who I will not be for a man. I don't care how much you're offering. Whoever you were tonight, the council loved it. They loved you. She scoffed. What makes you think that? Oh, right. You mean from the way they started chasing after me when I shifted. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, that might have been a clue. That was precautionary. To make sure you weren't going to do anything stupid. They like you, but trusting you will take longer. Carter took off his tux coat, draped it over one of the dining room chairs, and loosened his tie. Mrs. Owens personally invited us to a couple's retreat in Victoria on Vancouver Island next weekend. Nate and Paisley were invited too, but they can't do it on account of their wedding. It'll be a perfect time to get their attention trained on us. On me. Oh, that's nice of her, she said, resting her hands on the counter behind her. But count me out. I can't be the person I was tonight. I was awkward and... Didn't you hear me? You were a hit. It wasn't because of your dress or your heels. It was because they genuinely liked you. I told you to be yourself, and that was the only way this was going to work. His feet moved forward as if of their own accord. This close to her, he could pick up the subtle mixture of sugar and rain on her skin. You can't back out on me now. We're in. We're in. She spoke the words as if she was in some kind of daze. That's swell, Carter. Should I wear Gucci or Prada next weekend? Should I bring flats in case I trip over something again? Or a backup dress in case I tear the first like I did tonight? He looked down at her, seeing a different woman than was on his arm tonight. She was confident earlier, and that self-assurance was sexy. Now she was back in her sweats, with her hair pulled in front of her shoulders, looking physically comfortable, and yet completely uncertain. She'd transformed back to the faith he knew before, the woman he enjoyed spending time with. Her big brown eyes bore into him, and something in his stomach twisted. Wait a second. That tight, nodding feeling hadn't been there yesterday. I don't care if you wear these sweats when you meet them again, he said, or if you show up with no makeup and a torn and tattered dress. What matters is that you and I are in this together. Together. She blinked up at him, and when she spoke, her voice was faint. Remember when I said I don't like being made to look like a fool? Nate said you and Paisley are still close. Is that true? So this is about Paisley. He was so confused. Why would Faith waste two seconds thinking about Paisley? 
a woman who meant nothing to him. Is it true? She asked again. Paisley's got serious Hollywood syndrome and has to have all eyes on her all the time. I finally realized I couldn't trust her. I bolted. I guess she's pissed to be the person dumped instead of the one doing the dumping. Faith's breathing rhythm changed, slowed. The tension in her shoulders seemed to ease. He didn't make it sound that way. When did you talk to Nate alone? On the pier when I was waiting for you. He saw me leave to get you a drink. I'm assuming so. Conniving bastard. What did you tell him? That we're very happy in a secure and loving relationship. She nudged him away with her forearm. I painted the picture you asked me to. Something about the whole scenario rubbed Carter wrong. Had Nate been trying to figure out if their relationship was a hoax? Or had he been using the opportunity alone to flirt with Carter's fiance? Friend, he corrected. So, are you in? he asked. Will you come to the retreat next weekend? She sighed and glared at him with narrowed eyes. I'm packing my sweats. That's fine. All I ever wanted was for you to be you. I never intended for you to pretend you were somebody else. Nobody could keep that up. He flicked a bag of sugar sitting on the counter. Just promise to leave your baking supplies behind on the trip. Wouldn't want you burning down our hotel room. Wait. She swiped her hand across her forehead, leaving behind a smudge of flour. Our room? As in, one? We are engaged, Faith. He picked up the bag of flour and pretended to roll it closed as he turned his back to her. Don't you think it'd look strange if we told Mrs. Owens that we'd like her to reserve us two separate rooms? Yes, but... We've fallen asleep together on the couch a few times. We should just think of next weekend as an extended Friday night. Fine, she said from behind him. But I call the bed. We'll see about that. He reached into the bag and sank his fingers into the flower. He grabbed a handful and spun around. Surrender the bed and I won't give you a flower shower. If you think I'm afraid, you're sorely mistaken. I bet you throw like a girl. Digging her hand into the sugar bag, Faith pulled out a handful of her own grainy ammo. She faced him, holding the sugar behind her back. I'm not giving you the bed. You can have the couch or the floor, or sleep in the bathtub for all I care. The bathtub? Carter chuckled low and deep. The porcelain would be fucking cold. The bed is mine. Fine, she cocked back. But you're going to have to fight me for it. Faith flinched. Carter didn't bite. She cocked back farther. Humperdinck skidded around the corner and slid over the kitchen tile. He hopped between them excitedly, his sickeningly cute gaze bouncing back and forth between them. Using the pup as a distraction, Faith let the sugar fly. Carter ducked below the sugar cloud and ran at her, tangling her arms behind her back. He pinned her against the oven, using his body for pressure. Laughing hysterically, Faith squirmed, elbowing him in the gut. Let go, she said, the laughter lingering in her voice. Surrender the bed. He held her hands in front of her, shackled by one of his own. With his free hand, he dusted her cheek with flour, covering it with a shadow of white. It's easy to say, Carter, the bed is yours. Try it. She nudged her chin at him, smiling. You think a little flour on my cheek is going to make me buckle? You should have stuck with the flour shower. It even rhymes. All right, you asked for it, you stubborn woman. He held his hand over her and sprinkled flour over her head. All you've got to do is say the words. Just give me the bed and this will all be over. Never surrender. As she shook her head, giggling into a fit, a clump of flour fell from her hair onto her eyelashes. Wait, close your eyes, he said, and reached up to brush off the flour. She hesitated, her now white eyelashes resting feather softly on her cheek. Almost done. 
He gently swiped away the last of it, and then paused, his gaze trailing to her smiling lips. You almost got a ton of it in your eyes. Her smile fell as her eyes fluttered open, and she caught his gaze on her lips. That would have stung, he said. He was still holding onto her wrist. Why couldn't he let go? Why didn't he want to? The bed is yours, she said, and twisted out of his hold. Chapter 10 Just before four o'clock, when the mist rolled in to take over the city, Carter exited Starbucks, a steaming cup of house blend in hand. He slid into his Tahoe, then double-checked his cell before starting up the engine. Still no calls from Faith. He hadn't talked to her in days. It seemed strange, even though they'd gone through the week without talking before. He couldn't stop thinking about her. Why couldn't he stop thinking about her? She consumed his thoughts. The way she'd looked in that green dress on Sunday night. The way it accented a figure he didn't realize she had. The way she'd looked in wolf form, lethal yet graceful. The sound of her laughter, light and bubbly, still filled his ears. The radio on his dash chirped, reminding him that he was on duty tonight. Suspicious subject harassing citizens in Seward Park. Call a report seeing a wolf man. Dispatch for the wolf pack rattled. Enforcer Griffin and Enforcer Ramsey on call. Reroute to that location and capture subject before Seattle PD arrives. Shit. There was a werewolf loose in the park. Carter had to find him and bring him in before any other non-shifter spotted him. And then he had to convince the witness that what he or she saw was a giant dog. 10-4. Carter floored his Tahoe as he merged onto I-5 toward Bailey Peninsula. En route. Seward Park was a 300-acre forest in the center of Seattle. Hiking trails, fish hatcheries, and lakefront beach access attracted loads of visitors each year. It wasn't uncommon after the full moon for a werewolf to go berserk and try to find solace in the forest. Carter turned off the freeway and entered the park just before nightfall. There were a few cars in the first parking lot, but no one walking around. Rolling down his windows and turning off the radio, Carter patrolled around the park slowly, picking up all kinds of scents. None of them sent off the red flag of a werewolf. He passed a few non-shifters in hiking gear who nodded and continued walking by. If they'd seen a werewolf, they would have been running out of the park, not taking a leisurely sunset stroll. As he reached the end of the peninsula, a howl split the night. Swerving off the road, Carter put the Tahoe in park and hopped out. Softwoods and Douglas firs towered over him, creating hundreds of hiding spots for a werewolf lunatic to hide. He charged through the brush, but there was nothing to follow. No other sounds, no smells out of the ordinary for a forest filled with woodland creatures. Come on, howl again, he breathed, checking the taser on his waistband. He was armed, but if he couldn't find the wolf, he wouldn't get the chance to use the weapon. A black Tahoe matching his own pulled behind him. Nate hopped out. Seattle PD will be here in ten, he spat, charging around the hood. We've got no time. One option, Carter said, scanning through the trees. I'm shifting. Don't. Nate stormed through the brush, searching the canopies above their heads. If someone sees you or Seattle PD arrives, they'll think you're the threat and I'll have to ditch out. Not to mention the captain will have your ass in a sling. I know. But if this guy's crazy, we can't exactly leave him in the hands of the police. Our hands are tied. Yours might be, but mine aren't, Carter said, feeling tendrils of white-hot energy pulsing through his veins. Shifting is the fastest way to search him out. If he's a member of our pack, I'll be able to hear his thoughts. I'll find him that way. Nate grumbled something about being a loose cannon, but didn't continue arguing. Carter high-stepped over a log as the urge to shift sparked through him. He let the energy swirling inside him ball into a pit in his stomach. He closed his eyes, muscles hardening into anticipatory knots, and let the sensations surge freely through him. He shifted, 
fell to his hands and knees. As his entire body shuddered, coarse fur covered his skin in a blanket of black. His muscles bulked up, stretched to fill his massive wolf form. Tendons pulled and snapped into shape. As a wolf, he was robust and muscular, the top of his back nearly reaching Nate's shoulders. Go get him, Nate said, smacking Carter in the backside. I'll keep a lookout. Carter snapped at Nate's hand, and Nate snatched it back. Carter took off into the forest, his strides eating up the ground. He could sense things easier in this form. Every color was more vibrant, every sound more crisp. The energy of the moon flowed through him, empowering his every stride. He hadn't run more than a few minutes before he sensed another wolf in the vicinity. Leave me alone, enforcer, a scratchy voice said through the pack's process of mind speak. I mean you no harm. Carter spun around a fur and headed west toward the main road. Branches brushed his side and threatened to tangle in his fur. With a single row of trees separating him from the road, Carter stopped. He was close. You may not intend to harm anyone, Carter projected to the wolf, but you've made yourself known to a non-shifter, breaking one of our cardinal laws. Why don't you come back to the office with me before you get yourself in more trouble? Seattle PD sirens blared in the distance. And make it quick, he added. The wolf emerged from behind a tree. Scruffy brown fur covered a wolf that was no larger than a bull mastiff. Carter could easily talk to the witness and convince him or her that the creature in the park was a dog. They might make it out of this cleaner than he'd originally thought possible. A car passed behind the wolf, drawing his attention around. Carter stole the opportunity, leaping into the air, smacking into the wolf full force. Growling from deep within his belly, Carter pinned the wolf to the ground. But the wolf was squirrely, slipping one of his legs free. Carter ground his back legs into the wolf's belly, but it didn't seem to phase him. He slunk forward, upward, slowly releasing himself from Carter's hold. No way you're getting away from me, Carter forced out. A pair of park visitors strode across the street, headed right for them. Sirens blared, closing in. In the distance, tires peeled against asphalt. Carter adjusted his grip on the wolf, but the split-second shift in position gave the wolf what he needed to scramble free. He bolted toward the street, his paws striking hard and fast, and headed for the road. No, Carter hollered through his mind. Stop! The wolf charged forward. A few more steps and he'd out himself to a couple of unsuspecting humans. Carter did the only thing he could. He dived, stretched out like he was laying out for a pop fly and clawed at the wolf's tail. He caught fur and dug in deep. With a strangled cry, the wolf pounced through the last line of trees and ripped his tail free. Carter landed behind him with a heavy thump, his momentum slinging him in plain sight. The couple shrieked, cowering. Glancing back to see if Carter had followed him, the wolf didn't see as Nate's Tahoe pulled up to the curb. The wolf ran squarely into the side of the SUV, then dropped to the ground like a stone. Nate hauled ass out of the driver's side door and tased the twitching mountain of fur. Time stood still. Staring open-mouthed, the couple sized Carter up, from his furry muzzle to his larger-than-life back haunches. They were committing the sight to memory, no doubt. Nate stood, his shocked gaze flipping between Carter and the couple. Get in the back, Nate mumbled, dragging the tased wolf toward the back of the SUV. As he popped the rear hatch, Carter hopped in, and then watched Nate heave the wolf in after him. After rolling into the back seat, Carter shifted back to human form, and then dressed in an extra pair of clothes Nate had stashed in a gym bag and back. Nate handled the couple in the way the Bureau had taught them. He smiled and talked with his hands. They nodded, stared, nodded some more, looking thoroughly confused. At least the SUV's windows were completely tinted. Nate took a notepad out of his back pocket and jotted down things as they spoke. He handed them his business card and turned back to the Tahoe, looking like one hell of a pissed-off enforcer.
Seattle PD's lights could barely be seen blinking through the forest across the way. They'd arrived on the wrong side of the park. Hopefully, everyone would be long gone by the time they made it around. The lunatic, still in wolf form, twitched on the floorboard, the volts from the taser still singing through him. Realizing the wolf was in the back seat uncuffed, Carter popped open Nate's arresting kit that lay beside him and snapped the cuffs on him. A few seconds later, Nate slid into the Tahoe and glanced back. You've lost it. You've seriously lost it. Do you know what the captain's gonna say when he hears that you outed yourself to some hikers in the park? They took off onto the freeway and didn't look back. We got him, didn't we? Carter said. What did you tell the couple back there? Protocol bullshit? No. I told them you two escaped from the Woodland Park Zoo. I'm taking you back to your cage as we speak. He laughed. I don't think they bought it at first, but I'm one hell of an actor. He'd have to remember that. Does that zoo even have wolves? Carter asked. Hell if I know. Thirty minutes later, Nate took the exit for Carter's home, gunning the Tahoe around a sharp turn. Thankfully, the nutty werewolf had remained zonked out after being tased. Specialized tasers built for the wolf pack to take out rogue wolves meant the extreme volts were enough to bring down a wolf and keep him knocked out for hours. I'm going to call them up later tonight and do damage control, Nate said. Get some information on the zoo. I'll also look up the first witness and tell them the same story so it matches up. There had to be something more to do. It'd probably be a good idea to arrange a wolf transfer to the zoo this year, just to cover our tracks. Nate craned his neck around. You are good. Call City Toe for my Tahoe, would you? Carter said as they pulled in front of his cabin. PD will probably have towed it by now. I need it back by tomorrow morning. Nate nodded. I'll put someone at the office on it. Thanks for having my back, Ramsey. No problem. Something flickered across Nate's expression before he smiled. What was I supposed to do? Leave you hanging? Without giving Carter a chance to respond, he peeled out of the driveway, kicking up gravel as he went. Faith curled into the corner of her couch and started up her computer. She'd just gotten off the phone with Carter, and he said he wanted to come by to grab a beer. Neighbors were supposed to borrow a cup of milk or sugar, but she really wanted to see him, so she didn't mind. She would have driven to the store to buy every beer in stock if it meant Carter would stop by. He'd said he'd had a bad day at work. The worst, he'd said, but wouldn't go into detail over the phone. She couldn't help but feel like his stopping by was a sign that their relationship was moving in the right direction. He'd stopped by unannounced before, and they'd even talked over beers on the front porch a few times. But never, not once, had he wanted to come by because he'd had a bad day. Because he wanted to talk it over with her. She wanted to be the person he came to when things got rough. When he needed to confide in someone or open up about his past. She wanted to be that woman for him so badly it hurt. Maybe today would be the start. As her dog blog queued up, she searched through the traffic stats. Fifty comments? She scanned over a few questions from her last post. Wow, more than yesterday. She read, I have a chihuahua with little dog syndrome. He won't quit picking on our Dalmatian. I can't keep them apart all the time. What should I do? Have a little faith's answer. Watch the behavior carefully. What we might be quick to consider bullying behavior might simply be two dogs playing with each other. What is the Dalmatian's response to the little guy? Do they nip and growl, or are they attacking each other and biting with force? Those answers will go a long way in determining if your dog's behavior is something that needs to be addressed or looked over. How do you get your dog to stop chewing dryer sheets? Have a little faith's answer. Keep the dryer sheets off the floor. Get a trash can with a lid and buy your dog some fresh-smelling chew toys. Faith kicked her feet up on the couch and checked her email. She'd just heard back from her website designer. 
The layout he'd made featuring dogs and footprints with easy access to all of her posts and tags was beautiful. Better than she'd anticipated. Traffic on the blog had escalated in the last few months, but this new look was going to catapult it out of the doggy blogosphere. At this point, she was making about $30 a month off the widgets on the sidebar, where she featured top-selling dog toys and treats. She bought her favorite items in bulk off eBay, repacked them, and sold them via Amazon. All of the items were Have a Little Faith endorsed. Pretty brilliant, if she did say so herself. The front door swung open and Carter walked inside, making a beeline for the refrigerator. Even as a blur of movement, he was assertive, his strides sure and even. Honey, I'm home, he joked, popping the top on a beer. What's cooking? Her heart fluttered, although she knew he was joking. How different would her life be with Carter in it? She could try to have a hot meal for him when he walked in the door from work. He could talk to her about his bad day. And then they'd make love in front of the wood stove and all would be right in the world. Did you not see the dead cake pan on the front porch? She said, jarring back to reality. They weren't a real couple, and they weren't any closer to making love than she was to being a gourmet chef. It's still there for other cooking pots and pans to witness. Wouldn't want them getting any crazy ideas. I had Chinese. There are leftovers on the top shelf and back. Swell. He came out of the kitchen with a beer and white to-go box with a top peeled back, chopsticks sticking out. His dark wash jeans were slung low on his waist and his black t-shirt bunched over his shoulders, hanging loosely at his sides. What are you doing? Fighting the urge to check him out for the hundredth time, Faith scrolled to the top of her new site. Her cheeks flushed hot as she remembered how he'd almost kissed her during their food fight. But she'd panicked, as she always did. Besides, she could have read something into that interaction that hadn't actually been there. What if that hadn't been an almost kiss? Have a little faith, just got a remodel. She spun the computer around to show him. What do you think? Gawking, Carter sank into the couch cushions beside her. That's your blog? I mean, that's you? Pretty sweet, right? I've been working really hard on it. Looks like it. He stared at the site as he chomped down Lomaine then cast his gaze at her, his eyes a mesmerizing shade of sky blue. What kind of stuff do you talk about? Everything dog-related, from toys, treats, exercises, and training techniques, to humane animal shelters located by area and map. She snapped the laptop shut and placed it on the coffee table. I'm building an audience fairly quickly. I've already got 800 followers. It takes me at least an hour every night to answer questions posed at the end of my posts. Humperdinck flew around the corner from the direction of the bedrooms in a flash of black and white. He headed for Carter's ankle, but when Carter snapped his fingers, the pooch stopped and turned toward the kitchen. What's the point of the blog? Carter asked, but when she glared at him, he retracted. I mean, what's your goal? Is this for fun, or are you looking to make money at it? Both, maybe. She paused, thinking over the possibilities. Why not both? Why couldn't they have both? The friendship with the relationship. Love with sex. Why did everything have to be either or, black or white, one or the other? I wouldn't know. He downed the noodles, then leaned back into the cushions, swiping the back of his hand over his forehead. Aren't you going to ask your future husband how shitty work went today? Oh, I'm sorry, honey, she crooned, swiveling toward him. How was work, my hard-working, dedicated, enforcing fiancé? His smile fell. Two people saw me today. Make that three, she grinned. I see you too. Hardy har. I meant two non-shifters saw me in all my furry glory. That's not good. She ran her fingers through her hair, scrubbing her scalp as she went. This wasn't going to fly at all. 
especially because he was an enforcer, they were held to a stricter standard than the rest. Have you met with your captain yet? He shook his head, looking paler than he had minutes ago. Nate was there and cleaned up everything as best he could. I'm sure he told the captain the second he dropped me off at home. I wouldn't be surprised if I were called in first thing tomorrow. She tucked her feet beneath her. Maybe you're not giving Nate enough credit. He knows the kind of pressure you guys are under to close cases and bring rogue wolves in. I'm sure if you shifted in front of humans, it was because you didn't have another option. He shrugged. It was a reckless move. I should have played it safe. Do you really think Nate would rat you out? Faith, he's up for the detective position, too. This is the perfect opportunity to throw me under the bus and take the job for himself. Is that what you would do to him? Yes. No. He cracked his knuckles. Hell, I don't know. If the captain did find out, it'd probably put you two on a level playing field. Carter squinted at her. How do you figure? Since Nate's not going to make it to the trip this weekend, you're going to have the chance to get closer to the hiring members in the Bureau. Nate will be missing out on dinners and meetings. You don't think he'd be there if he could? You're right. Put that in writing, would you? She beamed, her heart doing a little dance. You may have outed yourself, but you'll have opportunities to network this weekend that Nate doesn't have. The way I see it, you'd be even Stephen. He seemed to chew over her words, and when he looked at her again, his eyes shone with something she'd never seen before. It almost seemed like adoration. Certainly a far cry from the look he'd given her all the other nights when he'd crashed on her couch or stolen a few beers from the fridge. You're one smart cookie, he said, with a wink and a smile. And then he walked out the door, taking her heart with him. Chapter 11 After a two-and-a-half-hour drive from Seattle to Port Angeles, Carter and Faith boarded the ferry to take them to Victoria on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. It rained most of the trip, but when the weather finally lightened up, they strode out to the bow of the Princess Clipper. So, what happened with your captain? Faith asked Carter as they stared out over the Olympic Peninsula, the sound of the waves gently slapping against the side of the ferry. Did you get written up, or a slap on the wrist, or whatever? After I left your place Wednesday, I went straight to the captain. I beat Nate to the punch, Carter said. The captain respected the fact that I came to him first. Nate showed up an hour later, ready to spill everything. You should have seen the look on his face when he found out I copped to it. He looked like a two-year-old who got his lollipop stolen. A frigid gust of wind blasted into them as the ship cut through the water. Faith huddled into her peacoat and shoved her hands into the pockets. That was quick thinking, she said. Thanks to you. You're the one who sparked the idea. He turned to her and she lost her breath. He held her gaze for a moment too long, and those darn butterflies fluttered through her stomach again. She shifted her attention to the dark blue waters of the strait. What's the plan for tonight? she asked, veering into comfortable territory. It was Friday, their good old date-yet-not night. Do you think the hotel has pay-per-view? Pay-per-view? His eyebrows pitched. You feeling kinky? Simply thinking about getting kinky with Carter made her thighs quiver and made her want to jump him. She smacked him instead. No, I'm talking about new releases. You know, ones that haven't come out in the theater yet. I'm not sure what's going on with the council tonight, he said. I think we're on our own. Goosebumps covered her arms, and they weren't rearing their pokey heads because of the cold. On our own. Nothing sounded sweeter. I got a text from Simon, an enforcer who used to be my sergeant before he transferred to Auburn, a city outside of Seattle. He was Nate's sergeant for a while, too, from what I understand. His tone was all business and no fun. 
He wants me to talk to him about something as soon as we check in. The ship entered Inner Harbor, slowing to a gentle stop. Where are we staying? Faith asked, watching a few workers throw the moor lines onto the dock. There. He pointed off the port side to a castle towering majestically above the harbor. The Mistress Monarch. Faith gawked at the intricate brickwork, the moss crawling up the towers and their sparkling harbor steps outside the regal front doors. It's breathtaking. Only the best for the council, apparently. Carter nudged her arm with his shoulder. Come on, let's go. Once they were checked in and Faith had said, Oh my God, look at that! More times than she had in her entire life, the bellhop took their bags to their room, leaving them standing in the lobby. Marble columns seemed to sprout out of the glossy tile floor. Gold-framed paintings came to life on the walls. Workers grinned, offering service. The hotel was more like a palace than a hotel, and certainly the fanciest place Faith had ever been. Carter, someone called from behind them. Simon Richards, he said, shaking the balding man's hand. Great to see you again. Wish I could say the same. The man's cold gaze raked over Faith, from her converse to her jeans, peacoat, and ponytail. I hear you're getting married soon. Cotter seemed to stiffen. I am, sir. This is Faith, my fiancé. She's not really your fiancé, he interjected. Faith feigned shock, but didn't peek at Carter for fear she'd give them away. I don't know what you're talking about, Carter said after a tension-filled pause. Carter's fingers interlaced with hers, a warm, loving gesture, but his skin was as cold as ice. Nate Ramsey seems to think otherwise, Simon said. He told me that you and Faith haven't been serious until recently, and the only reason you're telling the captain you're getting married is because you think it'll give you a leg up against him. That's ridiculous. Carter squeezed her hand. We're madly in love. Madly, she agreed. She rose up on tiptoe and kissed him on the cheek. His skin was cool, with a shadow of stubble that grazed against her lips. I don't know why anyone would question this. Simon eyed them curiously. You don't have to worry about convincing me. It's the captain and the rest of the bureau. Nate has already alerted them to his suspicions as well. Damn it. Carter shifted his stance. Why would he do something like that? Beating you to the punch, dear, Faith said. Carter nodded, clearly catching her drift. Since Nate didn't get to squeal to the captain about Carter shifting in the park, he thought he'd try another route to climb to the top. But how did he know their engagement was phony? Thanks for the heads up. Carter took Simon's hand and shook. Will I be seeing you soon? That depends. Will you be going on the adventure tour tomorrow morning? Adventure tour? Every retreat, we start with some kind of adventure, to get our blood pumping. This year, the captain is keeping it a surprise, but we're meeting out front at dawn. The itinerary should be in your room. He smacked Carter on the shoulder. You both should come. They're always a riot. We will, Faith interrupted, forcing a wide grin. See you at dawn. They didn't travel to Victoria to sit in the hotel, although from the looks of the place, she wouldn't mind living and dying here. They were going to capitalize on every moment they could, talk to as many members of the council, as many sergeants and lieutenants and high-ranking officials they could find. If they were going on an adventure tour, she and Carter would too. Simple as that. Great, Simon said, trudging toward the elevators. Watch your back, Carter. There are people taking aim when you're not watching. Thanks, sir. And Carter... If you're serious about this lucky lady being your bride, I suggest you do something soon to prove it. Carter nodded. Will do. Simon laughed, leaving them standing alone in the lobby. Something to prove it, 
Carter mumbled, raking his hands through his hair. You've got a damn ring, and we're here as a couple. What more does he want? It's not like we can get married here and now. Stress lines burrowed into his forehead as he frowned. Faith hated seeing him this way. If only there were something she could do to make his stress disappear. Excuse me, a tiny voice said from behind them. They spun around. A woman no taller than five foot even peeked over the counter. She was dressed in a white and green suit, her golden hair pulled back into a bun. She looked like hotel service Tinkerbell. You can get married here. She smiled, her petite shoulders rising to her ears. We have an elopement package at the Monarch. For $2,000, you get an upgraded bridal suite with champagne and chocolate in the room and breakfast in bed the following morning. Sounded hasty and a bit ridiculous. But doing those things with Carter? Hand over the wedding contract with the hotel and it was as good as signed. $2,000? Carter looked paler than he had before. Highway robbery. Faith chuckled. Yeah, but it's robbery with chocolate. She couldn't imagine dropping $2,000 on a last-minute wedding, but that was probably because she'd been saving every penny earned from her dog blog to give to Dawson. Her blog hadn't yet earned two grand, but soon, hopefully. If you want to book the package for tonight, Tinkerbell continued, I can arrange it. We have a balcony on the fourth floor open with a stunning view of Inner Harbor. Tonight? Tension whirled through the space between them. As Tinkerbell spouted more details, the situation became insanely clear. They could actually do this. Would she want to? Would he want to? This wasn't a fairy tale anymore. This was reality. Carter went palms down on the reservations desk and lowered his head. I can't believe we're going to do this. She couldn't either. She was seriously about to marry the man of her dreams. Her stomach tumbled at the thought. A squeaky, whiny voice warned her not to get too excited. But she shut that voice up before it said something incredibly rude. There was only one solution to Carter's problem. Though it was far from simple, it was exactly what she wanted. Is it too late to have invitations printed up and delivered to a few guests staying in the hotel? Faith asked. No, ma'am. Head bowed, Carter breathed hard, in and out, in and out. Carter, sweetie? Faith knelt and looked up at him. His head was low, hanging between his outstretched arms. The blood was rushing to his face, making his cheeks fire engine red. How bad do you want the job? His light eyes burned with tenacity. I've never wanted anything more. What would that kind of determination feel like if it was directed at her? Just once, she'd like to experience that kind of passion. To know what it felt like to be desired and chased and wanted with that kind of fierceness. Then let's do this, Faith said. What better way to prove to the captain that Nate was full of shit than to get married here and now with a few members of the Bureau watching? His breathing slowed and he raised his head. You're right, he said slowly. You're always right. You better stop saying that. She slipped his wallet from his back pocket, took out his visa, and then dropped it on the counter in front of Tinkerbell. Or it's going to go straight to my head. As Tinkerbell ran Carter's card, that squeaky, whiny voice piped up again. It whispered something about her feelings for Carter spreading from her head to her heart and beyond. This time, she couldn't tell the voice to quiet. Deep down, she knew it spoke the truth. Her feelings for Carter had rooted deeper than friendship. She wanted him every way a woman could want a man, and she wanted him for always. Chapter 12 By early evening, wedding invitations had gone out to the captain's room. Carter was too busy pacing through the lobby mumbling to himself to ask whether or not he'd responded. 
He parted ways with Faith after he'd put down the chunk of change for the elopement package. All along, the plan had been to get married. But now that he was standing here, minutes away from getting hitched again, his feet were cold as ice. His first marriage had been a bust. He'd found his luminary. He'd gotten stronger because of it, and his lifespan had lengthened to a thousand years. But just because he'd found the person fate wanted him to be with didn't mean that they wouldn't fight, because they had. And it didn't mean that his luminary would be physically satisfied with him, because she hadn't been. She'd argued to the end that physical intimacy was different and completely separate from spiritual intimacy. She'd cheated, more times than he cared to remember. This time he wouldn't get emotionally attached. He wouldn't feel anything. He'd close off, be married for a few short months, and make a clean break. Carter? Faith said from behind him. He turned. Don't laugh. She stood in the center of the lobby, her hands on her hips. It was all I could find. She wore thick white tights, white snow boots with a rim of brown fur, and a puffy white parka. Her dark hair was drawn over her shoulders, as she always wore it, and a light sheen of pink lip gloss coated her lips. She was a snow bunny, ready to kick back in a ski lodge and huddle by the fire with a warm drink. She wasn't what he was expecting, not by a long shot, but Faith never was. She always managed to surprise him, to take him off guard. Where was the flowing white dress, the veil that hid her teary eyes, the bouquet of flowers? It was going to be easy pretending that this wedding was a sham. No emotional attachment. He coughed out a laugh. At least it's white. I look like the abominable snowman. She charged up and smacked him in the shoulder as if he was the one who'd said it. I searched every store within a five-block radius. Do you know how hard it is to find a white dress in the middle of winter? Let me tell you, it's impossible. This was all I could find. Someone needs to design a blog the way I did, but for weddings. You know, with links to great dresses and flowers and things for local shoppers. All in one place. Really was a great idea. The girl had brains and beauty. You should do it then. Dog trainer and wedding planner extraordinaire. You could merge the blogs into one and call it matrimonial mutts. He grinned when she smacked him again, then flinched against her attack. For her effort. I think you look great. Snowy, but great. Shut it. But she smiled and her entire face lit up. Where'd you find the suit? I brought it. He smoothed down his black slacks and double-checked that the white handkerchief was still poking out of the front breast pocket. I was under the impression there were going to be some bureau meetings. Good call. Where is everyone? She glanced around the lobby. Have you heard from the captain? No, but I think it's about time we head up. He checked the time. It was nearly six o'clock, which meant they had a few minutes to get to the room reserved for their wedding. Ready? She sighed. Consider me your snow woman, ready for escort. They didn't talk on the elevator ride up. The air seemed clouded with tension, which was so unlike them. When the doors peeled open, Faith gasped and grabbed his arm, sending jolts of electricity shooting to his shoulder and down into his chest. The captain and five high-ranking officials craned around to stare at them as they stepped out. Thank you for coming on such short notice, Carter said, touching Faith's hand, which still gripped his arm. Her skin was warm and much softer than he thought it'd be. We're happy you could be here. Are you kidding? Captain Rich said, extending his arms wide. One of our enforcers is getting married today. We wouldn't miss it. Smiling tightly, the other officials turned and made their way onto the wide-sweeping balcony outside a set of glass double doors. Although the rain had let up, the wind didn't get the same memo. It blew fiercely over the balcony, and as Carter led Faith outside, he staggered back from the force. 
A balding minister waited at the balcony's ledge, his silky black robe swirling and tangling around his legs. Holy son of a preacher, man, this is really happening. Now or never. If he jumped off the ledge, would he live? Carter? Faith said, shaking his arm. The minister asked if you're ready. Oh, yes. He shook his head as an icy gust of wind whipped around the edge of the building, leveling into him. Which ledge had he been thinking about again? Of course I am. We are. The captain and the other officials stood back against the windows, waiting, watching with suspicious looks marring their faces. Simon had been right. Nate must have told the members of the Bureau about his doubts. As Faith took her place on one side of the pastor, Carter faced her. She was cute in her snow gear, puffy and warm. She was closer to a fluffy rabbit than the abominable snowman. She tried to cover her scar, but with the wind thrashing around them like this, her hair wouldn't stay put. The fading purple line started at her left ear and traveled down her neck, disappearing into the obnoxious fur lining her collar. But obnoxious had suddenly morphed into... adorable. He bit back a laugh as the minister droned on about what marriage means and how to keep love alive. At the mention of the L word, his hands got clammy. He swiped them on his pants and focused on Faith on her chestnut hair swirling around her face, on her button nose and heart-shaped lips. She was giving all of this up for him, he realized, as the minister babbled on. She'd wanted a real marriage filled with love and laughter. She'd wanted a forever bond. Guilt nailed him in the gut. He'd already found his mate. He couldn't give that to her. Do you, Carter Griff Griffin, the minister went on, take Faith Alroy Hamilton to be your wife? Alroy, Carter whispered, suppressing a laugh. Griff Griffin? She fired back, voice low. Touché. He couldn't take his eyes off her mouth and that beaming smile. And I do. The minister turned to Faith. Do you, Faith Alroy Hamilton, take Carter Griff Griffin to be your husband? His breath caught as doubt filled the space in his chest. She cocked a brow. I do. By the power vested in me, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Let no man separate what God has brought together. The minister spread his arms between them as the captain and officials clapped wildly behind them. You may now kiss your bride. Carter's stomach dropped to his knees. He'd completely forgotten about the kiss. This was not going to go well. Sure, Faith's lips looked soft and plush. But there'd be nothing behind it. Nothing to make his cock rock a doodle do. Would the council be able to tell that there was no spark? Would they see through this? Faith took a step closer, eliminating the space between them. Her body radiated warmth even through the ginormous layers of down. Snaking an arm around her waist, Carter slowly drew her against him. He caught her gaze and held it as he lowered his mouth over hers. She sucked in a sharp breath of air. He caught her mouth as her lips parted. Fireworks. Her mouth was supple and yielding, luxuriously sweet. She moved against him as if she'd kissed him a thousand times before and knew exactly what he liked. He should have pulled back, but against his better judgment, his hold tightened. As he squeezed the arm behind her back and bent her into him, she gave a little whimper from the back of her throat that made his stomach wrench. He nearly growled as he stamped another, hotter kiss on her lips. He nudged her lips apart. The world crashed down around him. With the force of a gust of wind, Carter remembered where he was, who was watching, what had just happened, and whom he was kissing. He pulled back so quickly his knees nearly buckled. Faith looked shocked. 
scared and pale, her lips a kiss-smudged shade of pink. He touched two fingers to his lips. They were still buzzing, burning from the memory of her mouth. That kiss, it changed everything. He'd liked it, really fucking liked it. So much so that if there weren't multiple sets of eyes trained on them, he just might have slammed sweet Faith Hamilton against the wall and kissed her until he blew her snow boots off. Chapter 13 They'd kissed. More than that, they'd kissed as husband and wife. And it was better than Faith could have imagined. She could still taste Carter. His mouth had been warm and gentle as his lips brushed hers. But the kiss burned deep, tingling her legs with white-hot currents of electricity. Had he felt it too? All the way to their room, Faith had wondered what the elopement package honeymoon suite would look like. Turned out, they got a bed fit for a mammoth, a jacuzzi bathtub, a bottle of British Columbia bubbly, and views of Victoria and Inner Harbor that stole Faith's breath away. It'd be awfully romantic if she and Carter were a couple who were actually in love. When this was over, she could find the love of her life and they could come back here for their honeymoon. A real one. Or maybe she and Carter could fall in love and spend their anniversaries here. Yeah, like that was going to happen. Faith shoved a miniature candy bar into her mouth and smushed it around in her cheeks. She'd skipped dinner. Not smart, considering that all that was up in the suite was a fully stocked bar and baskets stuffed with chocolates from France. Alroy, huh? Carter said, flopping into the middle of the king-size bed covered with red rose petals. They went scattering over the floor. He shooed the rest of the bed with his hand. There's a story in there somewhere. Doesn't mean I want to share it, she said, and yanked a pair of yoga pants and a WSU sweater out of her bag. She wasn't going skiing anytime soon, so she jetted to the bathroom to change. Want to talk about Griff? Griffin? Hell no, he hollered from the other room. A long pause, and then, Do you feel any different as Mrs. Carter Griffin? I've got a killer headache. Do you think that's on account of taking your name? She couldn't help but laugh and watched her expression change in the gold-rimmed bathroom mirror. Her dark eyes were lightened with amusement, and her skin glowed. She was married. To Carter. She changed quickly and joined Carter in their honeymoon suite. He'd changed, too, into a pair of flannel pajama pants and a white cotton t-shirt that showed off the intricate designs on his arms. Maybe tonight she'd get to see those tattoos up close. His pants were slung low on his hips, as he always wore them, showing off his sexy backside. The shirt clung to his chest, his pectoral muscles bulging through the fabric as he adjusted himself on the bed. He was such a sexy male specimen. She couldn't look at him long before drool formed on her lips and warmth spread between her legs. There are no new releases that I'd want to see, but they've got the most recent Star Trek movie, Carter said flipping through the channels. Did he know he could grace the cover of Home Magazine? It was effortlessly model material. Even casually punching remote buttons had become erotic. We can watch it for the small price of our unborn child. Faith drew back the curtains and looked out over Inner Harbor through the rain battering the glass. If the temperature plummeted tonight, it just might snow. She touched her hands to the glass hoping they'd cool the heat blooming over her palms. Do you have any children? she asked offhandedly. The mention of an unborn child got her thinking about it. I've never thought to ask. It certainly was a possibility, considering he'd been mated before. I would have told you by now if I did. He punched buttons on the remote and squinted at the screen. My ex-wife and I could never get on the same page about that. Faith nodded. She wanted children and you didn't. Flip it and reverse it. He slid back to the center of the bed, fluffed the pillows behind him, and leaned against the headboard. I wanted children and she didn't. Her stomach twisted. 
Really? It wasn't that Carter wasn't the fatherly type, but he wasn't. He was covered in tats, said whatever came out of his mouth without thinking about it, and was insanely work-driven. With the promotion he'd been fighting for, when would he have time for a family? Was work something that he settled for because he couldn't have the wife and children he'd always wanted? He cleared his throat awkwardly. My marriage wasn't all that it seemed. The words replayed in her head over and over again until her feet moved to the bed of their own accord. What do you mean? She sat on the edge and leaned back into the mound of pillows he'd built. My wife and I weren't happy, he said simply. She frowned. But when we first met, you said you two were fated. You'd found your luminary. Weren't fated mates supposed to be happy? He bought Star Trek on instant video and went silent as the opening credits rolled. It wasn't until Captain Kirk's sexy face pulled into a perplexed frown for the third time that she curled her feet beneath her and turned to Carter. He stared at the screen, a vision of closed-off mail. If he was too stiff to open up, she'd rattle him until he did. What were friends for, anyway? Want to play a game? She asked innocently. What? A game. Want to play? His eyebrow quirked. Depends on the game. Every time someone calls Scotty by name, we take a shot. And if Spock gives a statistic, we have to share something personal about ourselves. I'm down with the shots. He hauled himself off the bed and popped open the mini-fridge. But I'll pass on the sharing. Come on, she said, getting more comfortable beneath the sheets. We're married now. I'm sure there is a ton we don't know about each other, and it would cover our backs if the members of the Bureau ask us something personal this weekend. Fine, but I choose the liquor. He threw two mini bottles of tequila onto her lap and another two onto his side of the bed. Let's roll. Shit. Tequila was poison. She'd be on the floor in two drinks, three tops. Within minutes, she tossed back her two-swig limit. They'd shared everything impersonal that they possibly could. She knew the names of his parents and friends, where he'd gone to school, what he'd wanted to be when he grew up. It didn't surprise her that he'd wanted to be a detective since he was a teenager. They talked about their first transition, Carter's during adolescence and Faith's the first full moon after she was attacked, and how they handled it. As Spock rattled on about the carbon monoxide to oxygen ratio in an unknown planet's atmosphere, Carter cursed. My turn first. He crossed his feet at the ankles and sighed. I was up for a promotion once, for the same position I'm vying for now. I applied 25 years ago, around the time my wife died. They thought I might have been too unstable under the circumstances of losing my luminary. Were you? Jeez, her lips were getting loose. Now, if they would simply press against Carter's lips, the party would jump from mediocre to stellar. He shook his head and frowned. Your turn. I'm not really brunette, she said twisting a lock of hair around her finger. I'm a redhead. Really? The color gets mistaken for dark brown anyway, so it's not a harsh change. Hmm. He tilted his head as if imagining her with a different hair color. You'd look like... Never mind. That's for another Spock moment. Smiling from the corner of his mouth, Carter diverted his gaze. She was about to ask him to finish when Captain Kirk screamed for Scotty to beam him up. Faith took a nip from the second bottle and waited, watching the screen for the next statistic. When Spock babbled about significant results again, Carter turned to her. My first tattoo was the white hawk soaring across my chest. And it was drop-dead gorgeous, unbelievably detailed. She'd only gotten a glimpse of it as he was chopping wood or mowing the lawn shirtless. What she wouldn't give to have a close-up look. No, wait, she said. What were you going to say I looked like? I don't have to share what you want me to. 
But you said... I said I'd wait for another Spock moment. He turned back to the television. It's not this one. Huh. She deflated into the pillows, her shoulders slumping. For a second, she thought he might have said she looked beautiful. But women with curves weren't his type, she reminded herself. He liked boring, bored straight figures with very dry personalities and impossibly long legs. You didn't share anything, he said after a beat. Don't think your pouting fit will get you out of it. She smacked him playfully across the chest with the back of her hand, the way she always did. This time, he caught her arm. Gasping, she tried to jerk it back. He didn't budge. The longer his skin touched hers, the more a delicious blush bloomed across her skin. She was either very drunk or very turned on. In all likelihood, it was both. It's your turn, he prodded, his gaze burning hot. I want you to let go of my arm. That's not nearly revealing enough. I can tell you want me to let you go from the way you're twisting your wrist around. From the television, Spock ordered Scotty to put more power into the ship's engines. With her free hand, Faith took a hearty gulp. Her dizzying fifth. Carter did the same, tossing it back with a smooth head bob. Okay, she said on a throaty sigh. My middle name is Alroy after my mother's father. He moved the family from Ireland when my mother was a young girl. She said he changed her life and that I would do the same. He dropped her arm. Seriously? That's fucking sweet. Snorting laughter was brought to the romantic moment by Jose Cuervo. Thirty minutes later, another statistic had Faith whooping, her arms flying above her head. Her insides were deliciously warm and her head was fuzzy. You're up, husband. The explanation for Griff Griffin. I know you want it. He crossed his hands behind his head and slid beneath the covers. But the story behind it isn't nearly as good as yours. That doesn't mean you shouldn't tell me. She faced him and got up on her knees, waving her hands in front of his face. Divulge, man, divulge. He shrugged, looking too much in control of his body. He wasn't drunk enough, not by a long shot. My father had a sense of humor, he said. No story to it. She gawked. That's it? Carter Griff Griffin was supposed to be funny? People name their kids worse things. Hollywood couples have some great examples. He nudged his chin at her. You're up. She let the liquid courage flowing through her system have control over her mouth. Probably a bad idea, but whatever. It wasn't like she hadn't made a poor decision yet today. She'd eaten double the amount of Weight Watchers points that she should have, downed way too many swigs of the devil's drink, and married her friend so her little brother could go to Yale. Chocolate, tequila, and no sex guaranteed for the next few months. Oh, yeah, she was mother-effing brilliant. When you first moved in, she forced out, feeling tipsier by the second, I had a crush on you. His eyes tracked across the bed more slowly than usual. You did? Yeah, but it didn't last long. Chills gathered at the base of her spine as the lie left her lips. I wouldn't want to do anything that would mess up our friendship. He stared, his hands lying still in his lap. Man, what she wouldn't give to be able to read his mind. You mean something like get married, he said and kept his eyes trained on hers. We didn't do this because we love each other. I'm helping you out, and you're helping me out. Friends help friends, don't they? He nodded slowly, his gaze focusing on the television. They do. Scotty beamed up two members of the ship. They thanked him, by name. Faith and Carter took a long gulp in silence. And then, before she could wrap her head around what was happening, his hand found the back of her neck and his lips were on hers. His grip was forceful, his hands rough. Their kiss during the wedding ceremony had surprised her. 
It was sweet and tender, with undercurrents of heat that melted the skin over her bones. This time, the kiss was intense, pure and simple, fierce and scorching hot. The man knew how to kiss. He was an expert. No doubt, from all the women he dated and ditched. Why am I thinking about them? She pushed the bimbos from her mind as his tongue grazed her lips. She opened her mouth and welcomed him in. He tasted like tequila mixed with something heady and tantalizingly male. A mixture that was as dizzying as it was electrifying. He pulled back, though his hand remained on the nape of her neck. Faith. His voice low and rough, rumbling through her ears. Friends don't kiss like that. Let me show you what else they don't do. She swiped her tongue across his lips, a quick flick that made his pupils widen with hunger. One second they were side by side, and the next he'd flipped her onto her back and pinned her beneath him. She was trapped in the cage of his muscular body, though she wouldn't want to escape if she could. He was completely overwhelming, Alpha to the extreme. She'd wanted this, had just been daydreaming about what this would feel like. She had to feel him, to see those tattoos that traveled across his chest. Grazing her hand over the ridge of his pants, Faith slipped her fingers beneath his shirt and touched skin. His abs were hot, a sheath of silky skin over bulging steel ridges. She peeled the shirt over his head and raked her nails over his chest muscles, tracing the wings of a white hawk painted across his right side. It was beautiful. As her fingers caressed the hawk's wings, he sucked in a deep breath that sounded like a hiss. He bent down to catch her mouth. His tongue flew past her lips, searching, claiming. The kiss screamed possession. As she whimpered into him, he moaned and crushed his hips against hers. He wanted this, wanted her. As if he read her mind, he said, Yes. Quivering, she reached up and kissed him again. This time her tongue went deep, twirling along his. Low in her belly, butterflies twisted and turned and jumbled together. Friends can make the best lovers, you know. She grabbed hold of the bottom of her sweater, rose up and lifted it from her torso. When she fell back against the bed, her breasts barely covered by a white lace bra, Carter groaned, fisting the pillow on either side of her head. You can touch if you want. Oh, the alcohol was really setting in now. Carter, what's the matter? Although it didn't make any sense at all, he stared at her as if she were a stranger to him, as if he was struggling to catalog the features of her face, trying to grasp some form of recognition. His color changed. His cheeks were beet red, the vein on his forehead straining, his shoulders flexing and twitching from bearing his weight over her. What is it? Can't. His hungry gaze lowered to her bra. We have to stop. No, he couldn't stop. Not when they were tangled in silk sheets, the smell of roses on the air, albeit mixed with splashes of tequila, with a view of twinkling lights in the harbor. She was practically quivering with want, on the verge of something really freaking great. She was damp between her legs and about to beg him to take the ache away. He put one hand on her shoulder to hold her in place. We have to. Stop, we do. No, we don't. Feeling feisty, she pulled out all the stops. We're married. By God's law, we can do this whenever we want. We can't do this. He ground out between clenched teeth. We shouldn't. She giggled, letting her fingers dance down his abs to the ridge of his jeans. Oh, I think we can, and we should. Do you need another drink to help you relax? This is a mistake. It doesn't have to be. I don't want this. He closed his eyes, his jaw clenching wildly. I don't want- Ice water shot through her veins. 
The serial dater didn't want her. That's what he was going to say. He didn't need to finish. She could read the horrible words all over his face. The guy who had no problems picking up and dumping women like yesterday's newspapers didn't want to sleep with her. He didn't seem to have a problem before she stripped out of her sweater. He saw something he didn't like. Wonderful. The perfect end to a perfect day. She should have ditched the minibar chocolate and opted for rabbit food instead. I should have known all along. I've seen the other women you dated, and I knew I wasn't like them. She dragged her sweater over her chest, covering her breasts, and wiggled out from beneath him. Take the damn bed. You've earned it. I'm sleeping in the tub. Faith, don't be. But it was too late. She ripped every cover off the mattress, trapped a pillow against her body, and stormed into the bathroom, locking the door behind her. Chapter 14 Carter tossed and turned, kicking the sheets off the bed. He was a live wire, frustration and indecision taking turns jolting through his system. His bride had locked herself in the bathroom more than an hour ago. Judging from the silence, she'd fallen asleep on the floor. Officially, the worst wedding night in matrimonial history. It was his wedding night, for Alpha's sake. She wasn't really his bride, and it wasn't really their wedding night, so the reality shouldn't have weighed on him so heavily. But it did. He'd handled the situation piss poorly. But if she knew he'd pulled away for her benefit, she wouldn't have been angry. If he'd let himself go, and had given in to the lust spiraling in his core, things would have gotten too complicated too quickly. I don't want this. Why'd he say it that way? On a groan, Carter smacked himself in the forehead and scrubbed his fingers through his hair. Of course he wanted her. Judging by the massive aching erection pitching the sheets, he still did. But damn it, he couldn't spoil what they had. She was one of his best friends. He drew his feet over the side of the bed, sat up and stared at the slice of black space beneath the bathroom door. She was right there, not twenty feet away. Go to her. His hands ached to feel her again, his mouth to brush against hers. She was like a volcano, hotter than he'd expected, and had melted his defenses. She'd erupted beneath his touch, lighting him on fire in a way he'd never known. He hadn't been expecting that. How was it possible that Faith was a vixen in bed? There was chemistry between them, undeniable, gut-clenching chemistry. But he couldn't get involved. Things were too complicated, and they'd only get worse if he didn't stay focused on what they were doing here in the first place. He had serious trust issues with the opposite sex, and he and Faith were friends. He actually enjoyed her company. If they'd skipped down the yellow orgasmic road, he knew where they'd be come morning. He'd turn into the same guy he always did when relationships threatened to spill over to the next level. Controlling, possessive, and constantly thinking his girlfriend was going to cheat on him. Thank you, cheating first wife. He'd be possessive over whom Faith went out with and whom she talked to. He'd feel more of a claim to her than he should. His trust issues would destroy their friendship. It was inevitable. It had happened before, and it would happen again. As he rested his elbow on his knee and his head in his hand, a soft sound escaped the bathroom. Was she crying? He stood and shuffled to the door. He reached for the handle and stopped as a whimper hit his ears. He clenched his hand into a fist and held it to the door. Knock. Call her name. Ask if she's okay. Don't be an asshole. Swallowing harder, Carter put his forehead to the door and listened. More whimpers, tears falling to the tile floor. His stomach soured with regret. He couldn't fix this. No matter what he did, he was screwed. Faith didn't understand. It's not that he didn't want her. He didn't want to spoil what they had. 
An overwhelming sense of dread snaked around his heart and squeezed. He blew out a soft breath and backed away from the door. Hands clenched into fists and a hole burning in the back of his throat. Carter dumped himself onto the bed and covered his head with a pillow. Room service? Two muffled knocks rattled in the distance. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Griffin? Rousing from her slumber, Faith rubbed the heels of her hands over her eyes. It took her a few seconds to remember why she was in the bathroom, curled into the jacuzzi tub. Carter, let him answer the door. Another round of knocks pounded against her skull. Not really, but they might as well have. She tried to roll out of the tub, but slipped, falling to the floor in a tangled heap of bedsheets. Fighting to her feet, she cracked the door and peeked into the suite. Carter was gone. Tiptoeing out, she checked the bed, the floor, beneath the table. Nothing. Room service for Mr. and Mrs. Carter Griffin, the annoying voice called again. I have a breakfast spread for the newlyweds, courtesy of the elopement package. Newlyweds my ass. She was grouchy, but she had every right. She'd thrown herself at Carter and had been rejected in the most embarrassing way. Couldn't he have told her he wasn't interested before she stripped? Would have saved her some dignity. I'm coming. She pulled open the door. A round man pushing a silver cart swept inside, smiling much too eagerly for the hour. He lifted the silver lids on a few dishes, revealing eggs, bacon, sausage, and pancakes. Breakfast fit for a king and his queen. Too bad she and Carter weren't either of those things. They were more like the court jester and his fat, fake mistress. Okay, that wasn't close either. She wasn't fat, just curvy. After she tipped the round man and he left the room, Faith noticed a small note card folded on the table near the bathroom door. She picked it up and read, Faith, I went on the adventure tour alone. I'll tell the others that you had a hangover and are resting today. Sorry about the way things went down last night. See. Sorry? The hell he was. She snatched a piece of bacon off the tray, chomped off the tip, and stared out over the harbor. He went on the adventure tour alone. She didn't really want to go anyway, she thought, shoving the rest of the bacon strip into her mouth. But if she stayed in, that would mean she'd be burying her head in the sand. Carter wouldn't be able to avoid her that easily. She downright refused to cower in the shadows while he went out on some sort of adventure with his colleagues. She may have been a chocoholic and 15 pounds, okay, 20, 5 pounds overweight, but she was no coward. A foreign emotion surged through her veins. Confidence. If Carter didn't want her and didn't think she was attractive, that was fine. That didn't mean there wasn't someone out there for her. How many brides thought of other men and future husbands the day after they got married? Probably not many. But under the circumstances, why shouldn't she? Their marriage was a sham. Why hold out for Carter when he'd made it perfectly clear that he didn't want her? She couldn't be like the other bimbos he dated. She'd tried at the Owens's party and had seriously botched the job. But she could be a better version of herself. One that deserved a man who loved her and thought she was beautiful. With her sweet tooth, soft hips, plain clothes, and all. From here on out, she'd be the best damned version of Faith she could be. Ten minutes later, she was dressed in jeans, a tight red sweater she'd picked up while shopping for the wedding ensemble yesterday. Turned out it was easier to find clothes fit for a harlot than a bride. And tall boots. She fluffed her hair and teased the back until her comb got stuck. She lined her eyes heavier than normal and was surprised to find that it emphasized their almond shape. She applied pink gloss on her lips, mashed them together, and smiled into the mirror at the final result. She popped open her computer, replied to comments on Have a Little Faith, 
and updated a few sidebar widgets in record time. She thought about making a note about Victoria. Maybe later today she'd sidle over to a few pet stores and check their stock. She closed her laptop and double-checked her appearance in the mirror. Good to go. Once in the lobby, she approached the front desk. A six-foot-tall, broad-shouldered, floppy-haired concierge in his thirties grinned and looked up from his muscle and fitness magazine. Excuse me, she said, slinging her bag over her shoulder. There was a big group of people gathered in the lobby at dawn going on some kind of adventure tour. Did you happen to see them? You're talking about the Seattle police force staying with us? Policing jerks? That's them. You missed them by about 15 minutes. Do you know where they were headed? I do, actually. I suggested the trip. He turned away from her and rummaged through a stack of glossy pamphlets. I'd like to join them if I could. Think that's possible? No prob, he said, placing a pamphlet on the counter and flattening it in front of her. Her stomach dropped as he pointed to the graphic on the center page. They're doing this? Need a ride? She nodded. And a barf bag. After enduring a 45-minute drive to Souk Potholes Provincial Park and another 20-minute ride on all-terrain vehicles through the forest, Carter felt no better about the way things had ended last night. He stood on a platform above the trees, staring out over two suspension bridges and eight zip lines of differing lengths wondering if he'd done the right thing. He should have woken her up this morning, knocked on the bathroom door to let her know he was leaving. For the last 15 minutes, everyone had milled about, getting ready for the big plunge, oblivious to the war raging inside him. He'd royally screwed over his wife, by not screwing her the way he should have, the way he truly wanted to. This is about letting go and having fun, the captain said as the tour people suited him up with a seat harness and climbing helmet. Only don't let go. He laughed, tugging on the rope attaching him to the line above his head. See you on the other side. The tour guide pushed him from behind and he was off, soaring over the tops of the trees. Once out of sight, the captain roared, sending birds scattering from the bushy green canopies. Next, the tour guide said. You, sir. The guide suited up eight high-ranking officials and their mates, and each of them soared through the trees, some following the captain, others disappearing between trees in the opposite directions. Mr. and Mrs. Owens were some of the few left to go. They huddled near the corner of the platform, fidgeting with their harnesses. Sorry your wife couldn't make it, Lieutenant Mark said from beside him. The guy was 500 years old and just over 200 pounds, barely making the height and weight requirements for the ride. The helmet on his head looked more like a yarmulke than a piece of protective equipment. Tell her she was missed. I will. Because she was. We simply had too much fun celebrating our wedding last night. At a boy. The lieutenant patted Carter on the shoulder. Wait, isn't that her? Carter turned. Below them, a four-wheeler skidded to a stop. The driver wore a motocross helmet etched with a glowing green skull and crossbones on the top. Faith straddled the quad behind him, her arms wrapped around his waist. Thanks for the ride, she hollered as she dismounted. She handed him the helmet, which he locked to the bar on the back of the four-wheeler. I'll let you know how it goes when I get back tonight. Tonight? She was talking to this guy like she knew him, like she was comfortable with him. Carter growled low in his belly. The lieutenant spun on his heel and attached his line to the next available hook. Faith climbed the stairs and met Carter on the tower. Her hair was windblown, her cheeks flushed pink. And her sweater. It was skin tight, hugging her breasts. He'd gotten so used to seeing her in baggy clothes, the tightness of the sweater shocked him. Hey, sweetie, she said, reaching on tiptoe to kiss his cheek. 
His skin buzzed. I'm feeling so much better than I did this morning. I'm glad. He smiled tightly. Are you sure you're up for this? Of course I am. She studied the lines. Rick and I had a great talk on the way over. He calmed me down about this whole thing. Rick? Mm-hmm. She picked up a helmet and fitted it on her head. On anyone else, it would have looked dorky as hell. Faith somehow made helmets fashionable and adorable. Rick's the concierge from the hotel. His palms itched. The concierge drove you all the way out here? She pulled down the bottom of her sweater, emphasizing the plumpness of her breasts. Wasn't that nice of him? Sure was. Shore wanted to break his neck, too. Did he hit on you? The words tumbled out before he could catch them. I'm not sure. Maybe a little. She shrugged shyly. Just because you don't find me attractive doesn't mean others don't. Of course you're. He shouldn't be. Others. His tongue tied itself into a gigantic knot. You think I don't find you attractive? I'm over the games, Carter, and I'm ready to fly. The guide suited her up, tugged on the buckles, and adjusted the strap around her hips. Mrs. Owens made her way over and embraced Faith in a hug. Look at you, dear. You always look so spectacular. She held Faith's hand in hers and raised it so that Faith could do a twirl. You've got a dream figure, darling. A perfect hourglass. Carter froze, taken aback by Mrs. Owens' outpouring of flattery. Faith looked hot, he couldn't deny. But she didn't always look this way. Back at home, she dressed in sweats and black stretchy pants paired with bulky sweatshirts. Now that Mrs. Owens mentioned it, Faith really did have an hourglass shape, didn't she? His hands itched with a desire to ghost over those reckless curves. That's so sweet of you to say, Mrs. Owens. Blushing, Faith walked to the edge of the platform and turned back to look at Carter. Will you be behind me? Aw, oh, shit. What he wouldn't give to be behind her, pounding into her wetness. Carter. Yeah, I'll be right behind you. He wished. No, wait, he didn't. That wasn't what he wanted. How easily she could make him forget. She hadn't been here more than five minutes. Mr. and Mrs. Owens took off along the zip lines ahead of Faith. Once they were a safe distance away, she shuffled to the edge of the platform. The tour guy waited, hand extended, to attach Faith's harness to the line. Only she was still grinning at Carter over her shoulder. She stepped too far and her right foot pitched over the edge. She lost her balance, reached for the rail for the tour guide, and got air. Carter moved lightning fast. He seized her wrist and held tight, yanking her back. She crashed into the tour guide, who was trying to be useful and failing. They toppled. Her wrist broke loose from his grip as she flailed in a funky, panicked attempt to brace her fall. She and the tour guide tangled together in a mess of arms and legs before falling to the platform. Faith landed on her back, the guide squarely on top of her. Rising up on his arms, the putsy guide looked down at her, smiling. Get off. Growling, Carter lifted the guide from the floor by the scruff of his collar. I'm off, I'm off, the guide said, raising his hands in surrender. My shirt, man. Faith got to her feet and rubbed the small of her back. Let go, Carter, it was an accident. Are you all right? The tour guide smiled at Faith. That was quite the tumble, sweet cheeks. Carter tightened his hold. You better cut the sweet cheeks or you'll be tumbling with me. Don't let him bother you. He's having a bad day. Faith patted the guide on the shoulder. We got married yesterday and we haven't had sex yet. He's got a serious case of blue balls. He did, but damn. Did she have to out him that way? What's the deal, man? The guy twisted in Carter's grasp, his gaze raking over Faith's body like a hungry predator. If you ain't into her, 
You should get your eyes checked. Oh, he was into her all right. So much so that he couldn't think about anything else. Using one hand, Carter cinched the guide up until his feet dangled in midair. Oh, sweetie, Faith said, planting her hand on her harnessed hip. Isn't that sweet? He finds me attractive, just like the concierge did. Without waiting for Carter to release the putsy guide, Faith hooked herself up to the zip line. Like this? she asked, glancing over her shoulder. The guide gave a thumbs up, and she was off. Carter dropped him to the platform as Faith took off, screaming in delight. She leaned back until she was upside down and thrust her feet in the air, arms extending to her sides. Mrs. Owens looked back, caught sight of Faith, and screeched with joy. If Carter bit his tongue any harder, he'd chew the damn thing in half. He yearned to be the one smiling and laughing with Faith. He ached to be the one giving her the confidence to ride the lines this way, the one she'd talked to at the end of the day. Instead, he wanted to kill every guy within a ten-mile radius. She's not your wife. You're not her husband. She's not yours. Although the words resonated with the logical part of Carter's brain, he dismissed them with a gut-clenching growl. The wolf part of him craved being near her, dragging her against him and claiming her as his own. This was precisely the reason he needed to keep the boundaries clear. Chapter 15 After they returned to the monarch, the members of the bureau scattered. A few retreated to their rooms, the excitement of the day had gotten to them, and a large group headed to the bar of the hotel for pre-dinner drinks, leaving Faith, Carter, and the Owenses standing in the lobby. I'm so glad you felt well enough to make it, Mrs. Owen said, leaning against a pillar. We've never been ziplining as a group before, and after today's fun, I doubt it will be the last. It was amazing. Faith said, watching Carter head to the front desk out of the corner of her eye. I'm glad my hangover wore off. And Carter said you were afraid of heights. Mrs. Owens palmed her forehead. That trick where you hung upside down was spectacular. I think the captain took a snapshot with his phone. He'll have to send you a copy. Faith smiled, remembering how surprisingly freeing the adventure felt. That'd be great. I don't think anyone back home will believe I did it. I'm going to need the proof. Isn't it amazing what we're capable of when we put our minds to it? It really was. Dawson had set his mind on Yale and had gotten accepted because of the work ethic and determination he'd gotten from their father. To get the detective position he'd dreamed of, Carter was willing to marry someone he had zero interest in. Not that it didn't miff her to think about it. She made the decision here and now. The second she got home, she was going to use them as an example of how to lead the rest of her life. She'd make have a little faith succeed, come hell or high water. Whatever she had to do, she'd make it happen. If it meant she had to pull all-nighters or invest in promotional opportunities, she would. Couldn't agree more, Faith nodded. What should she do first? After the cake disaster following the Owens' dinner, it was clear her cooking could use a boost. Maybe she'd enroll in culinary classes at the senior center. She'd always wanted to learn how to dance, too. Tracy had tried to drag her to ballroom for singles night at Cosmos, but Faith had always insisted her two left feet wouldn't allow her to attend. What was stopping her now? A husband who didn't want her? A brother who was going to be gone at college? Those things pointed to joining the ballroom classes, not steering clear of them. Have you heard about our next dinner for the Bureau? Mrs. Owens touched Faith's arm. Did Carter tell you? No, he didn't. Faith eyed the way he was talking to Hotel Service's Tinkerbell. The little pixie was leaning far over the counter, her shirt slouching in front to put her barely there breasts on display. Of course Carter would be interested. Tink was more his type than any other woman standing in the lobby. 
he doesn't tell me anything. Men are terrible at relaying things, aren't they? Mrs. Owen snickered. The Bureau didn't feel it was fair to host the two of you this weekend and leave Nate and his new bride out in the cold. Since Nate couldn't come, the captain suggested we have our next monthly meeting at his place, to get a better feel for his home and his family. Oh, no, no, no. Having the dinner party at Nate's would entail looking at pictures, having drinks in the backyard, and getting to know them on an intimate level, on their turf. Why not have it at our place? Faith blurted, desperate for the upper hand. If they host, they'll have to spend time cooking and cleaning rather than getting to know you all. Let me honor Nate and his bride with a dinner, at our home. Mrs. Owens grinned. Are you sure? Absolutely. She'd have the party catered and hire a cleaning service if she had to. She'd get the extra cash from her husband. He wouldn't mind. The cooking is intense, Mrs. Owen said, smoothing down her blonde locks. But I managed to handle it fine enough, as any good wife should. Where the hell was she? Stepford? But Mrs. Owens wasn't a Stepford wife. She was generous and sweet and one of the friendliest wives in the Bureau Faith had met. If Mrs. Owens could host a party like the last one, Faith could do it too. Mark it on your calendar, Faith said. The next Bureau meeting is at our place. Honey? Carter touched her arm, startling her. Can I talk to you? She spun around. Sure. See you soon, Mrs. Owens. After parting ways with one of the nicest ladies in the Bureau, Faith let Carter lead her outside, down the Monarch's steps to a walkway lining the harbor. Boats bobbed just offshore, a few lights twinkling here and there. Light posts guided their way around the edge of the harbor, illuminating a quaint concrete walk lined by the occasional flower bed. Despite the tension flowing off Carter in waves, the night was relatively still and the walk romantic. This whole place oozed starry-eyed fantasies. It was easy to dream of a romantic, whimsical night when her reality was grim. She'd crushed on Carter for a year, married him, almost bedded him, and been rejected. Peachy. Disappointment hollowed out her belly, but she tried to ignore the ache by thinking about her plans when she got back to Seattle. Update the blog, invest in herself, cook more, worry less. Don't get attached to men who don't want you. What's this about? she asked, as Carter's pace slowed near a man playing a violin for cash. Why couldn't you talk to me about it in there? Did I hear you right? he frowned. We're having the members of the Bureau over to our house? She nodded excitedly. Good, right? They were going to let Nate host the next monthly meeting, but I was in the position to swoop up the opportunity, so I did. Go on, she said, bumping into his shoulder. Say you're proud of my mad swooping skills. He stopped walking. What's gotten into you? Tension shot through her. Excuse me? She whirled around on him. What do you mean, what's gotten into me? You should be thanking me for stealing that opportunity away from Nate. Do you know that the captain meets with the host privately before the party to arrange the menu and seating arrangements? Do you know if the meeting is a hit? They'd be more inclined to have meetings at the same place in the future. I can't stand by and let Nate take that away. Carter's jaw clenched until it looked like it was going to snap clean off. You've forgotten one very important thing. What's that? The burned baking pan on your front porch. The warning to all the other pans in your house. Oh, that. She shrugged. I'll learn how to cook. In a month? He didn't look amused. I can do it. I just realized I can do anything. She grinned. And I might be moving to Stepford. His face scrunched. What? Nothing. Poor attempt at a joke. She kept walking. He followed, eventually. I'll take cooking classes. I should have done that a long time ago. I don't mind. I used to enjoy school. 
What about cooking? Have you ever enjoyed that? Not especially, but if I learned how to make a dish right, I might. Carter slowed his pace to match hers as they passed a couple attached to each other's faces, leaning against one of the light poles. We've got one more problem. His words came out crisp and low. We don't live together, yet we're having the party at our house. Don't you think it's going to be strange that your stuff isn't there or there aren't any pictures of us anywhere? She bit her lip. Your place does lack a woman's touch. It does? Oh, come on. You know it's a bachelor pad. You've got black leather couches, liquor stocked for the apocalypse, and a picture of Tom Selleck made out of crushed velvet, hanging in your dining room. He pointed at her, lips tight. I got that picture at auction. It's classic. It's not a Monet. A woman would never let you hang that picture somewhere people are eating. She paused, thinking over their options. Nothing seemed clearer than the ones staring her in the face. I'll move in when we get back. I'll stay in your guest room downstairs, and you can stay in your room. We'll have separate baths and share the living room and kitchen. I'll decorate and spruce the place up, but not too much. I'll pay you half the rent for a few months if you'll... Don't be ridiculous. You don't have to pay rent. You'll still have the rent at your place. I couldn't ask you to pay double for the months you're staying with me. She was about to push the point when he said, Save the money for Dawson. What could she say to that? Okay, Rumi. She stopped and turned to him. Moonlight streaming through the clouds caught on his eyes just so, accenting their pale blue clarity. Her heart stuttered, even though she'd told it not to. Damn treacherous thing. If we're done here, I've got to get back inside. I told Rick I'd meet him in the lobby to tell him about the trip. Rick. It came off his lips as a growl. You're meeting him now? Unless there's more you want to talk to me about. What's gotten into you? He asked, leveling her with a piercing stare. There was no moonlight lightening his eyes now. They were dark and cold. You show up to the zip lines in this. He motioned from her boots to her sweater. Talk about some hotel rat named Rick. Nearly break your neck only to flirt with a tour guide and then fly around the skies like you own them. I thought you were afraid of heights. I got over it. It was all she could get out before he fired off another question. And you hated tight clothes. I've never seen you in a sexy sweater like this one. This is sexy? She pressed her hands down her sides, smoothing the sweater at her waist. Stop doing that. He paced a tight circle, then came at her, stopping short of pressing his body against hers. You don't flirt. You don't meet guys in lobbies of hotels, and you don't agree to cook for the entire bureau. This isn't you. I thought you said from here on out you were going to be yourself. Surprisingly, she hadn't been trying to be anyone but herself any of those times. After Rick had told her that no one had gotten injured from the zip line since their opening 15 years earlier, she'd gotten over her fear. It wasn't heights that she'd been afraid of after all, it was falling. Trusting in the strength of the cords gave her the courage to have the most fun she'd had in ages. And she liked the way the red sweater accented her breasts, yet smoothed down the extra curves around her waist. It was the most flattering thing she'd bought in years. She hadn't really thought sweaters could be sexy, but judging from Carter's expression, she'd been wrong. This is me, Carter, she said lifting her arms to her sides. I'm the same person I was two days ago, back at my cabin when you asked me to come here. Just because I'm wearing something I don't usually wear and talking to someone in the lobby doesn't mean I'm different. We still have a deal, if that's what you were worried about. So you are talking to him. To who? Rick? She shook her head. Is that all you heard? She'd never seen him this worked up. A thin layer of sweat clung to his forehead. His pulse raced. She could hear it in the silence stretching between them. 
He paused, his chest rising up and down as if he were out of breath. I'm not worried about the deal. Then what? I'm... He shoved his fingers through his hair. I'm worried about you. She stepped back toward the embankment, beneath a flickering umbrella of light, and hopped up on the concrete half-wall separating the walkway from a patch of grass. You've got no reason to worry about me, she said. I'm not yours. You are mine. He advanced and then stopped suddenly, a look of shock flashing over his face. For the next few months, you're my wife. But I'm not your woman or your mate. She kicked her legs over the edge. If I want to talk to a stranger in the bar until midnight, I will. As long as it doesn't interfere with our agreement or your chances of getting the detective position. The light overhead flickered to black. In the temporary dark, Faith heard the hard and true thump-thump of Carter's heartbeat, his heavy intake and exhale of breath, and the clunk of his heel as he eliminated the space between them. Carter? He whispered, Let me try something. And in the next instant, his hand was on her cheek. She flinched, but his fingers lingered, the pads brushing against her skin in a loving caress. She couldn't help it. The tenderness of his touch forced her eyes closed. His hand glided to the back of her neck, and he gave a little tug, scooting her to the very edge of the half wall. He stood against the concrete, his hips pressing her thighs apart. Her breath hitched as he tilted her head up with his fingers and planted an open-mouthed kiss on her neck. Sparks sizzled across her skin and warmed her from the inside out. She shouldn't be doing this. He didn't want her last night. What changed? His tongue shot out tantalizingly slow, tracing her scar from her jawline down the side of her neck. Quivering, she reached out for him and grazed her nails down his back. Then she grabbed fistfuls of his shirt and shoved him away from her. Are you the same person you were last night? She asked, willing her racing heart to still. His face was close to hers and closing in. I am. Am I the same woman? I hope so. The words were spoken from a smiling mouth, one that was going to kiss her and stop her heart in two seconds flat. God, he smelled good, like pine and wood smoke. She held him at arm's length. I thought we were friends. We are. I was thinking we could try... Friends with benefits on for size. God, he'd probably benefit as well as he kissed. When it comes to you and me, it's friends only. She was dead tired of playing games. Her heart couldn't take it. She didn't want to be friends with benefits. With Carter, she wanted more. Damn it, she deserved more. She pushed him away and hopped off the wall. If you want benefits... You'll have to find it somewhere else. After we're divorced, that is. As she walked away, knees shaking, she chanced to glance back. Carter cursed and kicked the post. The light flickered on. Chapter 16 Carter didn't go up to the room right away. He couldn't think straight. Faith was driving him crazy. She was giving him all kinds of signals staring at him with those smoky brown eyes, pressing down the front of her sweater to push out her breasts, bumping into him and flirting with that coy little smile of hers. When he kissed her, she kissed him back. When he touched her skin, she warmed for him, nearly bending into his touch. Yet she pushed him away. Was she interested in someone else? Was it Hotel Rat Rick? Carter paced around the lobby, walked by the pool, checked out the hotel's gym and sauna. He found himself on the fourth floor and pushed through the double doors onto the balcony where he'd gotten married a little more than 24 hours before. The wind was so cold it burned. He lifted his hands to the sky, letting thick droplets of rain lance into his palms. After a few deep breaths, he felt better. Soaked through but his anger had washed away. 
He'd made a mess of things. If he knew how it had happened, he might have an idea how to straighten them out. But he didn't. He went back inside, up to their floor, and let himself into their suite. The lights were off, but he couldn't mistake Faith's curves covered with the floral comforter. She was facing the wall, curled up on the far side of the bed. Looked like he was the one sleeping in the tub tonight. Taking a spare pillow and blanket out of the closet, Carter stared at the tub. It was built for two, but that didn't make the porcelain any warmer. Choosing the floor near the bed over the tub, he threw the blanket onto the carpet and tossed the pillow on top. He stripped out of his clothes and stepped into a pair of pajama pants. Exhaling heavily, he lay down, facing the opposite direction as Faith. Her soft inhale of breath somehow seemed to soothe him. The rhythm started slow and calm, relaxing him into a light slumber. But within a few seconds, her breathing changed. Short, desperate gasps for air were followed by exhales and whimpers. She cried out, flailing on the bed. Had she woken up? He got up and came to her side of the bed. Eyes pinched shut, Faith thrashed through the covers. Get away from me. No, no, don't. Please, I'll help. As a strangled cry escaped from her throat, she threw herself back against the pillows and grasped at her throat. Nightmare had to be about the night she was attacked. Shh, Carter said, sliding into bed beside her. Faith, it's okay. She swung for him and connected a jab to his chin. Somebody help me. Pain burst through his jaw. The woman could hit. Faith, it's Carter. He dodged the next blows, but pure instinct warned him against holding her arms. He didn't want to reenact the night she was attacked and freak her out more. Wake up, sweetie. It's a nightmare. It's only a dream. As she continued to wail on him, one hand covering her neck, the other striking out with surprising force, Carter ducked, continuing to talk her down. Faith. He covered his head. Faith, wake up. She huffed, out of breath. Her hits weakened. Faith. He soothed, brushing a hand down her hair. It's okay, calm down. No one's going to hurt you again. At his words, tears fell from her eyes and rolled down her cheek onto her pillow. She took a jagged breath of air. It shuddered out of her. Her eyes remained closed tight, her arms tucked against her chest. Was she awake, settling into a better dream? It's okay. Carter wiped away the tears on her cheek with his thumb. I'm here now. I'll take care of you. He wasn't sure where the words came from, but he knew he meant them. A little mewing sound flowed past her lips, and she nuzzled into his chest, her arms clasped tightly between them. Her body was warm. Her hair smelled fresh and sweet, like raspberries and cream, as if she'd just washed it before hopping into bed. Hesitantly, Carter lifted her head and laid it in the crook between his arm and his chest. He wrapped his arms around her and held her close. It's okay now, he whispered, resting his head against hers. Sleep. She wiggled against him, pressing her body flush against his, chest to chest, hip to hip. The closeness made his body go rock hard, every part. She was supple and soft where he was rugged and firm. Her cheek touched his, a silky caress against a shadow of stubble. The more he thought about her body, its warmth and closeness, its voluptuous curves, the harder he became. He adjusted his hips away from her, but she seemed to chase him, wiggling her body closer. Distract yourself. Don't think about her that way. Listen to the rain beating against the windows. Listen to the heater kicking on. The thumping of footsteps as someone strode down the hall. Focus on the sheets, the pillow beneath his head, the plushness of the mattress. Focus on her button-up flannel pajamas and how they weren't sexy at all. Nope. Shit, none of it helped. His stomach clenched as she made a little whimper from deep within her throat. 
He tightened his grip around her waist, digging his fingers into the extra curves she had there. God, how many times had he wanted a woman who had a little something to hold on to? Something soft to sink into. Get out of bed. She's still asleep, you jerk. Lifting the covers, Carter slunk away, his body inching off the bed. Don't go, she whispered. Don't leave me. He swallowed hard, his throat dry like sandpaper. I can't stay. She nuzzled into him once more, torturing him with her drugging feminine scent. Her dangerous curves begged to be traced with his fingers, his tongue. Are you awake? he asked, pulling back to look at her. The moonlight streaming through the window caught on the angles of her face, the dainty slope of her nose and tiny spot above her lips. Faith? Stay, she mumbled. Just stay. He couldn't resist. Slowly, so he wouldn't spook her, he touched that section between her nose and mouth as if he were shushing her. Her eyelashes fluttered and her lids peeled apart. I don't want to sleep alone. Not tonight. She blinked up at him with heavy-lidded eyes. Can you at least hold me until I fall back asleep? He nodded and hugged her against him. They'd fallen asleep together on her couch before, so why did this time feel different from all the other times? There were other Friday movie nights where he'd covered her so she wouldn't be cold and lay behind her until morning. He'd never heard one of her nightmares before, though. Was that the reason this felt different? No, it was the stirring inside him that made him want to strip those flannel PJs off her body. The wrenching ache in his gut that warned this feeling wouldn't dissipate with the rising of the sun. Carter? She whispered. Yeah? I don't want to go back to sleep yet. Her voice shook. When I close my eyes, I see his face. The wolf that attacked you? She nodded against his bare chest. What happened to him? He'd never asked her. There'd never been a good time. Did the pack put him on trial? No. She shivered, so he pulled the blankets up to her neck. After he killed my parents and attacked my brother, he came after me. But I'd already made it to the phone and called the police. He bit me. She paused and sighed. He stroked his hands up and down her back. I'm sorry I asked. You don't have to tell me. Instead of the police breaking down my front door, she continued, it was a team of enforcers, I learned later. The wolf stared straight at them as he clawed the side of my neck. Without thinking, Carter trailed two fingers down her scar, from her ear down the side. She trembled, but she didn't shrink away. If the wolf that marred her flawless skin that way wasn't already dead, Carter would have killed him. As soon as he clawed through my neck, the enforcers tased him and dragged him away. I lost so much blood that I passed out. When I came to, he was dead. My parents were gone. Dawson barely survived the mauling. The enforcers took us to your Pax Alpha, Drake Wilder. He told us about werewolves, shifting, and our upcoming transition. That had to be difficult, Carter said. He was born a werewolf and couldn't imagine being turned and having to adapt to transitioning into one if it was unexpected. The fact that there was a secret society of werewolves living in Seattle had to be a lot to take in for a non-shifter. I'm so sorry. She coiled her arms around his shoulders and burrowed into his neck. I still dream about him sometimes. In all the wolves I've seen since then, I've never seen one so gruesome. He was pure evil. His eyes were red, and he... Shh. Carter said, stroking her back. Her skin had chilled during the retelling. He could feel a damp coldness seeping through the flannel. Nothing's going to hurt you now. She looked up at him. It's hard to tell dream from reality sometimes. Close your eyes, he said. 
I'll stay with you as long as you need me to. She blinked blearily. I shouldn't need you. It's all right if you do. Delicious warmth spread through his chest at the notion that he could protect her. At least for tonight. As she stared up at him, her butterscotch brown eyes twinkling in the dark, he brushed his lips across her cheek. She tilted her head so he could have her mouth if he wanted it. His stomach clenched as he found her lips, warm and soft, and pressed against them. She didn't move at first, just kissed him sweetly, innocently. As their lips separated, Carter brushed his hands down her hair, over her forehead and down her temples. Her skin was like porcelain, silky and perfect. They lay in the dark for what felt like hours, though it could have been long, torturous minutes and Carter wouldn't have known the difference. He was completely and utterly absorbed in the gentle lines of Faith's face, the smooth swoop of her chin, the petite ridge of her nose, the heart-shaped pout of her lips. She was so beautiful, so soft, angelic. Although it didn't make a lick of sense, Carter felt like he'd never seen her this way before. She looked like the Faith he knew, yet a completely different person at the exact same time. In the cloak of night, something had definitely changed. Pangs of want had never hammered through his gut when he gazed into her eyes. Goose flesh had never scattered over his skin when he touched her cheek. He wanted her, way more than the rules of friendship allowed. Faith studied him right back, oblivious to the desire stirring through him. Her fingers grazed over the stubble on his cheek, the arch of his brow, and the tiny cleft in his chin. Could she be fighting the same urges, warring with crossing the line as he was? As her fingers swept over his lips, she added pressure, smudging them aside. Longing sparked in her eyes, wild and unexpected. She wanted him back. The single desirous gaze changed everything. She stared at him, hungry and desperate, her mouth parting in supple invitation. Stomach clenching into a solid fist, Carter jumped at the offer, stamping a kiss on those sultry lips. His tongue dived deep into the wet recess of her mouth. She moaned and opened wide for him, clutched at his shoulders. A wave of arousal hit his senses, stirring a hunger in his gut that flared when she groaned into his kiss. He snapped. Rising onto his hands, Carter rolled on top of her and pinned her beneath him. She tugged on his shoulders, dragging him down. His hands went on overdrive, sliding down her shoulders to her waist. He gripped her there, his fingers kneading lush flesh before they skimmed down to her hips. His mouth dived to her neck, where he licked a slow line over her scar. She tried to shrink away, but he gripped her tight, keeping her still. There'd be no shying away from him tonight. She swallowed hard, her head falling back against the pillows, her body going still beneath him. Desperation setting in, he fumbled with the buttons of her top and popped them free with a hard yank. He stilled, his entire body clenching tight. Good Lord. She wasn't wearing a bra. He folded the flannel flaps of her top aside, exposing her creamy white breasts. Chills scattered over his back, gathering into a knot at the base of his spine. Groaning from deep within his belly, he cupped one breast in his hand, relishing its lushness and weight. He raked his thumb over her nipple. Air ripped from his lungs as it tightened into a bud for him. She was a goddess personified, her breasts so soft and round he could have buried his head between them, suffocated and died a happy man. He bent to suck her nipple into his mouth, but she raked her fingers through his hair and grabbed a fistful, yanking his head back. She brought his mouth down to hers. Her kiss was urgent, white hot. Everything about her was soft, her lips, her breasts, her touch. Combined with the blazing heat of her mouth, Carter was lost in a sea of molten ecstasy. Her fingers danced along the grooves of his abs, leaving a trail of scorched flesh behind. She gasped as she cupped the bulge in his pants and pulled her hand back. 
Don't be shy, he said, his voice escaping as a growl. Beginning to tremble with need, he replaced her hand on his cock. The instant she cupped his length, his muscles seized and his shaft jerked. She sighed into his mouth, her body going pliant as she stroked him from the outside of his pants. The pressure was perfect and right, but skin against cotton wasn't enough. He yearned for skin on skin, burned for it. That wasn't going to cut it. He nudged her thighs apart and settled between them, claimed her mouth, cupped her breast, skimmed his hands down her stomach over her sexy little pooch, and stopped at the ridge of her pajama bottoms. You're wet, aren't you? He rasped, nearly bursting at the thought of brushing his fingers through her cream. God, you're going to be so wet for me. She shuddered against him, her tongue sweeping through his mouth, seeking out every delicious curve, every dark bend. She moaned his name against his mouth, and he lost it. Urgent and greedy, he peeled the pants from her body and kicked off his own. He held her gaze the whole time, relishing the desire sparking there. There was want in those eyes, longing and a deep, ravenous hunger that he was all too willing to satiate. He thanked his lucky stars that he'd be able to touch her skin to skin. Werewolves couldn't pass diseases, and she could only get pregnant if she was in heat, which she wasn't. Her nails slashed over his shoulders as he settled between her hips, the tip of his cock sliding through the slick warmth of her entrance. With a groan that rattled through him, he entered her slowly, sinking to the hilt. Pleasure speared through him, and he threw his head back. He'd never felt anything like this before, not even close. The sensations firing through his middle were overpowering and raw, sparking over his skin like fireworks. Faith was a perfect fit, a flawless match, who knew when to rock her hips and when to roll beneath him. Every breath that pushed out of her lips was erotic, drawing him closer to release. Every brush of her skin against his sent stars flickering in front of his eyes. As their hips met, Faith gasped, her mouth falling open into a seductive O. Oh. He caught her as she cried out his name and thrust his tongue into her mouth as he drove inside her. Heat spiraled through him as he pushed into her again and again, his pace speeding to a violent crest. She was his best friend. She shouldn't have been such a skilled lover, knowing exactly what he liked and needed, without him having to tell her. Dizzy on her sex and drunk on her scent, he sank deep, feeling every clench and tremble of her center. She was close to ecstasy, gloriously close. Clawing at him, she planted her feet on the bed and lifted her hips. And then, crying out his name, she broke apart bucking and writhing against him. He could barely contain the happiness spiking through his chest at the sound of his name. This was so much more than lust. You're so beautiful, breathtaking, he said, locking gazes as her orgasm waned. I want you to come with me this time. I've never come twice, she said, breathless. The air punched out of her lungs. He could hear the racing of her heart thumping against her ribs and could have sworn it called for him. Then I'll show you there's a first time for everything. Lust firing through his veins, Carter flipped her over so that she was on her hands and knees. He grabbed her hips and entered her from behind. He pushed deep into the most intimate part of her as waves of heat rolled through him. She arched back, urging him into her. If she came this way, he would break apart. He was sure of it. Still, he plunged into her, gripping her hard. The curve of her hips, the slender bend of her waist, and the sight of his cock penetrating her drove him to the brink of madness. His searching hands reached around her hips and found her center, drenched with desire. She cried out as his fingers teased and circled, and drove her to another orgasm. 
Her hips pounded against him over and over again. Between the sound of their bodies joining, the scent of her arousal, and the sight of her lavish curves, he tightened, clenched, mine. He stilled, moments before emptying into her. The urge that leveled him was unmistakable. The wolf part of him wanted to bond and claim her as his own. But wolves bonded for life, and his mate was long gone. He was destined to roam the world solo. He wasn't supposed to have the desire to claim another mate. Faith glanced back at him, her chestnut hair fanning over her shoulder. God, she was a vision. He could spend every day of his life telling her how stunning she was, and it still wouldn't be enough. She probably still wouldn't believe him. Now, she said, panting. He drove into her harder, relishing every enchanting detail of her face. He struggled to drown out the voice whispering from the deepest part of him. Mine. The sensations sparking in his gut were pure possession. It was ludicrous, but it felt the exact same as it had when he'd found his first luminary. But that didn't make sense. Wolves got one luminary in each lifetime, and marked one woman as theirs. Faith would make two. Impossible. Why, then, did the primal need to claim Faith claw at his insides? She flattened onto the mattress, her backside arching up for him. Hunger hollowed him out. Unable to resist the spike of lust spearing through him, he lifted her hips, teasing her, massaging her with his fingers. He yearned to pleasure her over and over again, until her body shook and her heart beat his name. But each desire, each thrust, was linked to the unmistakable need to claim her. I can't. Again. Oh, my. She cried out again, louder, as her core clenched into a fist around his hard length. Carter. He fought the urge, swallowed it down, and pushed it to the back of his mind. Grinding his back teeth, he pitched over the edge, emptying into her in a series of intense surges. The need to claim her as his life mate struck him true. He resisted, barely. It was too close. As he collapsed over the top of her, breathing hard into the curtain of hair falling over her shoulder, he knew unequivocally that this could never happen again. She was too mouthwateringly sweet, made him lose control too easily. The rational part of him whispered that wolves didn't have two luminaries, but he knew what he felt. I need a shower. He removed himself from her core and slid off the bed. It tortured him not to cradle her in his arms to settle into the pillows and hold her against his chest. I'll be right back. He shut the bathroom door behind him and cranked the shower knob toward freezing cold. Chapter 17 She could not, under any circumstances, sleep with her husband again. Sleeping with Carter was everything Faith had always thought it would be and more. It was magical. His touch was tender, yet when it came to getting down and dirty, he wasn't afraid to make a move and turn her around. Best sex ever. She told herself she wouldn't get involved with him that way. She'd said they'd be friends only. What did she do? Slept with him the moment he gazed into her eyes and made her feel beautiful. In that moment, it didn't matter that they wanted different things. She wanted a relationship and he wanted friends with benefits. She would have given the world to lie in his arms like that for another second, minute, hour, whatever. Way to throw the wrong signal. The last thing she wanted was to be seen as a floozy, someone like Paisley, someone who would jump into the sack with Carter after a few smooth lines. But she was nothing like Paisley, she rationalized to herself. Paisley was probably the aggressor when it came to sex. She probably took control. She was probably a strumpet, granting Carter's every fantasy. 
Faith had smacked herself on the forehead so many times after Carter sprinted out of bed. He took an hour-long shower, probably to scrub her scent off his body parts. He told her good night and slept on the floor beside the bed. He tossed and turned the rest of the night the same way she did. She knew because his pathetic attempt at snoring should have won him an Academy Award. She must have been desperate to sleep with someone who had zero romantic interest in her. How had she fallen for his seduction tactics so easily? He was a flirt. She knew that about him already. He'd probably seduced hundreds of women before. She didn't know for sure, but he was a serial dater, so who knew what his actual sleazy tally was? She'd fallen for a pro, after all. Did he keep a black book with all his conquests? She'd have to search through his office for that when she moved in. Did he still call Paisley when the nights got long and he got lonely? Would she jump at the chance to slide into bed with him, even though she was newly married? Faith bet, given the chance, Paisley would ditch Nate for Carter. Faith would have to seriously raise her defenses if she didn't want to fall head over heels in love with Carter. Thankfully, he was in meetings with the captain and other members of the Bureau almost the entire day Sunday. If she had to do another adventure tour, she might have buried her head under her pillow and slept the day away. During the afternoon ferry ride and drive back to Seattle, she barely looked at him. It wasn't until he dropped her off at her place and turned off the Tahoe that she finally met his gaze. Guess I'll see you tonight, she said, popping open the passenger door. His face scrunched. What's tonight? I'm bringing a few things over to start the move. Who knows when a member of the Bureau will stop by? He tapped the steering wheel as he gazed deep into the forest surrounding her cabin. I can't be there. Can't be there or wouldn't be. He slid a key off the ring hanging from the ignition. This one's for my front door. Let yourself in, but make sure you lock it when you leave. When will you be home? Home? He said the word as if it tasted sour. Not until later. I've got a long day at the office today and some research to do after hours tonight. Fine by me. She took the house key and hopped out of the truck, slinging her bag over her shoulder. Which room do you want me to take? He rubbed his temples. Uh, the one closest to the living room is fine. The one farthest from his. Good call. She might not be tempted to tiptoe across the hall and slink into bed with a few doors separating them. Sounds good, she said, adding more pep to her step than she felt. See you, Carter. He waited until she stepped inside her cabin before he left her drive. And even then, it seemed like he hesitated before pulling onto the street. She glanced out the window, waiting to see if he'd turn around, every nerve in her body on edge. Instead, from the opposite direction, Tracy's midnight blue Volvo turned in. Faith's stomach twisted into a knot. But what did she expect? A non-fairy tale to suddenly turn into one? Not likely. Disappointed beyond words, Faith tossed her bag into her room, shut the door, and pressed play on the answering machine sitting on the kitchen hutch. Two messages. Alert the media. Two messages in three days? Boy, was she popular. Every hot, eligible bachelor in Seattle was beating down her door. She pulled down a bottle of apothic red from the top of her fridge and poured a glass, keeping an ear open. The machine droned, First message, Saturday, 9 p.m. Hey, Faithy, it's Dawson. The conference is awesome. You wouldn't believe how many people my professor has introduced me to. I even met one guy who reminded me of Dad. He went to Yale, majored in design with the same emphasis, and graduated a few years after. Faith's throat squeezed. Dawson really missed their father, more than she might have realized. Now that he was following in his footsteps, Dawson sounded content, happier than he had in years. Just calling to say thank you, he continued. I couldn't do this without you. As Faith gulped down the last of the wine, the front door slammed shut. Faith, Tracy called. Your dog's got serious identity issues. 
Faith turned the corner as her black and white furball ran at her feet, yapping as if to welcome her home. Hey, she said, picking Humperdinck up in her arms. How'd you do it, Tracy's? He mounted the damn cat. Tracy set the travel kennel beside the couch. You're going to have Siamese Yorkies if you don't do something about him. Faith held him up to get a good look at those adorable puppy dog eyes. You're my goal this week, and I need to focus on me, too. We'll work our issues out together. How's that sound? As Humperdinck whimpered in reply, the machine beeped and rattled off the second message. It was probably Dawson again, this time happy and drunk. Sunday, 2.30 p.m. That wasn't more than an hour ago. She'd just missed the message. Faith Hamilton, this is Jack Winchester from Wagging Tails Dog Supplies in Sacramento, California. I'm calling in regard to your blog, Have a Little Faith. I've had more than a few customers come in requesting products featured on your blog, and was wondering if we could talk about product placement and advertising options. I'm very interested in working with you. My phone number is... As Faith scrambled to find pen and paper, Humperdinck squirmed to get down. She set him at her feet and copied the number as Jack Winchester recited it. Sounds like a serious offer. Tracy's eyebrows shot up. From Sacramento, no less. Your blog must be doing well. I haven't had a chance to look in the past few days, actually. We just got back. We? I was going to ask how your romantic getaway was, but I guess that answered it. Faith had called Tracy earlier while Carter was in meetings, and filled her in on the details of their dry business deal, wham-bam engagement, and phony baloney marriage. Tracy disapproved, stating that they should have made a clause where Faith could sleep around on the side. So Faith had left out that she had, in fact, slept around with her new husband. Stop it. You know what I mean. Faith dragged her laptop from beneath her couch, her super-duper secret hiding spot, a place thieves would never think to look, and swiped the mouse to turn it on. A few clicks later, and she was starting up her page. Holy shit. Page clicks were through the roof. Overall views had doubled. Eighty-six comments were awaiting approval. Eighty comments in two days? Faith gawked at the screen. That's amazing. Tracy leaned over her shoulder. No wonder the Winchester Rifleman is calling you to advertise his stock. There's more than one Winchester. Faith scrolled through her hits and the search engine supplying them. The man sells dog supplies, not rifles. Could be both. Tracy poured herself a glass of wine, plopped onto the couch, and shrugged. Never know. He's not both. What happened to make Have a Little Faith take off in a little more than 48 hours? She hadn't done anything differently, yet the spikes in views and comments were undeniable. She'd have to make sure to carve out a solid chunk of time out of her schedule each night to answer questions and write new posts. Wouldn't want to lose momentum. Glancing down at Humperdinck as his tiny whale wagged over the hard wood, Faith got an idea. She'd make the pooch her new project post photos and video, and record his training and progress. At the end, she'd announce that he was up for adoption. With all the views, he was sure to go to a good home. Now that she had a solution for Humperdinck, all that was left was solving her own problems. She had a move to make, a dog blog to run, dinner to cook for the bureau in a few weeks, and a husband to gleefully irritate. You've got that crazy look in your eye. Tracy said. What's ticking? Faith smiled. Know any chefs looking to give private cooking lessons? No, but there's a hot one giving sessions at the senior center. Faith's spirit soared. Perfect, that'll work. She hoped. Carter worked through the afternoon and straight into the night. He hadn't even noticed that everyone had filed out until he rose from his seat to raid the vending machine and found the entire twelfth floor vacant. His stomach growled as he punched the buttons for a Twix. The bars holding the chocolate sticks twisted and turned, 
and stopped short of releasing it. Come on, he pounded his fist against the glass. Gravity defied him. The bar didn't budge. Hell, fate defied him. What was the issue with faith and the luminary pull? He'd been around the werewolf block for a little over a hundred years, and he'd never, not once, heard of someone having two luminaries. That wouldn't even make sense. Candyless, Carter retreated to his office, closed the files he'd been working on for the Bureau, and pulled up the general internet search function for the Seattle Wolfpack's computer system. He typed luminaries and read a handful of articles relaying information he'd heard a thousand times before. Luminaries were fated mates. Bonding with one's luminary extended his or her life to a thousand years, strengthening both partners, blah, blah. He skimmed. Clearing the initial search, he typed dual luminaries. No search results found. He scratched his head and stared out over the city of Seattle. It was supposed to storm for the next few days. Relentless battering rain coupled with intense wind gusts that would die off tomorrow. Die off. An idea pinged. He typed deceased luminaries into the search bar. A few articles popped up, including one from 1976 about a man from Auburn who lost his wife in a tragic hunting accident 30 years prior. Carter clicked on the link and read, Jameson Clark, age 253, claims to have found his second luminary last month while boating on Lake Washington. He and his new companion, Jenna, age 31, completed the bonding ritual in an intimate ceremony at Clark's home a few weeks after meeting. While the theory of multiple luminaries has never been proven or disproven, this reporter remarks that the Clarks seem content. So maybe it's possible to have two luminaries, Carter whispered aloud. He queued up a search for Jameson Clark and found two additional articles, the first article was a tiny piece in the back of the Seattle Mariner. It was from 1991. Carter read aloud, The Jameson Clark story of discovering two luminaries continues to twist. Clark now reports finding a third luminary, Cynthia, age 21, at a Christmas party in Portland, Oregon. No one has been able to explain this tale, and many consider Jameson to be a liar or joker at best. If you recall, Clark's first wife and luminary, Francine Clark, was killed during an unfortunate hunting accident in the Wenatchee National Forest. Jameson's second wife, Jenna Clark, has declined to comment on the discovery of her husband's third mate. The question is now posed. Just how many fated mates does each werewolf have? Carter scrolled to the third article from 2011 tagged with Jameson Clark's name. It was an obituary for Jameson's second wife, Jenna. Jenna Clark, second wife and supposed second luminary of the reclusive Jameson Clark, surrendered to her 22-year battle with a rare form of cancer that infects the blood cells of werewolves. She was a doting wife and mother to the couple's five children. She lived her life fighting for werewolf equality and founded the Clark Foundation for Lone Wolves, the organization provides financial security for wolves who lose their luminaries. She was 66 years old. What the hell was going on? Three faded mates? How was that possible? Was the guy crazy, as the article suggested? Or did he know something that others didn't? Thanks to the Bureau's contact system, he pulled up Jameson Clark's address and jotted it to his phone. Knock, knock. He jumped as Faith strode into his office. Jesus, Faith, what are you doing here? She dropped a giant paper bag on his desk. Feeding you? What kind of wife would I be if I didn't bring you dinner on nights you worked late? A wife on paper only? He sighed, but the food smelled delicious. His stomach growled, the traitorous thing. What's in the bag? Chinese. I was grocery shopping today. Did you know that your fridge is low? There's nothing in there but beer and butter. Anyway, I was stocking up at the store, was in the neighborhood, and thought I'd stop by to drop off food. 
She unloaded the white boxes onto his desk, though he didn't miss that she wouldn't look him in the eye. I would have cooked something from all the goodies I bought, but I don't think I'm ready for that yet. Hopefully by next week the classes will have paid off and I'll be cooking gourmet. Gourmet? From your cooking? He pushed aside his computer, grabbed a paper plate, and started scooping rice. You shouldn't be able to say those things in the same sentence. Kind of like the vows love and obey? They laughed together, and for the first time since before they slept together, it felt the way it had before. I signed up for a few cooking classes at the senior center, she said. It's mid-session, so I'll be behind the curve, but they let me join anyway. Wasn't that nice? Mm-hmm. They probably don't care when you join as long as you pay the full fee. He plopped chow mein and chicken and foil on his plate and dug in. Thanks for this. No problem. After making her own plate, she perched on the edge of the chair across from him. What are you working on? Nothing. He waved a fork near the computer screen. Well, not exactly nothing. I'll be busy for a few weeks checking into new leads on a cold case. She shoved her cheeks full. What kind of case? One where kooky old Jameson Clark might be able to shed some light on what the hell is going on between you and me. Dry business stuff. Time for a subject change before she kept prodding. How's your blog? Grinning, she stabbed a chunk of pork. Good. Better than good, actually. If things keep going this way, I might be able to pay for Dawson's Yale tuition myself. Really? Hell no, but if I say the words enough, maybe they'll come true. I can hope, right? She shoved the meat into her mouth. I joined an affiliate program where I put items on the sidebar that are linked to an online store. Every time someone buys through the link, I get a percentage. I've already made a couple hundred dollars. Great, right? That is great. He dropped his fork. You're well on your way. She smiled smugly. I'm still going to need you to help me pay for Dawson's tuition, but I might be able to pay you back sooner than I thought. Carter should have been thrilled for her. She was doing something she loved and experiencing early success with it. Instead, he couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness. As crazy and traditional as it sounded, he wanted to be the one providing for her. He wanted to be her rock, the one she came to when she needed something, anything. He wanted her to have independence and trust in her strength of body and mind. But he wanted her to need him, too. He was in too deep. Chapter 18 it had taken two long weeks for Carter to track down Jameson Clark. Those two weeks had been somewhat of a reprieve. If he hadn't had such an intense case to dive into, he might have obsessed over his wife, where she went during the day while he worked the road, what appointments she made, and whether or not she was going to wear that red sweater again. She was about to drive him crazy. Jameson Clark's case had come at a perfect time. While Carter had gotten a residence hit from the Wolfpack's computer system, Jameson's blue-shuttered house was vacant. Weeds had claimed the yard and the oak trees in front were in desperate need of a trim. Carter had gone to the post office and requested to know if a change of address form had been filed. It hadn't. Carter visited the house a second time and checked the mailbox. Empty. Either Jameson Clark didn't get mail or someone was picking it up for him. According to the Seattle Wolfpack system, Clark had lived at this address in the last year. Even if he'd told his friends and family about a sudden move, he'd still be getting junk mail. Parking in his usual spot down the street from Clark's residence, Carter killed the engine of his Tahoe and waited for someone to show up. It had been nearly two weeks of the same routine. The box was filling up, and he'd yet to see a single person show up to check the mail. His phone rang. Faith. He hated when she called. The fluttering feeling in his gut wouldn't go away until he drowned himself in his work again. Not to mention, she always wanted to talk about trivial, insignificant things. 
What color paint did you use on these walls? How do you defrost using the button on the microwave? How long have you been using the same lawn mowing service? Hey, Faith. Chicken or fish? Both? I'm not cooking both in one meal. Which do you like best? Her tone was much too chipper for a Monday morning, but he'd learned over the course of living with her for a few weeks that she was undeniably a morning person. After she had her coffee. Enough French vanilla creamer to drown Seattle. I was thinking chicken since we had fish a few nights ago. Yeah, chicken sounds good. Especially considering she'd burned the salmon to a crisp, and the sauce she'd poured over the top had curdled. It had been seasoned all wrong with much too lemon pepper. He'd eaten it anyway, chasing each bite with a gulp of water, and had told her it was delicious. He simply couldn't bear to watch her face fall when he told her how utterly inedible it was. If you're in the mood for salmon again, she said, I'll make it. Since she moved in, Carter found himself in the mood for a lot of things he hadn't been before. Crispy salmon wasn't one of them. A beat-up red pickup truck pulled into Jameson's driveway. Chicken's fine, Carter said, memorizing the license plate. But, uh, are you using a recipe this time or going off the cuff? I don't know, she said, drawing the words out. I'm thinking barbecue. That would work. Even if she seasoned the chicken with something strange, the smoke flavor would still save the meal. Sounds great, Faith. Thanks. I hate to run, but I've got to get to work. Wait, one more thing. I wanted to move a few dog training necessities from my place here so I wouldn't have to run back and forth on training days. And since Tracy is staying at my cabin, I thought it'd give her more room and back for... Fine, Carter interrupted. Move what you need. She should feel comfortable in the place she spent her days and nights. She'd already moved over her bedroom set and bags of clothes. A few dishes, a toaster, and blender... Why shouldn't she bring a few dog toys and things to help her with her work day? Okay, great, she said. Thanks. As she ended the call, Carter pocketed the phone and got out of the truck. A short, squatty werewolf with half a head of hair walked down the Clark's driveway and popped open the mailbox. Excuse me, Carter said as he approached the shifter, who gave off a strong scent of bacon. Are you Jameson Clark? The guy turned and leveled Carter with a pair of haunting green eyes. Who's asking? Carter Griffin. He pulled his badge out of his coat pocket. I'm from the Enforcement Bureau, and I wanted to ask you a few questions. Rolling his eyes, the werewolf peered into his mailbox, yanked out a handful of advertisement papers, a couple envelopes, and then slammed the lid closed. If it's about the mortgage with Wilder Financial... Tell Drake that the check's in the mail. I'm not here on the Alpha's business. Carter followed the wolf back up the drive and stopped on the lawn. I want to ask you about your rumored luminaries. Rumored? The wolf spun, facing Carter. Is that right? Yes, sir. I read a few articles about the three luminaries you reported having in the last hundred years. I wanted to ask you a few questions about how that came to be. You making notes for a pack newspaper? Going to write down how crazy I am? How I've become a recluse? I'm not writing a thing. Carter shoved his hands in his pockets. I'm here for personal reasons. Yet you whip out that badge like it's bureau business. You are Jameson Clark, correct? The wolf nodded, narrowing his eyes. How long have you been sitting in that truck waiting for me to show? Carter's lips twisted into a grin. Not long, almost two weeks. How long have you been married? Jameson tossed the mail onto the bench seat in his truck and pointed at Carter's ring. Not long enough to make a tan line yet. I'm guessing a month. Three weeks. Carter said, spinning the ring with his thumb. You? Jameson smiled, crossing his arms over his chubby chest. You know how long I've been married. 
You read the articles. You happily married, Officer Griffin? Of course, Carter fired. Are you? You didn't think about the question long enough before you answered. But I sense you gave the right one. Jameson dusted lint off his shoulder, and Carter got the feeling he liked playing games. I've been happy with every wife I've had. I've loved each one wholly with every part of my soul. How did that work, exactly? Carter felt his face scrunch. If you'd found your luminary, what made you think to look for a second or a third? Jameson took a giant step forward until they were standing chest to chest. You think I killed my first and second luminary? You think I shot Francine because I was in love with Jenna? You think I waited for Jenna to get cancer and then went and found Cynthia? Of course that's what you think. That's what you all think. I'm tired of the bullshit, the lies, the sideways glances that isolate us from the rest of the pack. Let me tell you something. If you do the math, you'll see the truth. Carter squared his shoulders and looked down at the short man in front of him. There was fire in his eyes and a spark of truth in his words. There had been something about the dates that caught Carter's attention from the start, though he couldn't pinpoint what it was. I read that Jenna was born a year after your first wife Francine died, Carter said. My wife passed away a few years ago. Twenty-five years ago, to be exact. The same year Faith had been born. Hope sang through Carter's veins, but he clamped down the emotion. No good came from hoping anything. Jameson backed against his trunk, the anger in his sewage green eyes simmering down. There's more to your story, isn't there? How did you know Jenna was your second luminary? That's a ridiculous question. Jameson laughed, the choking sound thick and staccato. How do you know? Because you want to provide for them, protect them, and love them with every fiber of your being. You feel just as strongly about them as you did for your first luminary. The pull is just as strong. Or in Faith's case, Carter thought, it was stronger. What about your second and third luminary? Carter asked. You had two at the same time. How is that possible? Like I said, do the math. Jameson glared. Jenna was born a year after Francine's death. When it was decided that my first luminary would be taken from my life too soon, fate must have intervened. And the year after my second wife was diagnosed with the rare form of cancer that strikes wolves, Cynthia was born. Jenna and I knew that she'd lose the battle with cancer from the moment I felt the pull to Cynthia. It was a difficult time for us. I can imagine... Carter's thoughts whirled as he tried to judge whether or not Jameson was full of shit. Thing was, he looked earnest. Once Cynthia came into our lives, Jenna dedicated the rest of hers to setting up a foundation that would take care of wolves who lost their luminaries, in the case they never found another. I remember reading about that. Not every wolf found his luminary. Ones who never did could never understand the agony of losing one. Starting a foundation to assist with the soul-wrenching grief was an unbelievably thoughtful thing to do. But what did this mean for Carter? The chemistry he'd had with his wife had waned almost from the start. Immediately after they'd bonded, their connection had started to fade. Would he and Faith end up the same way? Could he ever be enough for her? Carter had one last question for Jameson, one thing to ask that would determine if he and Faith could actually have a future, or if their chance at a relationship would fail before it began. Tell me, Jameson, were the pulls to each of the luminaries the same? I'm not sure my answer is going to be the one you're looking for. You might find a more suitable one within you. Jameson pulled a mint from his coat pocket, unwrapped it and popped it into his mouth. 
But my connection to Francine, my first wife, was by far the strongest of the three. After that, the pull grew weaker. It's still there, but has diluted down over time. Carter's chest deflated and his knees shook. If Jameson had the strongest pull to his first luminary, and each one after had been weaker, how could he and Faith ever have a chance to have a lasting relationship? He left Jameson's house and drove back to the office, turning up the radio to drown out his thoughts. Chapter 19 Carter tipped back his oversized mug and drained the last of his coffee. It had gone cold. He'd been at his desk for the last three hours, organizing files in the Wolfpack's database. He deleted duplicate files submitted by enforcers and backed up critical information on the pack's hard drive. Typing fast, Carter merged arrest records from the Seattle Wolfpack with others in the area. Portland, Sacramento, Lake Tahoe, and San Francisco, to name a few of the larger ones. Each of those packs had its own system, but as wolves moved from one pack to another, their records should have moved too. It was something their captain had been badgering the enforcers about. They talked about splitting up the task, but Carter had welcomed the large project. He'd been working on the merger for weeks, before his shift, after, long after. You still here? Nate said, peeking his head into Carter's office. Thought you left at five. No, I'm about to refill a second cup. Actually, if he counted, it was his fifth. Need something? Nate folded his arms over his chest and leaned against the doorframe. Nah, I just finished up the report on your little exhibition in front of those tourists. The captain kicked it back, said I needed to explain in more detail why I made a phone call to the zoo shortly after leaving Seward Park. Thanks for taking care of that, Carter said, opening up the internet. Did you make contact with a couple again? Worry prickled the hairs at the base of his neck, making them stand on end. Twice. Nate picked a piece of lint off his sports jacket. They're either happily clueless, or I'm better at my job than I thought. Could be both, Carter said, relief coating his nerves. You heading home? My wife is cooking something special tonight. The way Nate said the word, as if he pushed it out as a deep growl, made Carter wonder if he should be envious of what he and Paisley had. He wasn't. He was, however, slightly jealous of the special meal. Carter hadn't had a delicious, mouth-watering, home-cooked meal since he and Faith got married. What she lacked in culinary skills, she made up for in cuteness, though. Even when she screwed up, she was laid back and laughing, happy that she'd tried. They now had the number for Chinese food stuck to the fridge door. Sorry we missed the wedding, Carter said, though he really wasn't. How was it? Nate's eyes shadowed over to a matte black. It was perfect. Gourmet food, bold wine, open bar. And you should have seen Paisley. She was a vision. Looked like a million-dollar Barbie doll. I bet. Nate stared. The best part was the honeymoon, though. We didn't leave the suite for days. He grinned, though his eyes remained dark and unreadable. But I'm sure I don't need to tell you. You've gone through it twice. Speaking of, I didn't get the chance to congratulate you, either. How was your wedding in Victoria? The wedding had been surprisingly perfect, but the wedding night had been one big, horrible bust. It was perfect. Lie. Better than the first time around. Absolute truth. Hmm. Nate mumbled, his lips pressing into a tight line. That's good to hear. He tapped the door. Give Faith my best, would you? Carter nodded. Will do. Nate turned to leave, but stopped himself and then spun back around. One more thing, Carter. I know that you're married now and there's nothing to worry about, 
But if I don't say this, it'll bother me until I do. Carter sighed and shut down his computer. What is it, Nate? Paisley tells me you two had something special. That she loved you more than she'd ever loved anyone, and you broke her heart. They did? He had? And why the devil would she share that info with her new husband? Shock hammered through his system. He hadn't loved her, not even close. To what he felt for Faith, he finished. I had no idea, he said. What could he say? We've been over for ages. I know that. Nate adjusted his skinny black tie. And I don't think you have anything going on behind my back. Yet. But I saw the way the two of you were talking at the Owens' house. And I saw the disappointment in her face when she heard the news that you got married. Nate. Carter interrupted, putting up his hand to stop him. I'm not after your wife. You're not after her yet. Nate's body went rigid, nearly filling the doorway. I'm watching you, Carter. You won't get the detective position and my wife. Mark my words. He turned on his heel and left the office, leaving Carter stunned. What the hell had just happened? He felt reprimanded for doing something prematurely, something he had no intention of doing in the first place. It didn't make sense. I'm so tired of this bullshit, Carter said, and dived into organizing his desk drawers. Thanks for the help, Faith yelled to her cooking instructor as she exited the senior center. See you Wednesday. She tucked her casserole dish under her arm and headed to her car. Dinner would be late tonight, but Carter hadn't been getting home before 8 p.m. in weeks anyway. She thought he'd been avoiding her, but when she asked him about it straight up, he said that he wasn't. Instead of getting home early, he'd been putting tireless hours in at the office, working long and hard to get the detective position, he'd said. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays after her cooking classes, she made Carter plates and left them in the fridge. She waited up in bed, updating Humperdinck's progress on her blog, writing new posts, and answering comments on old ones. As soon as Carter's key turned in the lock, she listened for the refrigerator door. Every night, he'd eaten the food she left for him. She was either getting better at cooking, or he was minding his manners and wolfing down the food anyway. As she hopped in the car and headed to Carter's place, her phone buzzed with a reminder. Enforcement Bureau dinner one week from Sunday. How could she forget? She'd been planning the menu all this week to prepare for next, and practicing dishes to serve. She'd burned the casserole the first two times around, but this time, with the shelf's help, she'd gotten it right. She hoped. Before class, she'd even shopped for a dress to wear, a cute little black one with strappy sandals. The shoes were comfortable, and she'd gotten them for a screaming deal at the designer shoe outlet. After she pulled up to Carter's, Faith grabbed the casserole dish with one hand so she could grab her things with the other. She slung her purse over her shoulder and reached for the bag with her dress and shoes. All that was left to carry was a $15 bottle of layer cake, the perfect red wine pairing for the dish. Carefully, testing the weight of the bag, she slid the bottle inside. Hands full, she backed into the front door, slowly pushing it open. As she skirted through the foyer and living room, her grip loosened on the glass dish. Make it to the table, almost there. She rounded the corner into the kitchen. Her purse fell to her elbow, knocking her off balance. The dish twisted, tilted. The bag slid from her fingers. No, no, don't! As she raced through the entry into the kitchen, she saw Carter ahead, his back to her, earbuds in, oblivious to her presence. He swung the refrigerator door open, nailing her in the chest. She staggered back, clutching for the casserole. The dish wobbled, slipped, and crashed to the floor. The bag with the clothes and shoes, and oh God, the wine, slid out of her grip and landed on the tile with a glass-shattering bang. Jesus, Faith, are you all right? Carter slammed the fridge door closed and tugged out his earbuds. 
He stared like she'd sprouted three heads. What are you doing roaring through here like that? Cheese and chicken were everywhere. Her hair, her clothes, the floor. Good thing the dish hadn't been hot. From the bottom of the department store bag, a deep red stain pooled like blood. There goes dinner, she said, slapping her hands to her sides. He knelt and swiped his hands through the mess. Chicken casserole again? She nodded, and although she hated it, tears threatened to fall. She'd worked hard on dinner tonight. It took her an hour to get the right ingredients from the store. Another hour of prep, measuring things out just right. She was looking forward to seeing if she'd finally nailed it this time. If it's any consolation, he said, shrugging. I didn't care for the first two attempts. This one was going to be different. It could have been great. It could have had class. He glowered up at her, raising a fist. It could have been a contender. Oh, stop. You're a horrible Marlon Brando. And the movie wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Faith huffed, struggling to hide her frustration, and pushed her hair behind her ears. You remember it? Of course I do. She picked chicken out of her hair and flung it to the floor. It wasn't that long ago that you picked it for our movie night. He stood, staring. I thought you'd fallen asleep. I did, twice. But I saw enough to know it didn't deserve an Academy Award. Ripping a towel off the counter, she bent to her hands and knees and started cleaning up the mess. What are you doing here anyway? Tension coiled through the air like a whip. I pay the mortgage. Carter growled from low in his throat, the way he had when they were tangled in sheets at the Monarch. I'm pretty sure I can be here whenever I want. The temperature in the kitchen skyrocketed as Faith got the feeling he was staring at the back of her head. You okay? She looked at him over her shoulder. What's wrong? Nothing. His jaw ticked, clenching and unclenching as he stared at the cabinets above the stove. Why would you question me being home? I'm here every night, aren't I? I meant, what are you doing home so early? She continued scrubbing the mess. You never make it for dinner. Call it a bad day. He huffed from behind her, the sound short and irritated. An epically bad day. I'd offer you a warm dinner and a glass of wine to take the edge off, but... She stood to face him. Unless you want to eat off the floor with Humperdinck, I'm out of options. You know what? That actually sounds like a great idea. He rolled up his sleeves, revealing the ink lacing his wrist. Why don't you go change into something not... smelling like cheesy fowl, and I'll clean up the mess. We'll eat on the back lawn. That sounded amazing. She'd been eating alone at the kitchen table too many nights with late-night reality television, her only companion. Maybe she and Carter could finally break the rut they were in, and he'd stop avoiding her like the plague. I'm in, she said. But what's on the menu? He strode into the kitchen and dug around for a pot. I'll cook. You change. Meet me out back in 25. Carter cooked? How'd she not know that about him? His kitchen was spacious, with stainless steel appliances, glossy black cabinets, and sand-toned granite counters. The perfect setup for someone who enjoyed cooking. But the refrigerator and cabinets were sparse, and the counters were barren. Time to see what the hunk could do. She saluted him with flimsy fingers. You got it, chief. As she turned into the living room, Faith got the heart-lifting feeling that the storm brewing between them was about to clear. They'd eat on the back lawn, drink wine, and laugh about how stupid they'd been. She'd talk about her cooking classes and how she almost burned down the senior center when she left a batch of cookies in the oven at too high a temp for far too long. He'd talk about work and the case that had him twisted into knots. They'd come inside when it got dark and watch a movie like every other Friday night. She'd even let him watch on the waterfront and pretend to be Marlon Brando again if he wanted. This was going to work. They'd finally be friends again. 
She scratched her head as the F word struck her as funny. Why'd the word friends feel so wrong? The doorbell rang. Got it, Faith said, and checked her appearance in the mirror on the coat rack before opening the door. She almost laughed at the sight. Strings of dried cheese in her hair, wet meat sauce covering her chest and arms, and an embarrassed blush flushing her cheeks marinara red. She swung open the door. Paisley. The name whooshed out of her. What are you doing here? The model flipped her fine layers of golden hair over her shoulder. I'm looking for Carter. Is he here? Yes, he's in the kitchen, but... Thank you, sweetheart, Paisley interrupted, pushing inside and heading to the kitchen. Carter, can I talk to you for a second? It's about the bureau. I guess. He peeked his head around the corner. Is Nate with you? No, just me. Paisley's voice was so high and sweet it gave Faith a headache. All right. He disappeared into the kitchen once more. Watch your step through the entry. Freak casserole accident. Pursing her lips, Faith watched Paisley charge toward the sound of Carter's voice, her size two hips swinging like she was trying to break them off. She'd probably gotten her sexy swagger from years of sashaying down the catwalk and her rail-thin Barbie figure from years of starving herself, no doubt. Come in, Faith mimicked the perfect hostess, playing out how the scene should have gone. Smiling wide, she stepped aside to allow the guest to enter, though Paisley was long gone. Make yourself at home. It's so great of you to come. May I take your coat? she said to no one. Faith stood at the entry to the hallway on the opposite side of the modestly decorated living room, watching Paisley Brooks Ramsey step over the casserole catastrophe and disappear into the kitchen. Instead of bolting for her bedroom to change into dry clothes, what any normal person would have done, Faith leaned against the wall into the shadows, out of sight, and listened. Carter dumped a can of corn and a sliver of butter into the pot on the stove and stirred. He couldn't cook, but he could fake it. What's this about? Please don't let it be about what Nate was worried about. Paisley opened the fridge and bent to peer inside. I like the married you. You've got chick food. Vegetables, vitamin water, special K bars. Who would have thought? She took out a bottle of Stella Artois and wagged it around. Bottle opener? So you're solo tonight. Carter took it out of the drawer and set it on the counter. Does Nate at least know you're here? Of course not. He'd blow a gasket. What he doesn't know won't hurt him. She popped the top of her beer and drank. Why do you want the detective position, Carter? He got to work prepping the indoor grill for steaks. That's why you're here, to determine if I really want the job. Relief soared through him. Nate had been wrong about his wife. Clearly, she'd gotten over Carter. The disappointment he claimed to have read on her face when she discovered he'd gotten married must have been misinterpreted. Tell Nate I've dreamed of working the position since I started in the department, Carter said and I've worked my ass off to get to this point. I deserve it every bit as much as he does. I'm not here on his behalf. She tapped her boot heel against the base of the cabinets. So you want the job even though you'll be working long hours away from home? Your wife is okay with it? He threw the meat on the grill and seasoned the steaks with garlic, salt, and pepper and zoned. Where was she going with this? I mean, you're newly married to that fragile wife of yours, she said, coming to stand next to him. She reeked a floral perfume, lavender and something spicy. He fought the urge to sneeze. Won't she worry when you're running late at the office or being swept away to bureau functions that last an entire weekend? She's not fragile, Carter corrected. She's not like us. She leaned back against the counter, 
arching back slightly to accentuate the perkiness of her silicone breasts. They looked new. She's not confident in her sexuality and her ability to keep a partner happy. How did the conversation veer into inappropriate territory so quickly? If I'm not mistaken, you're newly married too. Are you going to feel the same way if Nate gets the position and is gone from home long hours? I think I might get lonely from time to time. Her red lips pursed as she curled her lips around the neck of the bottle. She took a slow drink, measuring him, before she whispered, I'm here to see if there is something I could do to take care of that. He got the message loud and clear, only there was no zinging response to the words, no excitement at the possibility of getting in bed with Paisley again, or sneaking around behind his competition's back. Three months ago, hell, three weeks ago before he'd proposed to Faith, he might have jumped at the chance to have something physical with Paisley. So long as she wasn't married, of course. That's all it would have been, physical. But it would have been fun. Now there was nothing. No desire to take her up on her offer, even if it was something thrilling behind the scenes. Something had definitely changed. A thumping sound came from the direction of the hallway. Carter strode around the wall, separating the kitchen from the living room. Faith? His sweet little roommate was the reason things were suddenly different. He couldn't deny it. She was getting under his skin, and damn if he didn't like it. If she would stop making it so difficult for him, bending over to scrub the floor or wearing those soft sweaters every day, he might actually have a chance at resisting her. Be right out, she hollered from her room. Good, she hadn't heard what Paisley had said. For a second there, he thought that she might have been eavesdropping on their conversation. That could have been bad. I think you should go. He took Paisley's beer from the counter and tossed it in the recycle bin, then flipped the stakes so they wouldn't burn. I won't tell Nate that you were here as long as you never ring my doorbell again. She tilted her head to the side, studying him. Her blonde hair fell over her shoulder, and her eyes gleamed a sparkly shade of blue. The woman would be beautiful if she wasn't so deceitful, but snakes often had the most beautiful design on their scales. I'm telling you now, Carter, when that wife of yours starts feeling lonely, she'll look for other things to keep her busy, too. We're women, she shrugged. It's in our nature. Don't say I didn't warn you. He didn't have to worry about Faith cheating or how that would affect him, because he wasn't going to let her get that close to him. He wouldn't give her the chance to hurt him the way his ex-wife had. They were friends. They'd be divorced once he settled into the job, she'd move out, and things would go back to the way they were before. A spike of something cold and bitter struck him in the gut. After Paisley left, Carter laid out a red flannel blanket on the back lawn. The cold feeling remained, spreading to his hands and feet. He lit a few of the torches lining the grass and set the plates down, and then rubbed his hands together to bring the feeling back. When Faith didn't join him, he went back inside to see how much more time she needed to get ready. He knocked on her bedroom door. No answer. Faith? He liked her being so close, a few doors down rather than a few football fields away. Dinner's ready. Why couldn't he ditch the hollow feeling in his stomach? This wasn't a date, though he had to admit he'd set it up as if it was. He cast a glance back at the yard. Wine, flickering lanterns, a blanket to keep them warm on a chilly night. Who was he kidding? He totally set this up as if he was trying to impress her. What the hell did that mean, anyway? That's not what he wanted, was it? Eat without me, Carter, she called, her voice weaker than he'd ever heard it. I'm not feeling well. He tried the handle. Locked. You sure? Yeah, I'm going to bed. Long, agonizing pause. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. 
Her voice cracked. He felt the terror in his chest. Chapter 20 Dogs are foragers by nature, Faith wrote on the day's post for Have a Little Faith. They evolved from canines who scavenged for food in the early settlements. For this reason, dogs will often eat anything they sniff out, whether that be delicious or rotten food, crumbs on the kitchen floor, dryer sheets, or even poison. Gulping down a white mocha she'd picked up from Starbucks on the way home, Faith gazed out over Carter's backyard. His house backed a few acres of forest. The towering trees provided shade and protection from the dusting rainstorm that had blanketed the city the last few days. She hadn't talked to Carter much since Paisley had shown up. He'd made it sound like they were long over, with no hope of getting back together from either side. But he'd been mistaken. Or he'd lied so Faith wouldn't know the truth. It was clear Paisley still had feelings for Carter, sexual, sleazy, or otherwise. How could Faith compare to the flawless blonde bombshell? If the woman really turned on the charm, or if Faith wasn't in the next room over, she couldn't compare. Simple as that. She had absolutely no right to be jealous. None at all. But jealousy didn't listen to reason. Rain pattered against the windows, dragging Faith back to her computer. Men are the same as dogs. They truly are. She typed away, talking as she went. When they hit a sexual drought, they'll bark up any skirt. Doesn't matter if that skirt is on a bimbo, ex-girlfriend, wife of a colleague, or all three rolled into one slutty ball. She deleted the last few lines, though she would have killed to keep them. Instead, she wrote, Because of their inherent scavenging nature, dogs, not men, we need to teach our pets what is good to eat and when to leave something bad or poisonous alone. Today our topic is teaching your dog the leave it alone command. Oh, if men could train as easily. She continued to type. Your command can be drop it, leave it, or away, whichever suits you. How about keep your hands off the blonde tramp? She laughed as her thoughts dashed to buying Carter a shock collar. Yeah, that'd work on Carter just fine. What would work on me? He said from the doorway. Her heart raced and she looked up. You scared me. I thought you'd left for work already. I'm staying late again tonight, so I don't have to go in until noon. He sat in the leather chair across from her. What are you working on? how to teach dogs to leave things alone. He kicked up his feet on the desk and crossed them at the ankles. So how do you do it? Are you really interested or really bored? Both? He laughed. To be honest, I can see how much work you've been putting into this blog thing, and I'd like to hear more about it. This blog thing? as if writing a dog blog was a geeky adolescent phase that she'd suddenly recover from. Should she tell him now or later that the ads she'd placed on the sidebar had made her almost a thousand dollars since she'd put them up? She hadn't met with Mr. Winchester to hear his proposal yet either, though they'd set up a rendezvous next week, the afternoon after the bureau dinner. Well, she said, talking as she typed, you need two kinds of biscuits. One kind should be dry and bland, something the dog wouldn't really desire but would eat if there wasn't anything else available. The other kind of biscuit should be bacon-flavored and juicy, something the dog would naturally enjoy. Carter nodded, pretending to follow along, but he was probably bored out of his gourd. Put the dry biscuit on the floor, she said, and the dog will go after it. You'll want to cover it with something heavy, your shoe being the best option. Because the dog is a scavenger, it will fight to get the biscuit from beneath your foot. It'll probably cry and beg, paw and scratch. But eventually, when it realizes it can't get what it wants, it'll back off. That's when you offer the juicy biscuit. The poor dog, Carter said. You're just teasing it with the dry biscuit. 
Faith looked up from her computer screen. No, it doesn't really want the dry one at all. How do you know? His brow looked puzzled. Maybe the dog prefers dry biscuits over bacon-flavored. The dog only thinks it wants the dry biscuit because it doesn't think it can get a better one. They're opportunistic feeders. Carter slid his feet off the desk and leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. Things must have been getting heavy. He had his serious stone-set face on. What happens after you tease the pooch? Rolling her eyes, Faith continued. You reward the back-off or leave-it behavior. You give the dog the bacon biscuit and say the keyword you've chosen, whether it's off or away or leave it. The first time, you'll say the word during the act or slightly afterward. After this, you'll say the command and expect compliance. You'll continue to do the routine 10 to 15 times, or until the dog's behavior leans solidly toward waiting for the bacon biscuit rather than scrambling for the one it shouldn't eat. This bullshit really works? Carter laughed. You're torturing the poor dog who knows what he wants. Why not just give him the dry one? Because, once again, the only reason he was interested in the first place was because it was in front of him, not because it's what he prefers. What if the dog is tired of bacon biscuits? What if he's had them over and over again and wants something different? Carter's smile fell and an odd shadow crossed his face. What if the dog realizes too late what's best for him? What then? Carter, are you all right? Hmm? He seemed to snap out of some kind of daze. I'm fine. I just think you're torturing the dog for no reason. If he wants the dry biscuit, let him have it. She sipped on her drink. That's not the point of the exercise. It's how to teach dogs to leave things alone. Other species of animals could use similar training. Take that, Casanova. So that's it, then? He said. Torment the animal and move on? No. She shook her head and took another drink. You move the exercise to the park or on his next walk. You increase the temptation and remove the shoe over it. You leave something on the sidewalk that the dog really wants. So when you go for your morning walk, you say the word you've been using to keep the dog under control. He seemed to chew over her words. Humperdinck's improving, I've been meaning to tell you. I can walk by him now without his tiny fluffy legs attaching to the toe of my boot. Are you using the biscuit strategy to teach him to leave my shoes alone? Partly, she grinned. Humperdinck and I have a lot of work to do. He frowned. Why'd you say it like that? Like what? That you both have a lot of work to do. Both. She shrugged. I'd like to be a juicy biscuit to someone someday. You? He cleared his throat and pounded on his chest as if something was stuck. I think you're juicy enough. Her cheeks flushed hot. His gaze shifted to the back lawn, the desk, the floor. I have to hit the gym before heading to work. Okay, she said, but he'd already scampered out of the office. He just said she was juicy. Was he toying with her, flirting as he always did? Or did he mean it? Stupid! She slammed her head on her desk. If he meant it, he would have stayed in their bed in the Monarch. He would have made a move before now. She'd been sleeping two doors down from him for the last three weeks, for Christ's sake. Now that she thought about it, why wasn't he trying harder to get into her pants? He wasn't the alpha of their wolf pack, but he exhibited serious alpha qualities. He was possessive and rugged, powerful and strong, and he'd made only two attempts to get her between the sheets. The first time he told her he didn't want her, and the next he'd run to the bathroom like his balls were on fire. Even the dogs she trained would paw after a dry biscuit if it sat in the room next to them for weeks on end. She didn't exactly want Carter to paw at her. Okay, she totally did, 
but it'd be nice to turn down his advances rather than wonder why they weren't there in the first place. She's not like us, Paisley's words ran through her head. She's not confident in her sexuality and her ability to keep a partner happy. I'm the dry biscuit, she whispered to herself. Wonderful reality check. Thank you very much, Barbie Paisley. Luckily, there were options to change her bland biscuit status, and Paisley would lack class forever. And she really did want to be someone's juicy biscuit someday. She would have given her right arm to be Carter's juicy biscuit, but it looked like that wasn't in the stars anymore. She could exercise at home when Carter was at work. There had to be dancing videos available. Was Paula Abdul still around? The Taibo guy? Jane Fonda? God, had it really been that long since she'd worked out? She pulled up Amazon on the internet and punched Fun Sexy Physical Fitness into the search bar. Zumba, pole dancing, portable pole included, an extensive 12-week program called Intensity D60Z. Things in the fitness world had really changed. There were so many options, so many things that looked surprisingly fun. I'll show you confident. She tossed her mocha into the trash. I'll be the juiciest bacon biscuit in the Pacific Northwest. Chapter 21 What's taking you so long, Faith? Carter tightened his bow tie in the bathroom mirror and brushed a piece of lint off the lapel of his penguin suit. It's nearly six o'clock. They'll be here any minute. Are you ready? The captain and the other members of the bureau were never late. I told you, I'm coming. He charged through the living room into the kitchen. She'd put dinner in the oven, chicken casseroles from the smell of them, bread on the counter, and dessert in the fridge. He checked all of those things, twice, to make sure everything was ready to roll. He arranged a line of wine glasses that were already perfectly straight and twisted a few wine bottles so their labels pointed out. Something bumped against his shoe. Damn it, Humber. The black and white furball sat beside his shoe, staring up at him, his tiny tongue lolling out of his mouth. Look at that. You're not humping. He picked up the pooch and gave him a good scratch under the neck. You're kind of cute when you aren't acting like a freak. Some could say the same about you. He turned and lost his breath. Faith stood in the doorway wearing a 1950s-style emerald green dress that reached mid-calf. The dress was simple, satin, thick straps. It accented her curves perfectly, hugging her body at the waist, flaring at the hips, with twisty, turvy fabric bunched at her breasts. Whoever designed the cocktail dress was a genius. As his gaze rose to her face, he bit back a gasp. Your hair, it's... Red. Although most of it was pulled up, she bounced a thick crimson curl in the palm of her hand, acting the part of a 50s starlet. Crazy, right? I haven't been back to my natural color in years. He couldn't breathe. He sat humperding down and flipped the switch on the vent above the stove to make sure it wasn't sucking air from the room. What made you choose tonight to do it? He asked when everyone would be staring at her. I realized I was tired of trying to be someone else, of trying to impress someone else, when the only person who really matters is me. She smiled, lighting the room, and I like my hair red best. He absolutely agreed. You look stunning, worth every hour you made me wait. He closed the distance between them, stopping just short of pressing against her. Did I ever tell you that when I was growing up, my favorite cartoon character was Jessica Rabbit? No. She looked up at him, laughter and curiosity in her eyes. You didn't? That's what I was going to tell you at the Monarch, during our shots game of Star Trek. He slid his hand along the natural bend of her waist. You always had the curves, but now, with the hair. 
He blew out an exaggerated Roger Rabbit whistle. You're a spitting image. She whacked his hand away. No touchy-feely for you tonight, Casanova. At least not until the Bureau gets here. His heart sped, and Carter got the unmistakable feeling that its rhythm was matching hers. You are still my wife, remember? As Faith scurried around, making last-minute adjustments, Carter escaped to the restroom to catch his breath. The longer he was around her, the harder it was to keep his composure. His hands wanted to reach for her. His mouth yearned to cover hers. His feet moved to be near her. It was as if the wolf part of him, somehow linked to the physical part, was determined to be with Faith, no matter what the logical part of him said. He'd been spending long hours at the Bureau to lessen the pull, but it wasn't working. He'd reopened cold cases, reworked details. He'd cleaned the break room. He'd organized filing cabinets and color-coded their werewolf registration system again. And again, simply so he would stay busy and away from home until after Faith went to sleep. Over the last week, they'd seen each other 30 minutes a day, an hour tops. Each time it was in passing, and each time she seemed to get more beautiful. It wasn't the few pounds she was shedding that had caught his eye. He'd noticed the exercise videos piled next to the television and moved into new positions by morning. It was the confidence she exuded. It reminded him of the first bureau dinner, when Tracy glammed her up and she said she was determined to put on a show. Only this time, he could tell the confidence was real. It was more than the clothes or the makeup and hair. It went deep, and it was damn sexy. The doorbell rang. Before he exited the bathroom, Carter took a deep breath. Under the watchful eye of the bureau was the only time he could palm the small of Faith's back to lead her into a room, the only time when he could hold her hand at dinner. He could stare at her from across the room and admire how beautiful she looked. He might even be able to whisper it in her ear. It's showtime, he said, and then walked out to greet the captain. Faith felt great, better than she had in ages, and the party was a hit. The soreness from the intensity workout had finally worn off yesterday. She could sit now without moaning and falling onto her hip. For the first time since she'd met the members of the Bureau, Faith felt like she could talk to them, as if they were somehow equal to her. Perhaps deep down, beneath the badges and stuffy humor, they were. Carter spent the first twenty minutes of the party on the back deck with the captain. Other Bureau members and their partners had arrived, some familiar faces from Vancouver Island, including a few new others. Nate Ramsey arrived solo, thank goodness, and apologized that Paisley wouldn't be attending. Apparently, she'd eaten some bad fish from the market and was under the weather. Poor thing. Faith focused on the floor. Man, could it use a good waxing. So no one would see her smile. As she served a full glass of wine to Mrs. Owens, who smiled and thanked her like a fellow Stepford wife should, Carter swept through the double doors, bringing in gusts of wind with him. Weaving around bureau members, Carter locked his gaze on hers. For a second, she thought she'd done something wrong. He embodied heat, raw and intense, as he patted someone on the shoulder and brushed by, holding her captive with those icy blue eyes. Can I talk to you? He asked, walking straight past her and into the living room. Sure. She smiled and set down the serving tray, nodding to Mrs. Owens. I'll be right back. Take your time, dear. The living room was warm thanks to the fire lit in the stone hearth in the corner. But Faith got an odd chill when she walked behind Carter. He faced the fire, his hands gouging into the spine of the couch. As if taking a silent cue, the few bureau members in the living room disappeared into the kitchen. Once they were alone, Faith touched his back. Are you all right? What happened? Carter spun around and pushed her back against the wall. She squealed, giddy with excitement as he smiled and cupped her chin in his hands. We did it, he said, 
his goofy grin reaching ear to ear. Did what? He brushed his cheek against hers and whispered, The captain offered me the position. He did? She screamed. That's... He silenced her with a kiss, melting her thoughts to goo. His lips pulled into a smile over her mouth. She smiled right back. A teeny, tiny, and very annoying voice in the back of her head screeched about not kissing her husband. But he got the job. This called for a celebratory kiss. And just one couldn't hurt. He wants to petition the Alpha to open another spot for Nate. He whispered. But for now, it's only me. He palmed the wall on either side of her head, his hips pressed against hers. He told me not to tell anyone, but I couldn't go another second without telling you. I'm so glad you did. Why was she suddenly out of breath? So, what now? There's a promotional ceremony in Wallace Falls State Park during the next full moon, with guests attending in wolf form, pack tradition. The Alpha and his family will be there, along with the existing members of the Bureau and anyone else from the pack who is interested in attending. He looked like he was about to burst out of his skin. The captain said he noticed how many hours I've been clocking in at the office lately. Yeah, she said. You've been working nonstop. Keeping one hand on the wall above her head, he placed the other on her stomach. She quivered down deep in her belly as she looked up at him and anticipated the feel of his mouth over hers. He stared down at her through his thick lashes, blinking slowly. You did it, he said, his voice filled with reverence. You really pulled this off. I don't know what I'd do without you. Probably live a miserable, lonely existence, she joked, though he didn't laugh when she did. You have no idea how right you are. Before she knew what happened, his lips touched hers, a caress that scattered goosebumps over her entire body. He was tender and careful, his lips urging hers apart without any demand. She pressed her hands against his chest and opened her mouth for him. But he didn't take the offer. He kissed her again and again, open-mouthed and full of affection. His fingers tangled in her hair, traipsed down her neck. Between the last time she kissed him and now, something changed. She couldn't pinpoint it, but she felt the shift rooted in her belly. He wasn't lusting after her body. She got the very real, very startling feeling that he was trying to connect with her on a much more intimate level. He pulled back, his forehead resting against hers. He seemed to be having as difficult a time finding air as she was. How can this fade? His voice was deep and raspy, barely audible. He has to be mistaken. What? She frowned. Who? I don't understand. Ahem, someone said from the entry beside them. Hate to intrude, but the oven timer's been going off for two minutes and no one can figure out how to turn it off. Got it, Faith said, dropping her hands from Carter's abs. Can you, uh, she said to Carter, check on Humperdinck? He's been quiet. He nodded and then disappeared into the hallway as Faith served dinner. When he returned to the dining room, they started on the casseroles. They were culinary perfection. Watch out, Rachel Ray. The dessert, chocolate souffle scooped into individual cups, was a total hit. Two bureau wives asked for the recipe after scarfing them down, which Faith handed over in exchange for a few of their own tried-and-true recipes. After dinner, bureau members laughed and chatted in the living room, kitchen, and dining room. Nate and the captain spent over an hour in the study, probably talking about bureau business. Faith stayed in her heels as long as she could, but when midnight rolled around, she tossed them beside the couch and slipped on her bumblebee slippers. Carter was on cloud nine, buzzing from one group to another. They seemed to accept him into their fray, 
patting him on the shoulder, smiling when he said something funny and shaking his hand. She'd never seen him this happy. Everybody was getting what they wanted from this marriage deal, Faith thought. Carter had landed the job of his dreams, Dawson was going to Yale, and she was... What was she getting again? Oh, yeah. She was getting a fake marriage to the guy of her dreams and a quickie divorce. She'd almost forgotten. As the unevenness of the picture became clear, a dull ache settled in Faith's chest. Chapter 22 Thanks for coming, Carter said to the last bureau member as they strode out the front door. See you bright and early tomorrow morning. Faith stood beside him at the front door, waving to the last couple as they turned out of the drive. He put his arm around her waist and tugged her against him. You don't have to do that, she said, looking up at him. They can't see us from there. I know. He placed his hand on her hip. But sometimes you have to act on impulse and do what feels natural. I don't know what feels natural anymore, she said. She spun out of Carter's grasp and moved through the house toward the kitchen. There'd be a mess to clean, and she didn't want to leave it until morning. Behind her, the front door slammed shut and heavy steps rained over the hardwood. Carter leaped over the couch and landed in a crouch in front of her. Go running with me he said, his eyes wild with excitement. Those fitness tapes might have given you the wrong idea. She kinked her head to the table, not amused. I'm not a runner. You are in wolf form. He shot her a big, goofy grin and nudged his chin at the window leading to the backyard. Run with me. His enthusiasm was irritating, grating on her nerves. He was acting like one of the pups she'd just written about on her blog. A bull mastiff puppy with enough energy to fuel the city of Seattle. They were irresistibly cute, but relentless, able to wear down defenses with a sideways loll of their tongue. She tried to get by him, but he jumped in front of her. I can't stay cooped up inside on a night like this. I just got the job of my life, and I feel like stretching my legs. The moon is full. The forest back there is about two miles long and provides enough cover to protect us from being spotted by the neighbors. He spread his arms wide. Come on, you can hang upside down from a zip line when a concierge encourages you, but you can't run with your best friend in the rain? Best friend, wonderful. At least it was a good reminder of where she stood. Fine, one run. Faith elbowed him in the gut and took off into the kitchen, out the screen door and into the rain. She had kicked off her bumblebee slippers at the door, then lifted the front of her dress and ran down the slope of his lawn toward the tree line. He was at her side seconds later, pushing through the trees alongside her. The pines were tall and thick, providing cover from the bulk of the storm, though drops of rain continued to fall through the canopy above. Streams of moonlight broke through the limbs and slanted over Carter's face. Holding her gaze, he shifted into wolf form. He crouched as his muscles bulked up, filling his tux. Seams ripped. His coat and shirt fell away, revealing his tattoo-covered chest and chiseled abs. As his lips quirked into a devious smile, his whole body shook, completing the transition. He dropped to all fours. His back hunched and a silky coat of black fur covered his muscles. Following his lead, Faith glanced up at the moon, feeling its energy snake through her. She closed her eyes, the warm, shifting vibration singing through her blood. After a glorious shake, dark fur blanketed her skin and she lowered herself to the ground. It wasn't until Carter winked at her through wide blue eyes that she realized she'd never seen him in wolf form. He was magnificently powerful, the crest of his back reaching over five feet, his fur silky and midnight black. She longed to run her fingers through it and cup his furry cheek in her hand. Catch me if you can, he said through the pack's process of mind speak. He pawed the ground, bumped into her, and sprinted through the trees. 
Oh, I'll catch you, she answered back, regaining her footing. You may be bigger, but I'm quicker. She proved it, catching him before he'd bounded through the first quarter mile. It was freeing running through the section of forest this way, the moon over their heads lighting the path, the rain drizzling over their fur. They ran side by side for what felt like miles, though when she glanced back, she spotted the lights in his house twinkling back at them. They hadn't gone too far. She stopped, panting. He slowed his pace and circled around back to her. Why are you stopping? His eyes twinkled like stars. Something wrong? No, she shook her head. Everything's perfect. Too bad it couldn't stay this way. As he strode back to her side, he shifted back to human form, his fur flattening to tan, glistening skin, the tattoos on his chest and arms coming to light once more. Buck naked, he walked toward her unafraid, a soft gleam in his eyes. He reached out and stroked the fur covering her ears. It can stay this way, he said. He'd hurt her? She hadn't realized she'd projected the thought. Letting the tingles of the shift roll through her, Faith closed her eyes and focused her energy on the shift back to human form. She shuddered and shook, relishing the feel of her fur smoothing to skin. You want me to move in with you permanently so we can do this once a month? She joked, pulling back. I don't know, maybe. He reached out and stroked her cheek this time grazing rain-slicked skin. I wish you could know what you'd do to me. Even though she was cold and shivering and wanted to hide behind the tree so he wouldn't see every exposed inch of her, she planted her hand on her hip. She wasn't falling for this again. She wouldn't and she couldn't. No more hiding. No more giving in to his seduction only to be left cold and alone. She lifted her chin in defiance against the fluttering in her chest. You mean what I do to you in this moment? This one. He kissed her cheek. The next one. He kissed the tip of her nose. And the one after that. She shivered, defenses wavering. How do I know you're not just going to leave me in the rain when you tire of me, the way you did before? God, is that what you think? That I'm tired of you? My leaving was never about you at all, Faith. He ghosted his hands over her hair. It was about me. And whatever gripped me before, keeping me from being with you the way I wanted to, has left me now. I can't stay away from you a second longer. And then he caught her mouth in a kiss that tingled down to her toes. She wrapped her arms around his neck, buried herself in his lips, drenched herself in his scent. He lifted her off her feet and pressed her back against the tree. He moaned against her mouth as skin met skin. You're hot, he said, breathless. She laughed, defenses down. Thanks? No, I mean you're hot, burning up. He brushed his hands down her arms. You should be cold. Why, so you could keep me warm? He coiled his arms around her waist and squeezed her against him. Her breasts smashed against his chest, and something very hard swelled against her stomach. She went damp at the feel of him. Would that be so bad? He asked. I don't need a man to take care of me. No, you certainly don't. Sliding down her body... He knelt in front of her and spread her legs. But if you want me to, I'd be happy to take the job. Holding her gaze, he licked a hot line up her center. She jerked, sucking in a clipped breath and grabbed fistfuls of his hair. I should have savored you from the start, he said, running his hand between her legs. I always knew you were sweet. I should have known you'd be sweet everywhere. Her hips bucked as he delved between her legs, moving his mouth as if he was kissing her. He sucked and licked, slipping his tongue in and out of her. When she sagged against the tree, he held her up, 
and when she came apart in undulating waves, he groaned hungrily, feasting on her core. Don't leave, she said, grasping at his shoulders. If you say you're going to leave, I swear I'll... Shh. He kissed her, plunging his tongue past her lips. He tasted like male spice and red wine mixed with a tiny hint of her own sex. I'm not going anywhere. The moment was magical. The rain and wind, the bark against her back, and the man ravishing her front. The way he was gazing at her with a surprising sense of awe. She never wanted it to end. He slid his hand down her leg and hiked it up, tilting her hips. She gasped as he slid up her body, entering her in a single shattering stroke. Her vision blurred and her head fell back. You're amazing, he breathed, slowing his pace. You feel? Mm-hmm. With her mumble of words, the sky broke. Rain sluiced through the trees, drenching their bodies as they rocked together in a blissful rhythm. He held her head so it wouldn't scrape the bark behind her, kneaded her breasts tenderly without the raging lust that existed before. He loved her. As the words came together in his head, he laid her down on a grassy bed beneath the nearest tree. Out of instinct, she started to roll away from him. No. He touched her side, dragging her flat onto her back. I want to see you when you come. He braced her back as she lay down, and then settled between her hips. Faith, he said as he slipped inside her. You're so beautiful, and you're so... He thrust harder, fuller, stretching the inner walls of her sex to the limit. Deep. He smiled, holding himself up with his arms as he drove into her heat again and again. And when her second orgasm hit... He caught her cry with a smoldering kiss. His eyes fluttered shut as he drove inside her, deeper, completely, filling her with more love than she'd ever felt. Love. The word bore into her chest and nestled against her heart. He didn't have to say it. His feelings were in his touch, his gaze, his mouth. As the crescendo rose, he gazed down at her. Feeling the pressure rise once more, she clutched at his shoulder and raked her fingers down the grooves of his abs. You're everything, he breathed, his entire body clenching as if into a fist. Everything I've ever wanted. Then take me. She kissed him, her hands on either side of his face, her hips moving in time with his. She'd never felt more complete more in love. I'm yours. She'd like to think it was the love flowing through their mouths that brought Carter over the edge. His thrusts became jagged and lost their rhythm. He cried out her name, and with one last forceful stroke, he filled her with everything he had to give. Chapter 23 Faith was nearly skipping by the time she stepped over the curb in front of Starbucks, a permanent smile etched on her face. She and Carter had stayed up all night, wrapped in each other's arms. After making love a second time, she had fallen into a light sleep, only to be roused by the softest of touches on her brow. Each time she dozed off, she'd wake up with the feel of Carter's hand on the dip of her hip, her stomach, her hair. When she awakened in the morning, she felt treasured, nurtured, like an angel. She was madly in love with her husband. There was no denying it now, and she probably shouldn't have denied it before. She'd always liked Carter, always had a major next-door neighbor crush on him. But now, that crush had veered into serious relationship territory. They hadn't talked about where they would go from here, now that he got the job. Would she move back home so they could date like a normal couple? Divorce and take their relationship one step at a time? Stay married? Remain living together and try to make their marriage work? The whole scenario was beyond complicated. She hadn't told him about her meeting with Jack Winchester either. 
For some reason, she'd kept everything involved with Have a Little Faith private. She hadn't told him about how many hits she received a day or how many hours it took her to respond to comments. She was going to have to hire a personal assistant if things kept up this way. And since she started blogging about Humperdinck's progress, her blog had erupted. Was it wrong that she hadn't told Carter? She didn't think so, yet guilt niggled at her stomach. This was hers. It had always been hers. Maybe this is what she was getting in the deal. Carter got the detective position, Dawson got Yale, and she got to stand on her own two feet. The blog's success wasn't directly a part of their marriage arrangement, but Carter had given her inspiration for a few of her more popular posts, so that had to count for something. Tall latte, she said to the barista at the register, and looked around the restaurant. Jack Winchester said he'd be here at 11, five minutes from now. He said he'd have a laptop, black bag, blonde hair, and freckles. That could have been one of two guys sitting near the windows. She thanked the barista, took her drink, and walked back toward the large front window. Mr. Winchester? The man on the right looked up from behind a set of rectangular glasses. He was cute, like a beagle. Short legs, large ears, soft eyes. Yes, he said, smiling. Faith Hamilton? She nodded and took the seat opposite him, setting her bag down at her feet, then shook his hand. I'm glad we were able to meet this way. With you being in California, I didn't think it would happen. I happen to have a few other business meetings in Seattle this week, so I thought I'd make the trip worthwhile. When he smiled, his cheeks touched the bottom rim of his glasses. His skin was pale, covered in large patches of honey-colored freckles. He was the exact opposite of Carter. Where Carter was strong, exuding a dangerous aura, this guy was soft and gentle. She trusted him and didn't even know him. This is quite the storm, he said, staring out the window. Does it always rain this much? Absolutely. You've got to really love the rain to live here. She thought twice. Or be depressed out of your mind until you pack up and move. Which are you? he asked, folding his arms over the table. I've got no plans to move any time soon. She took a sip of her latte, relishing the sweetness. What do you say we get down to business? She told Carter she was going out for groceries so she could make him something special for dinner. She couldn't be gone long. It wasn't a total lie. She'd planned on hitting the store after the meeting. She still had to figure out what the something special that she was cooking up was, but whatever. She could throw something together a few hours before dinner. Hey, she was getting pretty good at this cooking thing. Great. Jack took out a few sheets of paper from his bag then set them on the table and spun them around facing her. I'm going to be really transparent here. I've printed out a sheet detailing our profits for our company for the last three fiscal quarters with graphs showing which products are selling from which categories. Then, if you'll flip the page, he flipped for her, you'll see where I've marked when things were referred by another customer, from an online ad placement of ours or another source. Take a look at the training supply category. She studied the graph, then followed the key code on the side. The beagle was organized, that was for sure. If she was reading the graph correctly, and she hoped that she was, have a little faith had been mentioned in over 60% of the sales for his training supplies. Am I seeing this right? She asked. You are. Isn't that amazing? Reading the success in black and white that way? She nodded, thinking about nothing but Dawson's bright smile when she'd tell him about the news. He'd attend Yale, and she wouldn't go broke putting him through. While I'm showing you a graph for the Wagging Tails dog supplies in Sacramento, we have stores nationwide. And where are those graphs? She fired. I didn't bring those. Only transparent to a point? She smiled, and he smiled back. We think you're on the verge of something, he said. A blog filled with personal experiences, training techniques from a professional, advice from someone a laptop click away. Seems to be what dog owners want right now. We'd like to partner with you. 
offer you some financial backing and help give Have a Little Faith the bump it needs to skyrocket into the dogosphere. She laughed so hard she almost snorted latte through her nose. The guy wasn't a beagle, he was a geek, and she loved it. Hell, if he kept spouting off notions of her success, she might fall in love with everyone in the coffee shop. She couldn't wait to get home and tell Carter. So what are we talking about here? Let's get down and dirty with numbers. He smiled wide. Oh, I think we're going to get along fine, you and me. They spent the next 30 minutes going over his offer, starting with his mention of financially backing the growth of her blog into a website. He talked about different ways to make money on her blog, pay to offer merchandise links and links to mini malls preloaded with Wagging Tail's dog supplies products. He also talked about expanding her existing affiliate branches. There were so many outlets for growth, it was crazy. Her heart lifted. This was actually going to work. She could support herself and her brother. For the first time since her parents died, the world stopped spinning. Her feet were finally planted on solid ground. As their discussion came to an end, Faith was beyond pleased with the outcome. Wagging Tail's dog supplies wasn't taking over her blog or even having a strong hand in it. She wouldn't have let that happen. It was simply going to become a main ad on her sidebar. She agreed to test out the free products it'd send her monthly, and if she found them useful, she'd feature them. The really cool part? If she hated one of the products, she had the freedom to say so. The blog, her opinions, and her freedom to make it whatever she wanted remained hers. As they stood from the table, Jack reached out to shake her hand. Something about the notion didn't fit right. She threw her arms around his shoulders. Thank you, she said, squeezing her eyes tight. Thank you for helping me build my tiny blog into something larger than I could have ever dreamed. No problem. He pulled back, blushing. How's Humperdinck doing? I meant to ask you. Humperdinck? she asked, surprised to hear the dog's name brought up. Yeah, we've all been rooting for him to get his issues under control. We watch the videos you post in the office and have been following along from the start. How is the little guy? Have you found him a home yet? No, not yet, but we will. Suddenly, her back heated. Her hands itched. She got the feeling that someone was watching her. Her smile fell as she spun around, looking for the reason for the odd sensation crawling up the back of her neck. Something wrong? Jack asked. You look pale. I just got a chill. She forced a smile, though her body broke out in shivers. It's probably a draft from an open door in back. But as she peered through the window at the building next door, she could have sworn she saw someone who looked like Carter storming down the sidewalk. I don't need this. Just my fucking luck. Carter scrubbed his hands over his face and turned the corner, putting the Starbucks and whom he saw inside behind him. Can't believe this garbage. Carter! It was Faith. She must have seen him. I don't need her. He kept walking, had to keep walking. The anger building inside him would boil over if he stopped now. Carter, hey! Faith called as she ran to meet him. What are you doing here? I should ask you the same thing, he snapped, his strides long and determined. I thought you were going grocery shopping. She recoiled, probably from the hatred tainting his words, but damn it, he couldn't help it. He'd caught her red-handed having drinks with another man. He'd caught his ex-wife the same way, although they were having drinks in bed. Somehow this blow stung worse. The idea didn't even make sense. He wasn't bonded with Faith, so what would it matter if he caught her with another man? Shouldn't he be able to walk away without feeling like cement filled his boots? I was going to the store after this. She huffed, chasing him down. Would you slow down? I can't keep up with you. Maybe I don't want you to. That's harsh. She touched his shoulder. Carter. He came apart, spinning around to face her. I saw you. Every muscle in his body clenched. I saw you, Faith. 
A slow smile spread over her face. You think I was on a date? Weren't you? The image of the two of them in the cafe had burned into his brain. They'd laughed. She'd embraced him. They looked like a couple, happy in love. He could rip the guy's head off. He kept walking so he wasn't tempted to charge back around the corner and make that dream a gruesome reality. It was a business meeting. She touched his arm and he fought the urge to rip it away. That was Jack Winchester from Wagging Tail's Dog Supplies. He wants to invest and have a little faith. His eyes narrowed as the words sank in. You lied about where you were going this morning. If it was innocent, why the cover-up? She slapped her hands against her sides. Maybe I wanted it to be a surprise. Maybe? Rage pulsed through his bloodstream, triggering the urge to shift into wolf form. I can't wrap my mind around maybe. I think I just felt like you have your job, Dawson has Yale, and I had my blog. If I was losing my identity to become Mrs. Griffin, I wanted to keep something for myself. That's ridiculous. To you, maybe. You're mine, Faith. His heart banged against his chest. I can't handle deception like this. I'm yours? His vision blurred. You're not going to cheat on me again. I won't have it. Again? Her face dropped. What are you talking about? You're all the same, every one of you. I thought you were different, Faith. I really did. He spun and charged down the sidewalk. Faith followed, jerking on his arm to turn him back around. Hey, you're acting like a crazy possessive jerk. Chill out and listen to what I'm telling you. That guy you saw me with came all the way from California to meet with me. He thinks the blog is going to be huge, and his company is going to help. Oh, I bet he was more than eager to help you out, especially after he met you. He couldn't look at her, not when he doubted every word that fell out of her beautiful mouth. He'd been deceived too many times before. When you left my bed this morning, why didn't you tell me you had a business meeting? Why the secret? I don't know exactly, but if you just calm down and- You're not going to do this to me. I won't let you. He had to get away from her scent, from the sight of those soft brown eyes boring into his. He knew what he saw through that window. The souring in his gut warned that this time would end the same as before. Even if he believed her, even if the meeting was business only, she'd been spending more and more time away from home. Distance was always the first step to breaking apart. Secrets were the second. They'd only been married a month, and they were already well on their way to a quick and speedy divorce. Pain and resentment welled inside him, his muscles constricted, tensing with the impulses to explode from this weak form. He could barely breathe. Red spots crowded his vision. Easy, Faith said. You're about to lose control, and that's the last thing we need right now. Blurs he barely recognized as people had started to gather on the sidewalk around them. As her attention shifted to the people watching, her cheeks flushed red. Don't talk to me about losing control. He struggled for air. How could you do this to me? If you'd listen, you'd hear I didn't do anything to you. As her gaze shifted to the onlookers, Faith put her hands up in front of her. Go home, Carter. I'll meet you there and explain everything. He couldn't quiet the wrath flashing through his veins. A few more seconds and the streets of Seattle would be a whole lot hairier. I asked you one thing, he seethed. Before we got married, I asked you not to lie to me. That was all you had to do. Yelling somehow held back the wolf from pushing to the forefront. A few seconds was all he had left before Furville. I didn't ask for you to disappear three days a week to take cooking classes, for the dog kennels to be moved into my backyard, for a furball to run around humping my damn leg all day. 
I didn't ask for you to hop on some crazy exercise program or entertain the council. Yet you happily do all of those things and forget the one damn thing that was most important. She stepped up to him, standing toe to toe. And I asked you not to make me look like a fool. Congratulations. She spread her arms to the crowd that had gathered around them. You just did it. Yet I'm not going to let you walk away that easily. He deflated, the wrath draining from his bloodstream as he took in the scene. Twenty or so people stood in a small circle watching their fight. Her face was pink, etched with tight white lines, the color of embarrassment. He'd seen this scene play out before. It had been with a different woman in a different place, but his anger and his mate's humiliation had been the same. He'd loved his ex-wife more than life itself, yet she'd cheated more times than he could count. How many times had his other girlfriends called him a controlling pig before ditching him and moving on? Faith said she wasn't going to walk away, didn't she? She was fighting harder to keep him calm than anyone else ever had. Didn't matter. It all boiled down to the fact that he was never going to change. If he didn't sever ties now, he was going to lose faith forever. He was going to destroy their marriage, obliterate what fragments remained of their friendship, and he simply couldn't take it. If you weren't so naive, you'd see what I see, he said, the urge to shift waning from his bones. She pushed out a laugh. What's that, Carter? A girl who should have known better than to get with someone like me. I'm not the commitment type, and I never will be. It was safer to be with girls who meant little to him. If he didn't let them in, didn't get attached, he wouldn't become this person. From the faces on the people around them, and from the way he'd just yelled at Faith, he bet he was more a monster than a man. You sounded like the commitment type last night, she said. What's changed now? I got the job. Carter lowered his gaze to the gutter, searching for the right words in the grime. That was the point of all this, right? Why drag out something that's never going to be? She backed away as if he'd struck her. So that's it? Get what you want and ditch out? Is that really a surprise? Don't say it, don't say it. You knew I was this way when you fell in love with me. Your shock falls under the category of should have known better. You said this was different. She bit her bottom lip. It felt different. I'm an old dog. He shrugged, his stomach rattling with regret. You know what they say about teaching them new tricks? No trainer in the world, not even you, could fix me. I only wanted to be with you. Her lower lip wobbled. The only way this wasn't going to hurt was to make a clean, crisp break. I'm going to get a drink, he said. I think it's best if you got your things out of my house by the time I get home. Chapter 24 It had been one month since Faith moved out. Four long, cold weeks. The guest room was empty, the fridge was bare, and a certain excitable furball was missing from the toe of his boot. Since Faith had moved out, Carter had gotten used to those things. He missed the warmth she brought to his home, the laughter and light. And if he allowed himself to admit it, he missed seeing the big brown eyes of that humping pooch, too. The place even smelled like her, sweet and familiar, stirring something deep in his chest. Letting his cream of wheat get cold, Carter stared over his back lawn. He'd pinned her against a tree not far from there. Groaning, he leaned back in his chair. Does everything have to revolve around her? Getting Faith out of his mind was going to be harder than he thought. He buried himself in work the last month, but it didn't seem to help. He'd cleared out his desk and moved into his new office, but she was everywhere, in everything. He'd thought about Faith and the way she'd brought him Chinese when he worked late, and when he came home to an empty house, he half expected a plate to be waiting for him in the fridge. He tapped the invitation for the promotion ceremony against the table, 
and pinched his lip with his forefinger and thumb. The ceremony was tonight. He'd be promoted to detective, the rank he'd dreamed about for more years than he cared to think about. Somehow, along the way, his goal had gotten muddled. Before he married Faith, he wouldn't have minded if she had plans and couldn't make it to see him be promoted to detective. But now, she was the only person he truly wanted watching. The doorbell rang, and he couldn't help but wonder if it was her. Heart in his throat, Carter shuffled to the door and swung it open wide. Jameson Clark, the werewolf's version of a polygamist, stood in front of him, holding two cups of coffee. You look like shit, he said. Can I come in? Carter didn't budge. What are you doing here? I thought about what you said when you ambushed me at my house. Thought about it a lot. After you left, I did some research of my own. I think you might be interested in hearing what I found. How'd you find me? Carter fought through the numbness tingling his brain. How'd you know where I live? You're not the only one who can dig around on the internet. Jameson bumped into his shoulder as he pushed his way into the foyer. Jesus, it's freezing in here. Why don't you turn on the damn heater? He hadn't thought about it, though it had been unusually cold lately. Here, take this. Jameson handed him one of the cups. It's black and should warm you up. Thanks. Make yourself at home. I will. He slouched into one of the couches and rested his ankle on his opposite knee. Where's your lady? We, uh, reached our natural and expected end. That was all he could muster. That's unfortunate. Jameson sipped on his drink. Cause of death? Carter sat on the couch opposite Jameson and stared into his eerie green eyes. The werewolf was ancient, yet his eyes were full of youth and boyish enthusiasm. Absent-mindedly, Carter wondered if that had something to do with the number of luminaries he'd found in his life. I can't be with someone I can't trust, Carter answered flatly. But if you don't mind, I'd rather not dredge up our issues. What's this research you wanted to tell me about? You have the promotion ceremony tonight, correct? How'd you know about that? The Seattle Wolfpack online newsletter. You made front page. I should congratulate you on your new position. A cold chill seeped into his bones, freezing him from the inside out. He didn't want to sit here and chit-chat with a stranger about faith, their marriage, their fallout, or his promotion. He didn't want to think about it at all, actually. Thanks, but if you don't mind, I have some things to get to today before the ceremony. Carter waved his hand over his drink, trying to prompt some kind of answer. The research? The reason for your visit? I'm not the only man to have found multiple luminaries. Jameson took another drink and then licked foam off his lip. If you go back far enough into Seattle Wolfpack records, you'll find a handful of cases like ours. Cases where the mates died and the ones left roaming alone eventually found another. Carter cleared his throat. I'm not challenging your past anymore. I believe that you found three mates because I found a second. But what does that matter to you? Why come all this way to prove a point? Because I told you that the bond with my first luminary was the strongest. That the others faded after that. There are others who reported falling deeper in love with each subsequent mate. Wait. Carter slowed down the words so he could grasp them. It's possible for the luminary bond to strengthen? Jameson nodded and moved to the cushion by Carter. I didn't want you to go on thinking you'd never love as fiercely as you did with your first luminary. I didn't want my experiences to taint your decisions with your new wife. Although, from the looks of your empty house, the bond with this wife can't be as strong as the first. Actually, you're wrong, Carter said. What I experienced with Faith was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. The love for my first wife was incredible, but it paled to what I feel for Faith. Jameson's gray eyebrows pulled together. 
Then why'd you split? We were never going to work. Carter cleared his throat. It wasn't in the stars. How do you figure? His chest constricted. We didn't marry out of love. We were friends who decided to marry to get something out of it. I needed to have a mate to get the promotion, and she needed money to put her brother through school. I didn't know she was my luminary until after we were intimate. He expected Jameson to be shocked, to ask a ton of questions, to chastise him for going to such extreme lengths to advance his career. The fact that you didn't recognize her is irrelevant, Jameson said, putting a reassuring hand on Carter's shoulder. The pull to faded mates varies depending on age, the strength of your spirit, your position in the pack, and circumstance. Whether it took you one touch or twenty to feel the spark, it doesn't change the facts. You're fated to be together and you can't fight fate. Carter shook his head. I drove my first wife away into the arms of another man. Many other men, actually. I'll do the same to Faith. All it took was one incident, one miscommunication, and I acted like the same fool I was back then. I care for her, and I want her in my life. If we stay married, that won't happen. I'll ruin our friendship because of my issues. I can't trust her, and if I can't trust her, I can't be close to her. At least, not the way I want to be. I see. Jameson stared at his clasped hands for a long while before answering. You trust her, but you don't trust yourself. That's not what I said at all. Are you even listening? It sounds like you didn't like the person you were with your ex-wife. He stared at Jameson. How could the man possibly know that? He was right. So right. He'd been controlling, overly possessive. He'd been a real jerk, someone he never wanted to be again. Jameson nodded as if he could hear the thoughts swirling through Carter's head. You're more worried about falling into the same routine with your new wife than you are about mistrusting her. God, could he be right? He did trust Faith. It was the root of the reason he'd asked her to marry him in the first place. All you have to ask yourself, Jameson said, is whether she's done anything to make you mistrust her. She hasn't, Carter fired. And deep down, I don't think she ever would. She loves you. Carter nodded. He knew how she felt about him without her saying the words. Realization hit him like a bolt of lightning. If he kept trudging down this path, he'd be in the exact same place he'd been before. He'd be alone, filling a void in his heart with mindless dates and ditzy women who didn't mean anything to him. He'd worked so hard to avoid any kind of emotional attachment. He hadn't realized that he'd created a relationship with Faith even before they were married. He loved having her in his life. He needed her. He didn't want to lose her over something as stupid as his trust issues, especially if there was a chance that their bond could be stronger than the first he'd experienced. Deep in his gut, hard knots of anxiety bounced around like balls in a pinball machine. He longed to be with Faith, to protect her and care for her like no one had before. He wanted to watch sunsets from the swing on his back porch. He wanted to run as wolves through the forest after dinner and then curl up in front of the fire and make love. More than all that, he wanted to grow old with her. And she wanted all of that too. He felt her love for him so deeply it hurt. I think I've ruined everything, he said, as the fear set in. It might be too late. When it comes to true love, it's never too late. Jameson handed Carter his phone. Invite her to your ceremony tonight. Carter smiled as a plan came to light. No, I have a better idea. Chapter 25 Faith spun the note in her hand and read it for the hundredth time. I'm taking you out. After what happened with Carter, you could use a break. Dress warm, 
I'll pick you up at eight. Tracy. Sighing, Faith shoved her arms into her coat and shot a sideways glance at the clock. Eight on the nose. She really didn't feel like going out. Cuddling up with a fuzzy blanket and carton of chunky monkey sounded much better. A car honked from the driveway. Gotta go, boy. She gave Humperdinck's back a loving scratch. I'll be back in a few hours. He gazed up at her, his honey-brown eyes filled with warmth. We're going to be okay, you and me, she said, fully aware she was talking to herself as much as the dog. Everything's going to be all right, better than all right. She'd had a rough few weeks struggling to get Carter out of her head. They should have never gotten married. Maybe he'd still be in her life, texting her suggestions for their movie night on Friday. No, she said aloud. That wouldn't have worked for long. She would have gone crazy watching him date woman after woman, and then listening to him talk about why those relationships weren't working. She would have wanted more eventually. She would have made a move. She would have wanted to be with him the way she did now. At least she was stable. In the future, she wouldn't need to do something crazy like freaking marry someone to be able to support her brother, her only family. Her blog was now a full-fledged, up-and-running website. Have a Little Faith had gotten a major facelift. Comments and views reached heights she never could have dreamed. She'd even received an email about adopting Humperdinck. The man was from Portland, sounded sincere, like he loved animals, and wanted to surprise his wife with the dog she'd always wanted. After she returned tonight, she'd reply to his email and arrange a meeting. The car honked a second time. She locked up her front door and spun around, covering her mouth with her hand. A limo was parked in the driveway, and a man dressed in a tuxedo held the rear door open. Miss Griffin? he asked flatly. Yes? This couldn't be right. Why would Tracy send a limo? Tracy asked me to deliver a message. She says she'll meet you at your destination. She walked down the porch, the sound of her boots striking wood echoing through the forest. And where would that be? I'm not obliged to say just yet. I see. Hesitantly, she slid into the limo. Are we... He shut the door before she could finish and left the glass wall between them locked in the up position. She settled in for the drive, gazing out the tinted windows as the city swept by them. An hour later, she'd guzzled the water in the console, eaten the nuts in the complimentary mini bags, and had knocked on the security glass until her hands hurt. Where the hell was Tracy taking her? As they pulled off the road near a sign that read, Welcome to Wallace Falls State Park, Faith sat back, searching for signs of her friend. Instead, car after car lined the road and filled a large parking lot. A couple strode by them, hand in hand. She didn't need the windows down to pick up the scent. The vents allowed enough air into the cab. There were werewolves here, lots of them. Realization hit. The promotion ceremony. The car stopped and the driver walked around the hood to open her door. This way, ma'am, he said. What the hell was going on? Tracy was oblivious to the workings of the Seattle wolf pack. She wouldn't have wanted to bring Faith here, among a bunch of wolves, to the pack's promotion ceremony. Son of a... She pulled her cell out of her bag to call Tracy, the conniving snot. She must have talked to Carter and arranged for her to be brought here to watch him get promoted. No bars, no service. She put her hands on her hips. Can't believe she did this behind my back. Ma'am? The driver asked. Is Tracy seriously meeting me here? No, ma'am. Smirking, the driver pointed to a dirt path lined with roping white lights. But you have someone waiting for you that way. Yeah, that someone was Carter. Had to be. Her stomach turned at the thought of seeing him. She could be strong and independent, stand on her own two feet and face the future alone. As long as she didn't meet those dreamy eyes of his. One look in them, and she seemed to lose herself. On second thought, when she was with him, she felt more like herself than she had with anyone else. 
He brought out the best in her. A month with him, and she had become the woman she'd always wanted to be. Why would he bring her here? Did he think she would have declined if he'd come right out and asked? She probably would have, which meant he knew her stubborn streak well. But still, he was her friend, and this night meant a lot to him, which meant it was special for her, too. Before she could think about what that meant, she crossed the tree line and strode into the forest, where streams of moonlight broke the canopy overhead. Mrs. Owens appeared from around a tree, startling her. Glad you could make it, sweetheart, she said, reaching out to hold Faith's hand. This is such a huge moment for your husband. Yes, it is, isn't it? Oh, how flippin' wonderful. He hadn't told them. He was planning on going through with the ceremony, earning the position he'd clawed for, fang and nail. To hell with how awkward this might have been for her, right? Class A jerk. You know what? Faith said. I left my coat in the car. She turned back, but Mrs. Owens caught her arm. We'll be in wolf form soon enough, dear. To witness the ceremony, you have to shift first. Faith got the drift. With a coat of fur, she wouldn't be cold. Mrs. Owens took her by the arm and led her down the dimly lit path. There is a large turnout tonight, she said, winding through the trees. Over fifty packmates arrived. Carter is still meeting with the captain, but as soon as they're finished negotiating his pay and other details of the position, the ceremony will begin. Yeah, that sounded fair, uh-huh. Negotiate a hefty paycheck while Faith stood out in the cold and acted like nothing had happened between them. When would he tell them she moved out, she wondered. Probably not until long after he'd secured his position. Faith smiled and patted Mrs. Owens' arm, playing the part of a doting wife. I'm so proud of him. He's worked so hard for this. Her stomach panged as she realized she spoke the truth. She was proud of him. He had worked hard for this job, giving up his mornings, evenings, and weekends. He'd kept his eye on his goal and had never wavered, not once. His determination was admirable. As the path ended at a giant clearing, Faith sucked in a short breath. Red, white, and black roses were everywhere, littering the floor in giant stands beside a stone altar and vases on a dozen tables. Breathtaking, isn't it? Mrs. Owens crooned. Veronica Vale Black event planning took care of the details. She's just amazing. Oh, there she is over there. She pointed to a thin, wispy little thing in a lacy black dress, arranging a floral arrangement on a nearby table. She's newly transitioned, married to our Alpha's head of security, Logan Black. Looks like he and the Alpha have some unfinished business. Hope nothing's wrong with security for tonight's ceremony. Faith followed her line of sight. Logan and Drake, Seattle Wolfpack's Alpha, talked near the altar, leaning over its stone top. They weren't the only two werewolves in the clearing with unfinished business. Once she got hold of Carter, she was going to... And there's Nate and his wife. Isn't she lovely? Mrs. Owens leaned close and whispered. They just arrived minutes before you did. It's my understanding that our Alpha intends to open up a second position for Nate as well. I caught wind that it'll happen sometime next year. I just can't get over how gorgeous she is. Faith bit her lip. Paisley was undeniably Sports Illustrated cover model material. But that was all right, because Faith could cook and train dogs and start up an online business with nothing but her determination. She might not have been thin like Paisley, but she had curves, and men loved them. Well... Carter seemed to enjoy them anyway. And Paisley may have had unblemished, milky-white skin, but there was nothing unique about her, nothing that showed the depth brewing beneath the surface. Faith drew her hair back over her shoulders, exposing the scar on her neck. The mark was a battle wound, one she'd wear with pride from here on out. She'd gone through hell and soul-staggering depression when she'd lost her parents but she'd made it and come out on the other side stronger than before. 
Yes, Faith agreed, holding her head high. Paisley is absolutely stunning. Yet not for one second did Faith want to switch shoes with the floozy. Especially not while Paisley was wearing those fugly purple stiletto ankle rollers. Ladies and gentlemen, Drake Wilder, the alpha of the Seattle Wolf Pack, announced from the altar. He dwarfed the stone, his six-foot gigantic frame hovering over it. His hair was longer than when she'd seen it last, dark and slicked back, and his eyes were wide, nearly black. At his side, his wife Amelia smiled brightly. She looked amazing, for having given birth to their third child, a boy named Russell Drake Wilder Jr., a few months before. I received word from the captain that he and Mr. Griffin are ready for the promotion ceremony to begin. We will eat at the tables behind us promptly after the ceremony. But first, the wolves must descend. Faith shivered as she watched the crowd shift in the moonlight. Wolves of all shapes and sizes shed their clothes as fur blanketed their bodies. They dropped to all fours, snouts elongating and muscles bulking up. Some were small and sleek, while others were burly and robust. Glancing at the waning moon, Faith brushed her hands over her arms and willed the moon's energy to whisper through her. Body humming, she let the urge to shift overtake her, balled all the energy swirling in her gut into a ball and pushed outward. The shift from woman to wolf happened quickly, but not as quickly as others. Mrs. Owens was already in wolf form, her back covered in light fur that matched the color of her hair. She sat back on her haunches, arched her neck, and howled at the moon. The others followed, crying violently at the golden orb hanging low in the sky. They approached the altar, stalking side by side, providing little room for Faith to see the front. Drake stood taller than the rest, his fur midnight black and glossy. Proud members of the Seattle Wolf Pack, welcome. Their alpha spoke through the pack's process of mind speak. We have gathered together on this glorious night to witness a promotion in our pack. Carter Griffin, a tireless enforcer in our bureau, will become one of our distinct detectives. He vows to protect each and every one of you. Without further ado, I give you Mr. Carter Griffin. They cried out once more, their howls echoing in the night. Out of the corner of her eye, Faith spotted Carter, the ridge of his back high, his ice-blue eyes a piercing contrast against his black fur. He approached the altar, faced the members of the pack in attendance, and then bowed, his nose to the ground. I'm honored to be chosen for the position of detective within the Bureau, he projected. But there's something I must confess before the ceremony goes any further. Faith's interest peaked. She weaved through the crowd toward the altar. Contrary to what I've led the officials in the Bureau to believe, Faith Hamilton and I didn't marry for love, Carter said. She agreed to marry me so that I had a better shot at getting this position. The wolves in the crowd buzzed with shock. Mind speak inundated Faith's thoughts until she couldn't hear her own. Carter scanned the faces in the crowd, and when his gaze landed on hers, her heart clenched. I understand the reasons that the Bureau desires its high-ranking officials to be mated, he continued. And for that reason, I cannot accept the promotion. Nate Ramsey, the other candidate who is here tonight, should get the job. Under the circumstances, he's more deserving of the position than I am. Carter was going to hand the job over to Nate? Just like that? Why? She was playing the part. He could have easily gone along with the ruse, accepted the position, and moved on. They could have dealt with the ramifications of their divorce later. But there is one more thing that needs to be said. An apology that needs to be heard. He projected loudly above the dissension of the crowd. His gaze gripped her. She couldn't look away, no matter how she tried. Faith, what I said to you when we got in that big fight. I was right. That's not exactly the best way to apologize, 
she answered back. His mouth widened into an awkward smile. I didn't ask you to take cooking classes for the dog kennels to clutter the back lawn, or for Humperdinck to take such a liking to me. I didn't ask for you to exercise or entertain anyone. I was absolutely right. She tilted her head and tisked her tongue against the roof of her mouth. Not doing any better. I'm not finished. His voice reverberated through her head, rich and thick, drowning out every other thought in the pack. I didn't ask for your sweet scent to linger in my house, for you to pop into my head whenever I think of something funny to say. I didn't ask for you to make me laugh, to be the greatest lover I've ever had. I didn't ask for you to be my mate, though you are, Faith. You have to know what you are to me. You're everything. My best friend, my wife, my soulmate, and the very best part of me. As her throat squeezed, disbelief rooted in her mind. Carter hadn't said the exact words before, but he'd sweet-talked her a dozen times. She was dead tired of allowing him to use her emotions as his personal yo-yo. It was going to take something really extreme to make her open up and go back to him. If I can't be with you, none of this means anything. You're the reason I got the job. I don't want it without you. He stepped off the altar and pushed through the crowd. Hell, I don't want to live a single day without you at my side. He approached her, the crowd parting, staring. And when he reached her side, he burrowed his head against her neck. I love you, Faith. I love you more than I've ever loved another. You were in front of me the entire time, but I was too stupid and too blind to see you. You were, and have always been, the woman fated for me. She wobbled, her legs and will weakening together. And I know you love me too, even if you haven't said the words. His voice was soft, tender, a caress against the fur on her neck. I pray that you can find it in your heart to take me back. If you can't forgive me for being such an ass, I'll spend every single day of the rest of my life trying to convince you that we belong together. I don't know what to say. She cast her thoughts, struggling to hold back the emotion bubbling inside her. I know exactly what to say, Drake interrupted, standing behind the altar. The packmates went quiet. Carter, from what I've seen tonight, there is no reason why you have to sacrifice your position in the Bureau. He lied, Nate Ramsey's thoughts hurled from the back of the crowd. How can you push him up the ranks if you can't trust him? Drake's dark gaze met Carter's. Because he revealed the truth to us now when it meant the most. He could have taken the position and run with it, yet he didn't. He came forward in front of the members of the pack gathered tonight, and that takes courage. However, if Carter believes Nate is a worthier candidate... Perhaps we should reconsider our stance to accept only one detective into our ranks. Nate, please come forward. He shouldered through the crowd and joined Drake at the front. Carter's captain stepped forward to address the crowd. Carter Griffin, you were up for this position once before, and were turned down due to being in an unstable state. The captain eyed Faith carefully. Although you claim not to be married in heart to this woman, we can sense that you've made it. We sense your desire for her and hers for you. It's clear that the bond you share together has strengthened you. What I see beneath the moon tonight is a different man than the unstable one we met years ago. One who is determined to walk a path of honesty, integrity, and courage. We'd be happy to have such a werewolf promoted in our bureau. Thank you, Captain. Carter lowered his head as he faced their alpha. And humble thanks to you too, Mr. Wilder. Now, if you take your places, we'll continue, Drake projected. Carter, join Nate at the altar. Carter turned to Faith. 
It's not worth a lick without you. Go. She nudged her nose against his. It's what you've always wanted. That may be, he projected softly. But it'd mean nothing without you. I said go, she whispered. We'll work on us after. His ears twitched. So they're still in us? You're still a contender, Brando. She giggled, but the sound came out as a half growl. Now go. Carter bounded happily onto the stage next to Drake and Nate. The two candidates faced the packmates and bowed. Then, loudly and proudly, they took turns reciting the vows that proclaimed them to be newly promoted high ranking officials in the Wolf Pack's Enforcement Bureau. The packmates went wild, howling and yelping at the moon. As Carter descended from the stage, he brushed against her, the warmth from his body radiating into hers. Her eyes fluttered close, and her heart gave a stutter. Things were going to be okay after all. Of course they are, he projected quietly. As long as we're together, everything's going to be perfect. There's one thing I have to ask, though. Shoot. He lowered his head in front of hers, his ears folding down, his eyes fluttering closed. Whatever he was about to say was hard for him. Do you love me? He asked. I don't exactly know how to answer that. She pulled back and gazed into those heavenly blue eyes. You told me not to lie to you. Yes, he whispered into her thoughts. I did. So I'll tell you that what I feel for you is more than love and more than words. You consume me, and although I could live without you, standing strong on my own two feet, you compliment me in every way and make every experience I have more vibrant. I crave being near you so much that it pains me when we're apart. He growled from deep within his chest and nuzzled against her. She could hear his heartbeat could feel the warmth and strength of his body. Faith Alroy Hamilton, he said. I love you more than anyone has ever loved another. Make me the happiest werewolf on the planet and marry me. Again. Oh, Carter. The lips covering her incisors pulled back into a smile. That's the most romantic second proposal I've ever received. And then, right there, in front of the packmates and high-ranking members of the Enforcement Bureau, they said their vows and sealed their fates together forever. For real, this time. Epilogue Two days later, Dawson came to visit. Faith always loved when her younger brother stayed with her, and didn't want to think about life without him when he went away to Yale. It was a good thing she could cuddle up to Carter. He always seemed to make everything better. You're going to a good home, aren't you, boy? Dawson ran his fingers through Humperdinck's fur. Hey, Faith, what time is the adoptive parent coming again? Around noon. She curled into the corner of her couch, her legs tucked beneath her and a cup of coffee in her hand. You going to stay until he shows up? Maybe. Shrugging, he checked the clock. Or until Carter gets here. I don't want to leave you alone when a stranger comes knocking. That's nice of you. Who knew you could be so chivalrous? He grinned, giving Faith images of the little boy she used to know. It's the least I could do after what you've done for me. He scratched Humperdinck's back and kept his eyes on the floor. If I haven't thanked you before, thank you. I love you, dude. Her heart filled and overflowed. You don't ever have to say thank you. I would do anything to be able to pay your way through school. It's more than that. He looked up at her. Thank you for the bags of groceries every time I visit. For the late night phone calls to make sure I've made it home okay. For caring. You're the best sister in the world. Humperdinck yapped as if he agreed. Well, I think you're pretty great too. The next time you call me, it better be to say that you're killing it in your classes. Oh, I will. He checked the clock for the umpteenth time. Tracy's car pulled in front of the porch, the sound of her motor sending Humperdinck into a frenzy. Faith commanded him to stop, 
He listened, shutting his cute little hairy mouth. Dawson was at the door before Tracy opened it. Morning, Tracy, he said, his voice tighter than it had been moments before. Good to see you. Tracy grinned and then embraced Dawson in a hug. Good to see you, too. They held each other a little longer than Faith expected, and when they pulled away, Faith could sense electricity in the air. Dawson's eyes lit up, and he swiped his hands on his jeans. Care to say goodbye to Humperdinck before he's adopted out? Faith said, breaking their connection. Tracy freaked, flapping her arms against her sides. That's why I came by this morning. I couldn't let my favorite puppy leave without saying goodbye. The guy should be here in a few minutes. Get your last bits of loving in while you can. As Tracy swept Humperdinck into her arms, Faith sighed. She'd come a long way with the cute little guy, and she'd miss him like crazy. But she'd already promised the man he could have the pooch, and she couldn't go back on her word, especially not now that she posted the updates on her blog. Every one of the 5,000 subscribers knew Humperdinck was being adopted today, and she promised to go on tonight and give a final blogging farewell to the pup, giving the final stats for his progress. He'd improved so much over the last months. It had been almost a week since her couch cushion had been mounted, days since she had to command him to leave it, hours since he glanced lovingly at her shoe. He was a work in progress, just like her. Carter's here, Dawson said. I can now leave you in good hands. Okay, get out of here. Faith embraced her brother and friend as Humperdinck escaped onto the porch. Call me when you get back to school. Okay, Dawson said and squeezed her tight. I will. I'm going to go too. I don't want to watch the little guy drive away. Tracy traipsed down the porch, giving Carter a high five as she passed. Good to see you, Carter. He grinned, lightening Faith's mood instantly. With her husband at her side, she could handle saying goodbye to Humperdinck. Hell, she felt like she could handle anything. As he joined her on the porch, he coiled his arm around her waist. They watched Dawson and Tracy pull away together, and nothing had ever felt more right. You okay? He said once they were alone. Yeah. Yeah. She laid her head against his chest and sighed. I will be. After remarrying in front of the pack, Carter and Faith had retreated to his place, their place, and completed the luminary bond. Now, finding a happy home for Humperdinck was the final piece of the perfect puzzle. Going to be hard to let the little guy go. She looked down at him, tears welling in her eyes. Yeah. Good thing you won't have to. Yeah. She paused, Humperdinck bumped against her foot. Wait. His words sank in. What? He glanced down at her, the glimmer in his blue eyes heating her through. I'm adopting Humperdinck. Her brows scrunched as confusion set in. No, you can't. I've already told the guy from Portland that he could have him. Hi he said, sticking out his hand. I'm from Portland, and I'm interested in adopting the dog you mentioned on your blog. I have a new wife who loves teacup Yorkies, and the one you featured is absolutely adorable. I think he'll be the perfect addition to our family. No! She smacked him as the blood drained from her face. Is that really you? You're joking, right? He scooped Humperdinck off the ground and stroked his tiny back. I've gotten attached to the little guy. I couldn't let you give him away. And even though you'd never say so, you didn't want to let him go either. You're right. I didn't. A tear rolled down her cheek. Thank you for caring enough to do something like that. He leaned down and kissed her, melting all her worries away. When he pulled back, his eyes were hooded with desire. Oh, I care a lot, more than you'd believe. What do you say we disappear into this cabin of yours so I can show you how deep my love goes? Humperdinck's gaze flipped back and forth between them. We should probably lock him in the kennel first, she said, rubbing his ears. 
Why is that? Dogs often mimic the behavior of their masters. Kinking an eyebrow, she smacked him in the rear. I wouldn't want to give him any frisky ideas. If that's the case, we're going to set him back in his training. Carter swept her into his arms and charged into the house. She squealed in delight as his arms wrapped protectively around her waist, and his mouth caught hers in a smoldering kiss. Down, boy, she said. On command, Carter set her down, kicked off his shoes, and stripped out of his pants. She smirked, watching the clothes fly off his body. Men could train as easily as dogs. Who would have thought? This concludes So I Married a Werewolf by Kristen Miller. Narrated by Anastasia Watley. Copyright 2014 by Kristen Miller. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Entangled Publishing, LLC, and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there, too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. 